I call to order the regular session of the Board of Commissioners of the City of Tarpon Springs on Tuesday, January 10th, 2023 at 6.30 p.m. Roll call, please. Mayor Vaticiotis? Here. Vice Mayor Lunt? Here. Commissioner Carr? Here. Commissioner Eisner? Here. Commissioner Kouyas? Here. Okay, tonight's uh, invocation will be presented by, or given by Reverend Kurt Snare of St. Timothy's Lutheran Church. Uh, we'll all stand, and then after the invocation, turn and pledge allegiance to the flag. <clears throat> Gracious Creator, mighty God, we thank you that you have allowed us to live in this city. We ask that you would help us to be good stewards, to treat each other with respect and love, and that you might be glorified in this city and all who work and live here. Guide now our leaders that you have called with your wisdom that they might make wise decisions. We ask for your presence here with us. We ask all of this in the name of the Most High God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States, United States of America, of America and to the republic, republic for which it stands, one nation, one nation under God, and indivisible, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Well, welcome to 2023, everyone. I hope everybody had a happy new year and a happy holiday season. Um, we've got one announcement before the meeting begins. Item 19 has been deferred to February 14th. And I'm sorry, that's um, item 19, that's correct. And that's resolution 2023-22 has to do with a parking lot conditional use for rusty bellies at the sponge docks. So we'll hear that in February. Um, Let's go to public comments. Um, is there anyone here for public comments this evening? Hi, good evening, Mayor. Uh, good Commissioners, evening, Mr. Uh, Geddes. David Ballard Geddes, Jr. I live at 802 Georgia Avenue in Palm Harbor down the street. Last month and a uh, few previous months uh, back, um, uh, there was an agenda item regarding a small residential development proposal um, that was located on the north end of Lake Tarpon off of Keystone Road. Um, the, the property in question, um, I looked at it on a, a Google uh, map quest on the computer, and I noticed on the north end and on the south end of the property in question, there were significant easements on the, on the property. And I also noticed that the, the attorneys that were wanting to develop this property, I see them frequently at other board meetings, um, Tampa Bay Water, for instance, um, at their monthly meeting and um, so forth. I question that possibility that these attorneys of such may have a, a bifurcated intent for this piece of property in that appearing initially to want to put in, I think it was 50 residential homes, small lot sizes and so forth, but reserve a quadrant of that property um, on the northwest corner um, adjacent that easement. I, I feel as though, based on the fact that these attorneys frequent water board meetings, that they're after the water underneath this property um, and they haven't fully disclosed that and I feel as though these, these men are in contempt of their ultimate purpose for this property. I think they intend on establishing a well point. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Geddes. Next, please. Good evening, Mayor and, and Good evening. Uh, Commissioners. Robert Rockline, 755 North Lake Boulevard in Tarpon Springs. First, let me say Happy New Year to all of you. Uh, I wish you and your families uh, both happiness and health and want to thank you again for your service to our city. Uh, I know it taxes both you and your families. Uh, speaking in regards to uh, one of the, uh, the hearings tonight, number 16, but not specifically about that, just the peripheral uh, effect of development in the area, the uh, venue along Mellon Street between North Jasmine and Keystone is, you know, it's still creaking up in volume of traffic on, almost on a weekly basis. Uh, I waited tonight for about 12 cars to turn at the stop sign before I could continue south on North Jasmine. Uh, 
I had asked the previous board, I, I believe, probably close to a year ago, if the city would consider repainting the double yellow lines that are on Mellon from back and forth because there is a crest that defeats the sight line there, there is a curve, and with this development going forward, the North Lake uh, Platte, uh, it had some, some increase of uh, commercial traffic and that for that, but now it's gonna ramp up, I'm sure. Uh, there's a little vestige of a double yellow line closer to Keystone, the, uh, the eastern edge. Uh, I don't know if that was done by the county or, or somebody else. And of course, there's double line on North Jasmine going up and down, but that's kind of eroding little by little. And I, I know there's plans for sidewalk and other you know, real bit rehabilitation there, but uh, that double yellow line on Mellon before something worse happens, because I've seen people adapt and correct themselves when something was coming the other way, uh, and I was party to that a couple of times, but as the cement trucks and the, the lumber deliveries and everything else come, it's, it's likely to go up. So even if it's just a, you know, a simple line, if you get a, a, a foul ball sprayer or something like that, uh, but if somebody from Public Works could just take a look at it and, and give their professional opinion, it'd be appreciated. Thank you, Mr. Rockland. Thank you. Uh, City Manager. Yes, Thank I have you. that. Yes. Okay. Somebody will be in touch. Uh, next, please. Chris Roboski, 1602 Gulf Beach Boulevard, Tarpon Springs, 34689. Happy New Year. So I just want to give you the update on Mr. Clay Colson's case uh, and his continuing to try to save the 74 acres currently owned by Walmart that will someday soon be a park. So the clerk of the court that's Ken Burke's office, Pinellas County, issued Mr. Colson uh, a document that gave him something known as indigent status. Mr. Ken Burke has somehow conveniently forgotten that, and he sent a status report to the court, to the second DCA, stating that he's not going to file anything for Mr. Colson until he pays uh, his court fee, which he doesn't have to pay. Now, this is the same case, the same case that he was issued this indigent status. So some, this is really, really beyond the pale. So if you've looked at the motion that Mr. Salzman uh, filed in the second DCA and then Mr. Colson's response, you will know that Mr. Colson is going to prevail. So all of a sudden, they decide to move the goalpost a little bit and just say, oh, well, we're not even going to accept that document because he didn't pay his court cost, which he's not having to pay in the first place. It's a lot of funny business going on here, so you might want to look into it. You can make this thing go away, you know. You could settle this case with Mr. Colson. He's a reasonable man. Um, <clears throat> I just want to make you aware of that. So either the second DCA is going to have to enlighten Mr. Burke that he has to honor that agreement or Mr. Colson's going to have to remind Mr. Burke that he has to honor that agreement, that he does not have to pay that filing fee. So that's where it stands right now. That ain't normal. Something odd is happening. So I just wanted to make you fully aware. You might want to take a look at that or speak to your attorney about it. Uh, but it will be resolved, but it's going to take even longer now. So they're just dragging out this case that they want to get over so fast they can barely stand it. As fast as that stay was shot down, that ought to tell you something. Courts don't generally move that quickly. So we keep moving forward, and we will prevail. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Robotsky. Um, Elias Garniku Skatagi, 1482 Hillview Lane. I've got a couple of a smattering of things to talk about, and I, I'll just be direct, and I don't think there's any harm in 
coming up with the random strange ideas that I do. Um, I've been thinking a lot about the industrial uses that are scattered amongst downtown and how they really interfere with anything being walkable and how we could like wait until it becomes uh, con convenient or profitable for whoever the landowner is to convert that to like actual usable marketplace or literally anything um, that's not like large blight in the middle of our grid. Uh, we have in light industrial and industrial land that isn't occupied. I, I don't understand why we can't like, in, in not eminent domain, but really like a, you need to move to this other part of the city to continue doing what you're doing. But like this, this is not an appropriate use for the space uh, where it is. Uh, people are dri people are driving too fast down the street. Uh, Martin Luther King in Alt 19 should have raised crosswalks. All of the uh, sidewalks need to be leveled out. I, I think they're really beautiful with the bricks, um, but it doesn't make sense. It's not accessible for one, but it, it doesn't make sense for a sidewalk to basically be an undulating thing that uh, allows cars cuts and cuts into every single entrance. There has to be some kind of cohesion or separation of car paths from pedestrian paths where they don't have to run so concurrently and they don't have to use the same space. Uh, cars don't need to be able to turn into every single lot. They can go back through alleyways and be directed um, instead of having to be able to cut in front of people using the sidewalk all of the time. Uh, I uh, went to Epiphany for the first time uh, this year and I thought it was very beautiful and I really was stuck on the fact that Tarpon Springs is stuck to me. I grew up here and I don't really want to leave and I find it quite annoying because um, many people have told me that I should look for Go find what I seek and look for it elsewhere. Go somewhere else. Um, or that I shouldn't care about where I grew up. Um, and it's really stuck on me just like rice and beans are stuck on me uh, as a childhood staple. Like, I don't know what I'm supposed to do but care uh, and find beauty in what there is. And of course, I'm always going to think more change is good if it's catching up to the stasis that was holding something rotten as the status quo. Um, I, I really hope we can imagine a future together where we have shared responsibility of the upkeep of our public spaces and the city like as a functioning mechanism that goes beyond just uh, the commerce, the different commercial people and uh, whoever the underground network is. But peop we, people can be here and live here and it's worth caring. Um, our importance shouldn't be related to how much money we have or how much land we have. Uh, have a good one. Did you want to wrap up, take a couple more seconds to wrap up or? Okay, thank you, Ms. Elias. I, your comments are always appreciated. Thank you. Peter is 514 Ashland Avenue and uh, some interesting words there that I heard because it was part of my theme also tonight, hope. Hope, hope, hope for a good year ahead. I do want to say thank you to all the city staff and all of you guys and ladies, everybody who's been involved, but the boat parade and the snowflakes in heaven <laughs> park and the epiphany, everything seemed to flow so nice and it was beautiful. My only thing, and it's not with you guys, it'll be with 
the Greek churches. What's with the food trucks and nobody cooking Greek food? No moussaka, no pastizo, <laughs> no, no souvlaki's. Okay, that's 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 a side thing. Okay, so in regards to hope. Um, I'm going to read a little uh, Psalm 24. I like this one. I know I've read it before, but uh, it's 1 through 6. It's of David a psalm. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. For he founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. Who? may ascend the hill of the Lord. Who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to an idol or swear by what is false. He will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from God his Savior. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, O God of Jacob, Selah. So, uh, just to do a little catching up, uh, Mr. Hrabowski happened in passing mention and the stay was uh, rejected in city on December 21st. Uh, Mr. Salzman filed a motion with the court to request the city as a respondent stay any proceedings till the conclusion of your investigation. I've been looking online, the clerk's website, we've been looking and looking and looking and behold, last night, bingo, there it is. The order denying, filed on January 9th, but executed on December 29th. So nine and let's see, the 29th, so you had 30, 31, and 9, 11, take out a holiday, 10 days. Why so late for the public to know? And I don't know what the time frame on any aspect of appeal for you, whether it's a 15 day or a 30 day, but it sure cuts you off just like it cut us off when they slammed our appeal and they gave us a rehearing, but we had to do it in 15 days and they executed it the day before Thanksgiving, and we lost five days minimum before anything could be done the following Monday. So I have suspicion about how the way this court has been doing things. It says it was done in chambers, but I ha have doubts of whether those three judges actually got together and spoke about the case, or if this is just Mr. Ramsberger just trying to pass it along. If you look at the way they rejected our appeal, many times they say, in the efficiency of the court, we will move on. In the efficiency of the court, because they know they were wrong and they don't want to have to admit it. So they're saying, oh, okay, well, we'll just move this along. Let another court tell them that they made the mistakes because you know most judges don't like admitting they made something wrong. So they'll just pass it to another court for another court to say they got it wrong. And we are filing our appeal with the second district has to be in by, I believe, the day after uh, Martin Luther the 17th, but we will have it in in time. And I would ask that y'all consider uh, filing your stay subsequent with ours <coughs> such that the court gets notice of your intentions on that regard. Otherwise, they won't know about it, and uh, you know what goes on after that. Thank you. No, I... Um uh, we've got a, an agenda item uh, with the uh, agreement for litigation attorney services, and I was going to ask Mr. Salzman at that time to give us a snapshot of where we are, and uh, I'll bring this, this question up as well. So thank you, Mr. Delacus. Are there any other uh, commission, I'm sorry, public comments on anything that's not on the agenda this evening? Okay. Mr. Jump, are there any remote access comments? We do not have anyone. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ms. Jacobs, we have one email to be read in the record. That's correct. Go ahead. Um, this is from Tom Koulianis, 1250 South Pinellas Avenue. Mayor, Commissioner, staff, good evening. 
A couple of months ago during the meeting when Commissioner Eisner was reading emails that indicated staff had been working with certain individuals on projects without public knowledge for a few years, I was reminded of how things had been done in the past. This caused me to speak out to reflect my feelings of vindication. Also feeling vindicated as my service as mayor 35 years ago had been a subject of certain former elected officials at commission meetings during most of 2022. And speaking out and feeling of vindication for all these months of negative comments, I mentioned something that had occurred over 40 years ago about Mr. John Terrapani. After time to reflect over my comments, I feel that I was doing too Mr. Terrapani, the same thing or the same type of thing that was being done to me that I felt was wrong. Thus, this made my comments hypocritical. For that, I would like to apologize to Mr. Terrapani on the record. I would hope that as former elected officials, we can work together to offer our positive assistance based on experience of service when requested. Let us all come together for the betterment of our beautiful city. Thank you, Tom Koulianis, former mayor and commissioner. Thank you, Ms. Jacobs. Okay, that ends uh, public comments. Um, let's go to the um, consent agenda. Um, I'm gonna read through these. Um, item one is attorney's fees. Person Cohen, Mooney, Fernandez, and Jackson. Invoices 2905 and 3034. Number two, special events, A, Sunset Beach Concert Series, B, Fenders for First Responders, C, food Movies in the Park. Number three is award file number 230061, which is a sig single source purchase of uh, 2022 Chevy Silverado flatbed. Number four is a, um, that's a truck by the way. Number four is increase file 220027, um, single source purchase of a Chevrolet General Motors original <coughs> equipment manufacturer parts and services. Number five is review of renewal of file 220001-Q-JL maintenance of public restrooms at the sponge exchange. Number six is award file 230085 single source purchase of public records technician services. Number seven is award file 230088, single source purchase of Caterpillar original equipment, manufacturer parts and services. Uh, item eight is increase uh, file number 220067, jingle source purchase of, single source purchase of mental health services uh, resources. Um, does any commissioner wish to uh, pull any of these items from the consent agenda? Which I'd like one? to pull five. Five and three and four. Three and four. Any down at the uh, right end? No? Okay. Let's go ahead and <clears throat> have a motion on one, two, <coughs> six, seven, and eight. Motion to approve one, two, six, seven, and eight of consent agenda January 10th, 2023. Second. Okay. Are there any public comments on any of these five items? Black's 514 Ashland Avenue. From what I read about in the backup, uh, you're needing to get a records technician because of so many records requests coming, big ones. And we know about the ones that Loeb and them have filed from, you know, and all. So, and I just want to point out, I have no problem with doing this because it's needed, but cha-ching, cha-ching, cha-ching. When y'all were talking about approving Carlton Fields in the 160,000 y'all talk about later, y'all had said, oh, well, the mayor said, for what we've spent already to get this behind us, and at one point, I think you quoted over a million, million and a half dollars in staff and other expenses, legal expenses, all this stuff. Now, another $45,000, all because a previous board had personal interests. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Delicus. Um Does any commissioner have any comments on any of these items? <clears throat> okay. um, yeah, I have a, 
Go ahead. A, a comment on um, actually item 2B. Is that allowed? Go ahead. Um, in looking into it, um, I think there's a regulation, and, and please correct me if I'm wrong, that whichever 5013C that we deal with in a charity capacity needs to be registered within the city of Tarpon Springs? Yes. Um, since the 5013C in this particular case that we're dealing with is the Rotary Club, does that, I, as far as I knew, the Rotary Club was was formed in Palm Harbor, but I'm, I'm not exactly sure. No, it's a tarpon. It's is it a tarpon yes. thing? Oh, okay. They've gone from before, yes. That was my only question. Yes. Sorry. Uh, it's been around for a very long time, this one anyway. So, um, are there any other comments? Uh, we have a motion and a second. Comments are out of the way. Roll call, please. Commissioner Kouyas? Yes. Commissioner Eisner? Yes. Commissioner Carr? Yes. Vice Mayor Lunt? Yes. Mayor Vatikiotis? Yes. Item uh, three, um, Ms. Commissioner Eisner, you pulled <coughs> that in, right? Thank you, Mayor. Okay. Um, I had this conversation with the city manager on Monday. Um, we just keep purchasing vehicles one after the other. Um, I don't have an issue with purchasing the vehicle if we really need it, but we don't really get a good explanation of, of is there another vehicle that can handle this? Um, in this pr presentation, there was no um, there was no year of what the, the vehicle we were replacing. I later had to find, find out it was an 04. Um, if these vehicles don't have any way of being repaired, what resale value do they have? So one of the things that I was bringing up uh, that we spoke about, and that's what I wanted to share with the board, is um, possibly looking into leasing and not holding these vehicles until they're worthless. Um, because in the next discussion, which is going to be four, um, each of these vehicles we have to service, and we're authorizing thirty thousand, and then we have Janine coming before us and saying it's forty-five thousand, and then it's sixty thousand, and then it's eighty thousand. And this has been my pet peeve that we are getting so involved in not only buying the vehicles but servicing the vehicles that the, <clears throat> I, I said at the next. Uh, budget meeting for next year. I know there's very little I could do at this point, but I need to keep, I'm going to keep bringing this up every single time we go through this because we're spending a just great deal of money and I don't know if it's the wisest way to do it. So that's my big thing. I, I know we need a flatbed to move equipment around, um, but I would really like to know if, <clears throat> and, um, if there are any other ways to handle this. The other thing I asked for was a write-up to know all of the vehicles, not on a daily basis. I don't want to know that the water truck has gone out, blah, blah, blah. But these trucks that we have sitting idle doing nothing, and we may be using it once or twice or three times a year, and we're just maintaining it, we're buying it, we're maintaining it for that rainy day that we might need it. I, I need a breakdown, and I asked for this, so it will be coming before us um, to have a full breakdown of, of all of the vehicles that are just sitting idle somewhere in town and how much use we're getting out of it. Not how much mileage, but how much use we're getting out of it. So I, I just keep seeing this. I don't know if it bothers everybody else, but it's bothering me. I see just a great deal of money being wasted. So that's oh. my comment. Okay. <clears throat> I'm not against this. No, 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 let me, let me finish. I've, I've got something to say, but I wanna hear from the other uh, commissioners first. Uh, actually, let's go to public, that's the way you're doing it, uh, public comments on, any, on this item at all. Uh, Mr. Jump, are there any public comments on this item? I should have asked for public comments on the uh, rest of the agenda items, but I did not. But is there anything on this one? Fine at this time. Okay. Um, commissioner comments, Commis uh, Vice Mayor Lund. Um I actually tend to agree. Uh, with a lot of the points that Commissioner Eisner made. Um, it took me considerable time to find out that it, we're talking about a 2004 F-450 and the reason for purchasing another vehicle were like parts aren't available. Well, if we're holding vehicles until parts aren't available, 
I mean, that might have been a good idea when vehicles ran for 90,000 miles, end of life, et cetera, et cetera. But 2004 vehicle, it's 2023. That's a 19-year-old vehicle. We shouldn't have had that vehicle in our, in our fleet for, for anywhere near that long. Um, so um, I, I tend to agree with Mr. Eisner, both on, on looking at different ways to manage our fleet and also when we do things like this, more information being provided than we just need to replace this particular vehicle, not its year, its mileage, um, the catch-all phrase, the parts aren't available, just not satisfactory to me, that sort of thing. And that's all I wanted to say. No, I, I understand. Thank you. Um, I agree. Commissioner Carr. Sure, I'll make a comment. Um, I mean, this is the same request that we've been asking for years, so let's give you a heads up on that. Okay. Commissioner Well, it seems to be a request that's needed. I mean, we'll see that the funding's coming from roads and streets, and a couple month, you know, a couple months closer to the end of the budget. If you know roads and streets is short, a certain amount of money, we'll understand why. It's a request that's needed, so I understand that the vehicle's old as well. Okay. Um, well, I I think that's a good idea. I mean, every every couple of years we go through this. Honestly, I, I uh, asked about it as a commissioner, and I was provided the uh, asked for the list of vehicles that we had, and then how many we had in the pool, the service pool, and things, and and that was readily uh, provided. And the philosophy behind that, I know um, <coughs> Chief Young's not here tonight, but uh, police vehicles, there, there's a long history of that. They're replaced every seven years, I believe, and every seven years we should have a brand new. Fleet. We're supposed to, I think, buy seven cruisers. There's about 50 vehicles in our fleet, seven cruisers uh, per year to keep up with that replacement because that's that break even as far as the cost of maintenance <coughs> versus a new one. But I, I think that uh, we should get a, a report for not just us, for, for the benefit of the residents because I, I know that's one of the more common observations that you hear is all these new trucks driving around town and things like that. Uh, but there's a reason for that too. And, and I understand what you're saying, uh, Commissioner Eisner, as far as buying a truck and it just basically sitting there for what you, you don't know if that's the case or you don't know if that's not the case. And you'd like to have a little more information. So I, I think that you go ahead, uh, say a few words about this. No, I, I, I just want to say, um, I, I've heard you over the nine months this has been a board and working. We've got a new fleet manager, not new, he's been here a little bit, but when he took over, he had a lot of things to do to get his mechanic, he had a lot of things to do before he could get to some of these things. He knows, he knows all the things that this board has been asking. He has ideas about um, the fleet and doing a lot of things you're talking about and that's, that's something he is getting on. Um, like I, I'm setting up with Commissioner Eisner, I'd be glad to set up with any of you a, a tour with our new fleet man and hear his great ideas. He was a, you know, he came from within, had left us and loved it here and came back when the fleet office position came over, had a lot of ideas back then that maybe weren't listened to. Um, but he is, has an idea of a lot of these things you've talked about. We're beginning on them, and he knows that we have to have them ready for this upcoming budget that's coming because this, this board has made that. And if any of you, um, I'm already set up for Commissioner Eisner. We're going to work on a date to do that and walk through, but you will be seeing differences on him on a, almost everything you mentioned. He is going to work on a plan and reports and have availability of all the information you've asked for. So we've heard you, and, and we have got the guy in that position, Mr. Vecchioni, um, that will be able to carry it out and get you all that you want to see for these vehicles and what you're going to want to see before we get anything approved in the budget. They know what, what, what you're going to want to see, what reports and those things. And to go back in the past times and see what vehicles shouldn't be here shouldn't, and, and a plan of how we got to purchase these vehicles and what plan do we use. Can we go back? We've looked at lease plans before. <coughs> they haven't panned out as the better way to go, but that doesn't mean they aren't now. So, so all these things are in the work. We've heard you over the nine months, and uh, we'll be working, and you'll start to see those things. No, I, and I think that I don't know that it, unless some commissioner wishes to speak up, um, someone wants to speak up, I don't think anyone's saying let's drop what we're doing to put this 
you know, presentation together. I think it, oh, there's, no, a, there's no, timing he, for that. And yeah. uh, on the other hand, I, I think um, Vice Mayor Lunt's got a, a good point is maybe, because I was wondering about the mileage as well, um, how, much, how many miles do we have on these vehicles and things like that. When, uh, we, we were asking for something. Some of them are um, mentioning what the replacement vehicle is. Some of them don't say what they're being re replacing. But it would be nice to know what the uh, replacement vehicle is and how much mileage that one has on it for buying a new one. I think that's what you're yes. getting at. Is that right? Mm -hmm. that, that would be as a minimum. Shouldn't take a whole lot of effort. No. So, no. Okay. All right. Is there anything else on this item? Okay. We have a motion to approve item three, please. Motion to approve item three. Is there a second? Second. second. Okay, roll call, please. Commissioner Puyas? Yes. Commissioner Eisner? Yes. Commissioner Carr? Yes. <coughs> Vice Mayor Lunt? Yes. Mayor Vatikios? Yes. Item four, Commissioner Eisner? Yeah, this is just added to what three was. Um, we're changing and adding another eight or nine thousand dollars. This seems to go on at each and every meeting. Um, I want to just investigate whether we should have maintenance agreements within the lease. So I see the vehicles over at uh, Furman Chevrolet. Um, I, I just want to make sure that we're getting our bang for our buck. This, when you add this along with the cost of these 60, 70, and 80 thousand dollar vehicles, it's grating on my nerves. That's all I want to say. So. Okay. I, I want to see if it's worthwhile to do it this way. If it is, fine. If it's not, uh, we should be leasing. You know, I was just driving today out on 19, and there was a uh, Mason truck, and it said leased by rider. There's leasing agreements galore, um, and they may be beneficial. I don't know. Where we hold it three years or four years and flip them, um, you know, they're, they're nowhere near the cost of ownership and taking depreciation and then going and selling it at a, you know, public auction for dirt cheap, and we get nothing out of it. So, okay. that's it. All right. Uh, other commissioner comments, uh, Vice Mayor Lund. Um, yeah. I, the only thing, in addition to Ford, that I noticed was uh, pretty much the same verbiage in the in the justification. Um, I, because of this particular one, was curious as to what specific repairs our fleet couldn't do. I noticed there were some really minor ones on there and, and I'm going like, so in my mind it brought up more, what are the capabilities our fleet department as far as repair, um, you know, and, and we're increasingly buying OEM services from a dealer rather than repairing it in house, which is why we have fleet maintenance in the first place and I just, I'd like more information when this kind of stuff happens as to what repairs those literally are and why we can't do them. And should we be taking steps to be able to do this kind of repair? Would that be able to be answered during yeah. one of those tours? And okay. Yes, and, and we'll, we'll work on it. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Carr. Commissioner Cuyas. I have no comment. Okay. I'm, I'm fine. I, I think, as uh, city manager said, on specific questions is what our capabilities are versus um, the advantages of a leasing vehicle could be accommodated at the fleet location where this this repair work's being done, and and then uh, and then at the proper time we'd have a little more information as far as uh, the presentation, the philosophy behind it, and everything. Commissioner Eisner, I wanted to dovetail off of what uh, Vice Mayor said. Some of these uh, invoices, and just by price, thirteen hundred, $1,500, $53, $100, $79, $49, $1,213, these can't be very difficult type repairs. So they should be done in-house, I think. I mean, it doesn't total up to a lot, but these are um, stuff that we should be able to do in-house. That's why I asked. Oh, no. We'll get those answers yes. for you. Um, is there a motion and a second? You're not objecting to this item. No, I'm not. Okay. I'm not is there no. a, a motion and a second to this item? Motion to approve item five. Second. second. Oh. Was that item? This was four? item four, I believe. Oh, I'm sorry. Item motion four. to approve item four. Is there a second? Second. Yeah, it's item four. Uh, increase file two two zero zero. 
27-N-AM single source purchase of Chevrolet GM original equipment manufacturer parts and services. There's a motion and a second. Roll call, please. Commissioner Kouyas? Yes. Commissioner Eisner? Yes. Commissioner Carr? Yes. Vice Mayor Lunt? Yes. Mayor Vatikiotis? Yes. Okay, item five, Vice Mayor Lunt. Um, okay, so there is a, a recommendation within this that says um, we need to decide on whether or not to approve another year of funding this or condition the funding on renovations of the bathrooms. I, I haven't had the time to go down and personally inspect them, but just going by the photos, there's, there's no way that I want to continue paying for that. It needs to be renovated. Um, they're in visibly deplorable condition. Um, and if this is representative of, uh, you know, what the city wants to maintain, I, I, I don't think it's up to snuff. So that's my only comment. Uh, okay. We need to make it conditional on, on these being renovated. Okay. Do you, do you want to make any re recommendations or do you have any options? Yeah, let me, let me bring Tom up because he's been working over the years and especially with this issue of the, the renovation issue um, and what's been going on with them and, uh, and, and why we say we need to put something in here um, to make sure they uphold what they have told us and uh, I know they've recently in the past two weeks had about a four thousand dollar problem that they've been working on um, to do before they can do the renovation and stuff so why don't you update on this year we usually come up with some kind of issue with this thing every year but bring the discussions and what and and what the recommendation is to put in there um, about seeing a change within a certain amount of time or possibly revisiting this before the board. Sure, yeah, um, yeah. I've been dealing with this for quite a few years now. Uh, yeah, I had spoke to the new owners, as we all know, they, they come in last year, and uh, <clears throat> when I presented about update, uh, renewing this over here, I did bring the, up the, the issue of the condition of the restrooms. They've been clean, but they, they definitely need upgrading, and I actually got an email back from them uh, beginning of uh, December stating that they will be starting, which they have, starting doing some tile work, and they promised this work will be done sometime in March, upgrading the entire bathroom. Okay. Let, let me just say <clears throat> something. Um, the, this is, we're talking about the sponge exchange now. Yes, sir. Okay. I want to just clarify that. The, the, the family that owns it's had it for about a one, one year period, and I know they put tremendous amount of effort uh, into uh, making repairs that I would consider more of safety issues and, and significant material degradation. They corrected that, a new deck. They've worked on the sponge boat, some other concrete work, steel work, and they're continuing on this. Um, I, and, and I know that this is something that um, is there. I think you said it's clean, but it's... It's, um, it, it's in need of upgrading, it, definitely. Right. Definitely. And I, I and, and I think you're suggesting. I think you mentioned that they're going to be starting at least on some of this beginning in March. Well, actually, they said they'll be working full time. Right now, they're starting some tile work, okay. and they're hoping to have it completed sometime March. Yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. the one thing I would like to do is give them an uh, an opportunity to make some improvements before we become. Uh, I don't want to say critical, but uh, of the condition there. I just I know that they're trying to make some improvements and, and I, it wasn't an inexpensive piece of property to purchase and, and I think they've done a lot of nice things down there so far so I, I'd like to kind give of, them an opportunity. Yeah, kind of the rationale about a reevaluation evaluation in six months to make it done, again, they've got a serious problem with the pipes underneath that I know they've had, I think, people out there three times in the past, two or three weeks, until they get that piping and clogging. If they put in new stuff right now before they get that problem solved and fixed, obviously all the new, you know, you that there could be a right. disaster. You can't do it until you fix underground. And there's plumbing rules. We verified um, mm -hmm. the, the, the times that they've been out there trying to find out what in the ground. And until they, so why we said the six months as opposed to the three, they've got to get a handle on that. And they're working on it presently in January. I don't think they're quite here. So. As opposed to the three, why the six? Again, they they can't start renovate that thing until they get whatever 
the clog is because an eruption will destroy yeah. everything they've done. But but there needs to be they need to know that you know we're looking at we're going to come back and evaluate that, and if we don't see the proper thing to put the taxpayers' money in, then we'll review it. But that's why in the recommendation we recommend to approve the reevaluation in the six months to see that they've met what what they've admitted in writing to us that they're going to work on and do. But there are circumstances now why they can't, why they haven't been able to get started in December and early January on this process. Okay. Why don't we uh, hang on. What we'll do is um, I'm going to go to, uh, that was the introduction with Vice Mayor Lant. I'm going to go ahead and go to public comments and see if there's any public comments and then we'll come back to the commission comments. Sure. Uh, are there any public comments on this item? Here at Lax 514 Ashland Avenue. Uh, I hear the faxes you're hearing, and you probably know a little bit more than I just reading this, but I do have history with this particular issue. We've always gotten kind of promises. We agreed to the agreement, and somehow the promises have excuses later that they didn't come about. So don't, not knowing the people, I'll say they're honorable, their intentions are honorable. So I would only say to protect yourselves and when you make your motion, <clears throat> yourselves and them leeway, think about how you wanna craft it such that it is dependent on them fulfilling what they're saying to do, but in the meantime, not constricting them in the funds they would receive. So maybe in set, what is the 7,500 by 12, what is that, like 1,500 a month? Uh, I'm sorry, my math right And a quarter. Say again? Six and a quarter. All right, so instead of six and a quarter each month, you give them half. Once they fulfill their obligation, you give them all the back money you've held up, and then you keep moving on forward with their regular payments. So, again, I'm not questioning their honesty or trustworthiness, but you have to look at it as this is a contract, and you want to make sure your concerns are fully protected. Thank you. Thank you. Um, are there any other public comments? Mr. Jump, are there any remote access comments? And we do not have anyone on attending online at this time. Okay, and I'd already checked with Ms. Jacobs before. The only uh, writing comment we had was the one for public record. So uh, let's go back to the commission. Um, Commissioner Carr, do you have any comments? I've got no comments on this. I mean, the, other than the bathrooms do need to be updated, I know there's some updates that were done a few years ago, and it, obviously the updates weren't that great because they looked a lot better a few years ago, I remember. Um, so I'm happy to hear that the, the property owner is willing to work with the city on upgrades. I've seen other upgrades at the sponge exchange. I've seen some new tiles go down to the floor uh, where you, you walk in the public areas. So uh, it does seem like there's money being invested here. So I'm happy to support this tonight. Okay. Commissioner Ison. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor. Um, I agreed with everything Vice Mayor uh, Lunt said. Um, but this is not something that can be done with just tiles. I just got to tell you, there was not one thing that I looked at in the pictures that looked like they're salvageable. Uh, not the partitions, not the toilets, nothing. These need to be fully gutted um, and redone. I understand I have no issues waiting to get structure done before you put the amenities on it. I'm okay with that. But my big question, and I had this conversation with the city manager, what are we paying for? Uh, this 7,500 and 625 per month, is that for the paper goods? Is that for cleaning? Is that for um, any repairs that go? None of this gives me an explanation of what this actually goes towards. So it's like, uh, if we're paying for paper goods, I may not have anything to say. Okay, you're gonna supply paper goods, then we're paying too much. Uh, if it's going towards cleaning, I have no schedule of when they even do a cleaning, so I don't know how to gauge that. So there was a lot of missing information for me.
to make a decision. I'll go along with it for a six month uh, thing. I know there they have issues there, and I know they only own it for a year. But I need this is embarrassing. I I'll just be honest with you. I I said it to the city manager. I wouldn't use this bathroom. That's how bad it looks. So. Okay. Commissioner Kuyas. <clears throat> I agree with the vice mayor and Commissioner Eisner. I mean, the bathroom does need to be renovated. Um, I have a couple questions regarding, you know, are we, and I would be interested in, in doing some type of good faith and paying what the amount is for six months and if we don't see some type of, you know, good renovation, maybe stopping the payments. But um, this is probably original bathroom for what, 40, 50 years and um, I do have a you know question. Once renovation does start, I mean we're basically paying them to keep a, a bathroom that needs to be renovated during the same process. So um, I'd like to see some type of you know good faith on both sides of the city as as well as the property owner. Six months in, if we don't see some type of significant changes, maybe stopping the agreement because we do need the the bathroom for you know regular. Uh, visitors in town, but just want to make sure we both hold our ends of the deal. Okay. Thank you. Let me just offer a little backup and maybe answer a couple of questions. Uh, first of all, what are we paying for? Um, what we're paying for is the right to allow the public to use the bathroom, period. Doesn't matter, paper goods, upkeep, nothing. If the owner of the if Sponge Exchange says, I don't want the public using this bathroom, that's the end of the story. That's what the $625 a month or was it, uh, was it come out $7,000 a year? What was the amount for, on a year? $7,500. $7,500. When I was city manager, that amount was $9,000. Mm -hmm. wow. 25 years ago, it was $9,000 for the exact same amount. And it got almost to the point where, uh, and it was not the, um, the, the, the ones that had owned it that just sold it, but a generation prior to that, and we used to joust a bit, and I actually offered that the city would maintain it if we were given $9,000 a year by the owner. And of course, that didn't work out. So we continued paying to uh, help upkeep, and that literally it was the right for the public to use the bathroom, and also it was before the bathrooms were in place at Hope Street. Mm -hmm. We've got those public restrooms. But in, since then, there's been more and more people visiting the sponge docks. I mean, if we want, and then also we do have the uh, public bathrooms at the marina as well. So the one solution is to long term, we talk about parking garages and things like that. Long term would be to plan another public bathroom down there somewhere. Don't ask me where, but somewhere down there. And, um, and um, that would be the one solution. The, um, the other part of this, uh, of course, is that long, long time ago, before you see the exchange in its current condition, it was owned by the uh, Tarpon Springs Sponge Exchange Association. I don't know the correct title of it, but the bathrooms were not in the back. They were actually on Dota Canise Boulevard and those were public bathrooms. Anybody could go in there. There was for the sponge boats, sponge divers, tourists, it didn't matter, they, they went in there. So when the uh, sponge exchange was remodeled, they placed those bathrooms in the back. They were only for the patrons of the sponge exchange, in other words, the stores. And, and, um, and then because we had many of the businesses did not have facilities because of their age, uh, including ADA, um, we had to do something down there way, and it even preceded me as city manager. So I, I know everything that we're talking about. I, it doesn't change what the current conditions are. Um, as far as I'm concerned, I'm very receptive to whatever the commission wants. All I'm asking for is to recognize that the current owners have only had about a year, and they've been working continuously to try and make improvements. And, and I'm, I'm sure this is on their list somewhere. I can't tell you where it is. I haven't spoken to the owners uh, at all, but, um, but uh, we do need bathrooms down there for the public, and, and um, that's what the $625 does. It just allows us to have the public use that bathroom. That's it. So, um, 
Are there any other comments? Yeah, I still Go ahead. I mean, I understand that, you know, that uh, the Coquinos have only had the sponge exchange for about a year. Um, and that the bathrooms obviously were in great condition when they bought the property to begin with. I understand that we're paying, you know, whatever it is, $625 a month or whatever, so that the public can use those bathrooms. <coughs> um, the point is that the bathrooms right now are presenting a not great look for the city of Tarpon Springs, never mind the sponge exchange, but these are where our tourists go. If they're in the sponge exchange, if they're in that area, they don't always walk up to the marina, they don't always walk down to Hope Street, they're in the sponge exchange, there's signs that says the bathrooms are towards the rear, et cetera, et cetera. So <clears throat> my concern is not really so much about paying them to share in the maintenance of these facilities, it's that these facilities are degraded to such a point where it's starting to be an embarrassment for the city to offer them. And I think I don't really care about the money so much. I care about the aesthetics that this presents to our tourist trade. And I think we need to work with uh, Nick and Patty to, to get this done as efficiently and effectively as possible, not eight months down the road or a year or when we do our budgets next year. I want to hear about, well, we have plumbing problems, we haven't done anything. That's not an acceptable solution. So I, I don't know what we do. I mean, we don't have a leverage point, but one of us needs to go down and talk to Nick and say, look, Nick, this is, needs to be done now. No, I don't, I, I, I think everybody agrees with what you're saying. There's not an issue there. It's just there's a limit of what we can do. I think going down there and uh, having a discussion with uh, the family is, is uh, a very first step and an important step and that should be done. I, I, I don't know what their plans are. I don't even know if um, they're aware of that we're even talking about this item tonight. I don't know. And um, maybe what we should do, it, let me, th th does this expire? Um, this uh, contract, the agreement expires this week. I saw that it yes. expires January yes. 10th. Is yes. that right? So today, yeah, today. so the timing yes. is perfect. Yeah. Um, if you want to extend it for three months and then revisit it six months, I think that's what the option is right now, and then come back and revisit it in three months. I want to extend it for months. three months with that's fine. the definite. And then we have more information. I, like I said, I'm open. My only thing is just to recognize uh, the ownership of the exchange. Oh, yeah, I understand. I, I don't even mind if I'm the one that goes around and talks to Nick. I mean, it's. He's a, a decent guy to deal with, both so with he, his yes, wife and his family, so, okay. but it needs to be done. Right. Okay, so why don't we go ahead and uh, have a motion to that effect and a second and then okay. approve it and get on with the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> so you want a motion to extend it for three months? Right. And with the condition of having a conversation with Nick and Patty? We'll come back with uh, uh, reevaluate it in three months, I think, is, and then whatever we have. I'm sure that we've had that preliminary talk. Tomorrow yeah. we will have the talk from what came from the meeting and <clears throat> okay. what we expect to see in three months to renew it further than that. We'll have that conversation tomorrow. Okay, with that's the motion. Yes. A second. Second. Okay, roll call, please. Commissioner Kulias? Yes. Commissioner Eisner? Yes. Commissioner Carr? Yes. Vice Mayor Lunt? Yes. Mayor Vatikiotis? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, that ends the consent agenda at 728. Let me see what we've got. Um, our rules of procedure require us to uh, shift over to ordinances at 730 sharp. Um, ordinances and resolutions, and we've got six of those this evening. And I'm just trying to look at look over what we've got right now that could go. I don't think there's anything that um, that could go very easily within a within one minute. Let's just hang on for one more minute, and then we'll just shift on over to the uh, ordinances and and resolutions.
Um, we're going to continue on with item 13, uh, which is ordinance 2023-01. Uh, Mr. Salzman, if you could read the ordinance by title, please. Ordinance 2023-01, an ordinance of the City of Tarpon Springs, Florida, amending the City of Tarpon Springs Code of Ordinances, Appendix A, Comprehensive Zoning and Land Development Code, Article 17, Public Art Program, by revising the definitions, amending the Public Art Committee membership, revising the powers and duties of the Public Art Committee, revising the provisions for public art juries, revising the Public Art Committee procedures, <coughs> revising member removal, revising the artist selection methods and criteria, revising the bond provisions of the Public Art Fund, and revising ownership of works, providing for severability, providing for repeal of ordinances or parts of ordinances in conflict herewith, providing for inclusion in the Code of Ordinances of the City of Tarpon Springs, Florida, and providing for the effective date of this ordinance. That is Ordinance 2023-01, uh, read by title only on first reading. Second reading will be held February 14th, 2023. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Salzman. Uh, City Manager, of course. Yes, um, before I introduce it, I want to I want to assure all of you that this was a very in-depth, thorough process that was gone through, and I want to thank um, Ms. Joan Jennings as chairman in the Public Art Committee for working with us, which my team included Diane Woods, um, Paul Smith, his active role, he's on vacation, or he would have been here tonight because he was a very active role representing me and planning and Renee. Um, we worked very long and hard and thoroughly and hashed many things over um, to bring this forward to you, um, the positive changes we see in the public art ordinance. So on that, I'll have Renee introduce it uh, and what we're bringing forward to you tonight for the changes. Thank you. This is Ordinance 2023-01, uh, an ordinance amending our public art ordinance. Um, as the city manager stated, uh, this has gone through several workshops and reviews, um, quite a long process uh, with uh, various staff and the public art committee. Um, I do, I'll do. i just kind of go through the just the very highlights of the ordinance. I'm really going to have to rely on Ms. Jennings to uh, probably answer some of the more specific questions. Um, so the, the ordinance includes, you know, correction of some outdated references in terms and procedures, um, updates to our procedures and, and including the definitions, um, some of the membership, uh, types of membership, the ad hoc membership, um, procedures for removal of members, um, artist selection methods, um, the public art fund and ownership of the artwork. So uh, updates to the powers and duties of the committee to expand uh, the scope of their annual reporting plan and budget requests. Um, there were uh, changes to the um, the maximum visual access to, to accommodate better visual accessibility of, uh, of artwork such that it, by um, specifying that they can't be located on public rights of way that where the speed zones are over 35 miles per hour. Um, there were uh, amendments to the uh, standards for development and redevelopment, which specifically to revise the review criteria for the developer proposed art. Um, and then ultimately uh, the, there was an increase in the, you have two options with the public art fee, uh, with the public art requirement, you can either do it, it, build an actual or commission um, an actual piece of art as part of a project or you can do a pay in lieu into the public art fund. Um, in the past, the uh, if you were building a piece, the uh, the fee, the, the multiplier was 1% of the total construction cost had to be set aside for the art. If you did, if you did a pay in lieu, it was a quarter, three quarters of a percent to pay. So it was more efficient, so to speak, to pay um, that and so that is being increased from the three quarters of 1% up to 1%. So that's a very high overview of the changes. The Planning and Zoning Board um, reviewed this at their last meeting and did recommend approval. There were two conditions that they recommended um, or revisions, I should say. The first was that any landscape art, uh, which that, I'll let Ms. Jennings talk more about that, but any, any landscape art uh, would have a requirement for maintenance of that art to run with the land through a covenant for maintenance filed in the public records and that 
The ownership of the artwork be looked at by a copyright or a patent attorney uh, to determine proper language to be included. So um, the first one of those, the landscape art, uh, the maintenance requirement is really, um, really already addressed in section 296. Um, there's already a requirement for art to be maintained and it's, that's uh, provided for in the ordinance as it is now. So I don't know that it needs to be specific to landscape art, but um, that was a recommendation of the Planning and Zoning Board. So with that, I will stop. Um, the, I do wanna just note that we will be advertising the corrected title that was read into the record tonight prior to second reading. Um, it was advertised for tonight with a, with a slightly different title. So I just wanted to get that into the record. So with that, I'll stop and I'll answer any questions that I can on the development side. Ms. Jennings is here on the more intricacies of the public art <laughs> process itself. The, Thank you. The, uh, tri the advertising, is it gonna cause us to do a, a, a second first reading, is it? No, okay. no. All right, um, let's go to uh, public. Well, Ms. Jennings, you're getting up. If, if there's anyone here that wishes to answer, what we're gonna do, Ms. Jennings, is go to public comments and then the commission will be asking questions. We'll have a motion in a second, then we'll have a discussion among the commission and then we'll make the, uh, the vote at that time. So uh, are there any public comments, please? Thank you, David Ballard Geddes, Jr., Georgia Avenue in Palm Harbor. I do have a quick question, more of a concern. Um, as far as landscape art is concerned, I, I'm not quite so sure as to how specific that is. Um, as uh, under uh, section uh, 296, where it would require a, a patent attorney. Um, and I, and uh, I heard something about a bond bond necessity on, on such, uh, such, landscape, such artwork um, as uh, labeled as landscape art. I'm not quite so sure that I fully understand what's taking, what's being said. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Geddes. We'll get an answer for you when Ms. Jennings gets up there with the, uh, the commission. Uh, are there any other public comments? Mr. Jump, are there any uh, public comments, remote access? If anyone online would like to speak on this item, please raise your hand and you'll be allowed in to talk. And we do not have any raised hands at this time. Thank you. Let's go to the commission for questions. Vice Mayor Lund. Um, I have no questions at this time. Commissioner Carr. I've got a question about the 35 mile per hour and then the preceding sentence. You have a question? Yeah. Yeah, please, Mr. Jennings. <laughs> so I'm not like. sure who could answer this one. Uh, so it comes down to the excluding, so maximum visual accessibility to pedestrian or local vehicular traffic, excluding highway speed zones over 35 miles per hour, and excluding locations or roadways leading or close to such highways, such as to constitute a safety hazard. Um, so my question is, if there's redevelopment on US 19, which would constitute probably anything, that it's gonna be a requirement with redevelopment to have some type of public art there you then lose the opportunity to have public art in that area of the city. Is that, am right. I understanding that correctly? Mm -hmm. So there's not a desire to have any public art along US 19, let's say in the public shopping center, for example, where there's probably more visitors than anywhere else in Tharp Springs. You well, lose the, the ability to do the that. The concern was along the highway. So in other words, uh, actually, um, city manager LaCorris brought up the, you know, the point you know, in terms of uh, police strategy for, you know, uh, public safety. You don't want people that are doing 55 to 70 miles an hour to say, oh, go oh, look at that. You know, so it's, it's actually along the highway and it is a, it's a safety issue. I've got, a, I think, a complete different approach to this one. So if you have a piece of public art that's on a property or a mural of some sort or something along those lines, a lot of properties offset off US 19. I agree you shouldn't have public art in the right of way of US 19, but if you have a piece of property that you're redeveloping in US 19, it'd be great to have a piece of public art there as well too. So um, there's not much debate. I just don't agree with that one, that one section. And I think that's something that we need to strike um, for that very reason. So example, publics, for example, is set way back off US 19. Um, you've got plenty of other areas for redevelopment where that could additionally be there as well too. But that's not um, in, a 45, in a 35 mile an hour plot zone then. 
it's the address is US 19 though. Yeah, but it's not affect. It's not doesn't have those kind of speed limits. US 19 does. Has 55 miles per hour, right? Right. So then you're you're missing the opportunity to put public art there. That's what I'm getting at with that. So if I think the the way of getting there would be to putting it in the right of way of any highway that's over 30 miles, 35 miles per hour, because there's going to be flexibility to still utilize public art for any redevelopment along US 19 that's set off the road. Um, and I think that would do a lot better for um, the city as a whole. Well, if you look further into the ordinance, you'll also see that uh, any developer proposed art has to uh, be approved by the committee. So if somebody wants to do something in, the, in an area or a situation that you're suggesting, they can just bring it to the committee. But then the guidelines, you, so you have to be careful because if the ordinance is law, then at that point, mm -hmm. you can't just decide, well, we're going to bypass what the law states. It's um, not bypassing it if it's not affected by the speed limit. Okay. So what my recommendation would be is that this would be clarified, Renee to have something along the lines of any highways that are over 35 miles per hour that public art wouldn't be in the right-of-way area, but you'd have the ability to put it on the piece of property. Can, can I back up just one sec, just, cause I, just to have a full discussion? So it, you know, under the, it says artist selection criteria, and it says the following criteria at a minimum shall be considered by the Public Art Committee in the selection of artwork. And then you have this list, and that's where that says maximum visual accessibility to pedestrian or local traffic, excluding highway speed zones over 35 miles per hour and excluding locations or roadways leading or close to such highways so as to constitute a safety hazard. I, mean, I, think, there, I think that gives interpretive ability to the, to the public art committee to say in a situation like you're talking about, if, if the public shopping center or whatever is redeveloping and there's you know, an area that's you know, accessible through the, 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 you know, the internal public access, you know, that it's, you know, such that it's really not going to be a visual, you know, hazard driving down the highway or someone's going to catch someone's eye. I think they have the ability, the way it's written, to make that interpretation. Renee expressed it better than I did. <laughs> I appreciate that, but I, I think it's pretty clear here. I think there's an opportunity to refine it a little bit further so that the future boards are, understand the intent um, of the public art committee and what, what the intent is from staff to put all this effort behind there. So I just don't want to miss the intent sure. for an opportunity here in the future. So, thank you. I'm in agreement with everything else. Thanks. Okay. Um, Commissioner Eisner. <clears throat> thank you, Mayor. Um, there's two things in this that I have a little bit of an issue. Does it state anywhere, I, I know it says on maintenance for down the road, but what if something becomes non-maintainable where it just is destroyed, <coughs> corroded. Um, is there any stipulation in there? Who pays for that? Who has to correct that? Well, uh, it's written into our uh, the public art committee budget to have the maintenance of all the artwork. I know, understand that's maintenance. It's keeping it clean, shiny, or whatever it needs to be. But act of God, I mean, I, I don't know. <laughs> I, I know. I'm just saying, if if it does not hold up, what happens? Is there uh, any onus on the develop, you know, the developing, uh, it, or does it just come from the art committee? Uh, it would probably come from the art committee. That would be because so you it, would have to replace are, it. We are obligated to maintain any public art projects in the city. Okay. And I think that <coughs> in the first place, if we put something outdoors, it's going to, you know, implicitly uh, last a long time in the, in the elements. You know, like um, the mermaid on the bayou, we have that, you know, looked at regularly so that it doesn't corrode. You know, we just, we just uh, redid the wood on the story time bench to make it as waterproof and sunproof as possible. So, you know, we, we do our best efforts to maintain existing artwork and to select artwork that will stand up. Like uh, currently, we're working on a black heritage project and it consists of a lot of images and 
the material that contains all of the images is specifically graffiti proof, scratch proof. You know, it's 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 meant to be outdoors. <coughs> and it's meant to hold up. Okay. But it's just it's struck by lightning, all bets are off. <coughs> yes, I, I understand. <laughs> if anything's struck by lightning, it's pretty much history. <laughs> Um, the other thing, and I know I've brought this up to you before, um, I, I'm strongly into a consideration if a project's under a million dollars that um, there should be incremental charge for that. Well, that was something that came under <clears throat> intense discussion. I understand, but I'm not in agreement that it has to hit a million before there is a art fee put in, I think it should be incremental, so I wanted to make that a public <coughs> statement. Okay. Now, we, we actually, uh, our first revision had it uh, 250000 and under, but I think given today's economy, it would be hard pressed to build a dollhouse for under a million dollars. But, uh, you know, it's, it, it's, you know, realistically, um, you know, like for the longest time, we were told that flagship bank didn't read reach that benchmark, but it did. And they, we got a, uh, you know, a contribution from them. But you know, the thing is that something, most, pro most development projects are gonna be a million dollars and up. I can't imagine you know, a major development that would be under that. But uh, the thing is that uh, you know, Tarpon is becoming saturated and built up. So the likelihood of, uh, you know, having these large developments happen is decreasing. So we're basically cutting ourselves off. And it would also you know, discourage developers from coming to TARP, and that was one of the points of discussion we had, if you know, they know that they were gonna get you know, hit, if somebody was just building, say, a you know, small house or something like that. So as I said, we had long, serious discussions about all of that. So you know, the provision was put in that if we do have a project that's approved by the Board of Commissioners and the Mayor, and we don't have the funds to do it, then we can make an application to the city for the shortfall. Was there a discussion to make it incremental, 750 to a million, a million to? No, it was, to it was, the benchmark was set at a million. Okay. That's where I would go with this, but. Commissioner Kuliash. I want to thank staff and the Public Art Committee and Planning and Zoning for just reviewing it all. And uh, Commissioner uh, Carr did bring up a good point with just the semantics of words. I, I don't want to miss out on the opportunity of a, being able to put some public art in a 15 mile an hour parking lot. You know, it's set three, 400 feet behind US 19. So, and those words shall be considered or all included. So, happy to support it all. Okay, I, um, I, I don't have any questions. Um, I'm gonna have a few words to say in the discussion. I, I wanna reiterate, Ms. Vinson, your opinion is uh, the issues that Commissioner Carr brought up are taken into account in the current language in terms of your opinion. I, I mean, I believe they are. I have no problems between now and second reading, you know, seeing if we can make it a little clearer. Um, okay. But I mean, I, I think it's there, but we'll, we'll look at it again. First well, that's what reading. I was going to ask sure. you. Would it be reasonable to sure. uh, approve this on the first reading, take a look at that yeah. for the second reading, come back with an opinion with Ms. Mm -hmm. what, our second reading is February 14th, I believe? Yes, sir. And your public art committee, the next public art committee is when? Tomorrow. Tomorrow. Okay. Well, there you go. <laughs> we'll have an answer <laughs> at the second reading. And to... Uh, address Mr. Geddes' question. He's, yes, thank you very much. Uh, apples and oranges are two different, two different items. They're not connected at all. Okay, do you have any other questions? Okay. Can I um, just add to the record regarding um, Commissioner Eisner's you know, question about the, the value in, in the one million? Um, we did have a lot of discussion about redevelopment being, you know, going forward, that's going to be the lion's share of what we're going to be looking at. And we have, you know, a lot of structures that don't meet current building code. Um, they might be in flood zones and don't meet FEMA. So uh, from a redevelopment standpoint, we were concerned about um, 
lowering that threshold, you know, when there's redevelopment, you know, because when you come in to do a redevelopment project, you're automatically going to get hit with building code issues. If you happen to be, be dealing with FEMA as well, there's so and those those drive up the cost of a project already. That's going to get captured um, as as part of the overall value. But we were just cognizant of you know hitting another one of you know that 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 was the, some of the discussion. I just wanted to frame that a little bit around the price point of of dropping it down versus leaving it where it is. Yes, I've got one other question. Um, Renee, this is something I've asked in the past. So multifamily uh, development applies. Yes. Single family home developments do not apply. The, the creation of a subdivision itself and the site construction is subject to it. Once it's platted and you're building individual homes, the individual homes are not uh, subject to an in the, you know, the $1 million. So it's, it's, it's the initial construction of a subdivision versus, you know, we can't, you know, it's it would be virtually impossible to you know to run, to monitor you know individual single family homes on platted lots that have existed for you know in some cases a hundred years in this town so yeah but uh, if a developer is developing the whole neighborhood though let's say for example they're coming in and developing the whole neighborhood not just the the, the utilities portion of it that but would be the difference right the the fee would the the calculation is based on would not include the value of the homes because you don't do when they're going to be built developers generally don't come in and spec i mean sometimes they do but they're not going to build you know 35 single family homes <clears throat> and spec those out you know they're they're going to come in and an individual is going to put a contract to have a house built you know by that developer or sure. or they may just buy a lot and it may be you know somewhere else so, you know built by somebody else completely so that's always been the threshold of you know it's the site plan you know the subdivision creation itself all the site construction everything but the individual homes as those come through for permitting do not get are not part of the calculation okay just for clarity so it's roads development of the yes. subdivision itself yes retention ponds yes landscaping Yes, cumulatively, everything that goes into it. If that's under a million dollars, then there's no Correct. payment. Okay, I just Correct. want to make sure that the board is aware of that. Correct. If there's any issues. Okay, okay. Um, are there any other questions? Do I have a motion and a second? Motion to approve with additional verbiage to clarify the miles per hour above 35 miles per hour. Okay. Second. All right. Uh, any discussion? Vice Mayor Carr? No, nope, I just want to say thank you for all the hard work. I know if this was a bear to get through. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah, I, I could do the same thing the Vice Mayor said. Thank you for putting some effort behind this. I know there's a lot that goes behind that, behind the scenes. So, And we just yeah, vote on it. And a the whole time. committee worked on it as well as staff. And I do want to also thank Pat McNeese. She was, yeah. Um, Absolutely. Commissioner Eisner. Just thank Carr. you. I, I always thank you, Joe. Yes. <laughs> I, <laughs> I obviously want to thank Mrs. Jennings and the entire Public Art Committee, uh, Ms. Woods, Ms. Vincent. I also wish to thank the uh, city manager because he was at the receiving end, a lot of the ideas. Um, <laughs> I, the, uh, the, the incremental uh, <laughs> funding was not... Um, foreign to me it had been brought up some time ago mm -hmm. and and my solution was well by the actually i think it was um, the city manager don't take this the wrong way right. but the city manager told me says this is what they want to do i says well buy them off tell them you'll <laughs> offset it in the budget <laughs> <laughs> so i, I think that's a, actually that's exactly what's going on right now so <laughs> I, want I, to I, don't, I guess I shouldn't tell you, but that's exactly what I was hoping you'd do. <laughs> and, and, and I want to congratulate you because, quite frankly, this was a very complicated ordinance to revitalize, revamp. Mm -hmm. um, I know we've struggled a great deal with this in the past with the acceptance of whether public art was actually important. I think we all recognize it's important. Mm -hmm. I think we want it to continue into perpetuity. I, I do know there's probably some remaining questions issues such as the uh who who replaces artwork if it's hit by a truck and totaled or something along that line uh, those are questions that could be worked out in the future but as far as an ordinance goes and, and the condition that this is coming into us i've read it every word of it 
Um, I think it's a good ordinance, and, and thank you, Ms. Vincent. I know your office is the one who actually. Uh, yeah, I had very little to do with this, actually, but Ms. McNeese. And, well, uh, take the Paul credit and, anyway. Yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. Not here, so you take the credit. <laughs> Let's have roll call, please. Commissioner Cuyas? Yes. Commissioner Eisner? Yes. Commissioner Carr? Yes. Vice Mayor Lunt? Yes. Mayor Lahousis? Yes. Nope. Okay, thank you. Uh, Oh, said I'm, sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> it was just. I didn't say yes. <laughs> yeah, you, did. Yes. No, you said yes. <laughs> He's been around a little bit since Epiphany. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Yes, thank you all very much. Thank you. I didn't even realize what I did. <laughs> too much joy. Too much joy. So, all right. Item uh, 14 is quasi judicial. Right. Um, this is a an application for the uh, Sponge City Brewing Site Plan. Um, Mr. Salzman, if you could read the title, I'm sorry, the ordinance, resolution, excuse me, by title, please. Resolution 2023-05, a resolution of the Board of Commissioners of the City of Tarpon Springs, Florida, approving application number 22-128, requesting site plan approval to construct a 620.75 square foot covered patio on 0 0.36 acres, more or less, located at 501 South Pinellas Avenue in the T5A South Pinellas Avenue transit zone of the sponge docks and community redevelopment area, special area plan, providing for findings, providing for conditions, and providing for an effective date. Okay, thank you. Uh, if we can give the instructions for quasi-judicial and then swear anybody here that is uh, for this particular project. This is a quasi-judicial proceeding where the Board of Commissioners acts in a quasi-judicial rather than a legislative capacity. At a quasi-judicial hearing, it is not the Board's function to make law, but rather to apply <coughs> law that has already been established. In a quasi-judicial hearing, the Board is required by law to make findings of fact based upon the evidence presented at the hearing and apply those findings of fact to previously established criteria contained in the Code of Ordinances in order to make a legal decision regarding the application before it. The Board may only consider evidence at this hearing that the law considers competent, substantial, and relevant to the issues. If the competent, substantial, and relevant evidence at the hearing demonstrates that the applicant has met the criteria established by the Code of Ordinances, then the Board is required by law to find in favor of the applicant. By the same token, if the competent, substantial, and relevant evidence at the hearing demonstrates that the applicant, applicant has failed to meet the criteria established in the Code of Ordinance, then the Board is required by law to find against the applicant. Would you like to swear anybody in that's here? Anyone who's going to speak, please raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony that you're about to give in this proceeding is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Ms. Vincent, the applicants are here. I see them. Okay. Um, is there anybody here, in addition to the applicant in the city, of course, that believes they're an affected party that are against this project? I have to ask that. Okay, I see none. Has any commission had any uh, commissioner had any ex parte communications that they'd like to report? Okay. All right, let's go ahead and open the uh, public hearing. Um, City Manager, of course, I'm going to. Yes, Renee. Ms. Please. Vincent, proceed, please. Thank you. This is application 22-128. Uh, this is a site plan approval for a project known as Sponge City Brewing. The project is located at 501 South Pinellas Avenue. It is in the Smart Code area in the T5A South Pinellas Avenue transect zone. So the existing building um, has been there since, I believe, 1956. It was originally a, uh, a gas station or, or auto repair uh, building. I think through time it's been used for various other things since then, um, a vegetable stand and it's been vacant for quite some time. So the applicant has been in process of renovating and you know, basically doing an adaptive reuse of the structure uh, to, uh, to put in a, a, a brewing facility. Um, so the, the, what's, you, what's before you this evening is actually for, it's really a minor expansion um, for outdoor seating in the back. It's a covered patio area, but um, 
and it just barely tipped the threshold to be in front of you as an actual site plan versus an administrative review by the technical review committee. Um, so it is an expansion for 620 square feet um, of a covered patio um, in the back of the property. Um, again, this is the location, uh, South Pinellas Avenue, the North uh, Street is East Oakwood. Uh, this is uh, Santos Isles, um, so this the site here. So the existing building, again, is just this little, you know, I think it's uh, like 1,300 square feet, and then they have the, you know, the existing canopy um, over the, uh, the structure on the front. It's pretty much all the paving um, is, is in place. It's been there for many, many years. This is the area where they want to add um, a covered patio area. Um, this is all natural back here. There's, a, there's nice mature oaks. This is being left alone. Um, so uh, just kind of a view um, from the back of just, you know, basically a patio structure, um, kind of like a lean-to type of structure on the back for an outdoor seating area. Um, as I said, this is an ad adaptive reuse. As such, it doesn't trip any real thresholds for, you know, major improvements um, to bring it up to a full code with the smart code. So um, the existing parking and everything really functions as is. Uh, so staff does recommend approval of the site plan uh, with the following conditions. Uh, these are our standard conditions. Site construction plans have to be consistent with the approved site plan. Uh, details for um, any new site lighting you know, would have to comport with the land development code requirements in section 127. Um, and the site plan would expire within one year for building permits not um, applied for. Uh, the Planning and Zoning Board did review this and recommended approval by a vote of 7-0 um, at their last meeting, and there was one member of the public who did speak in favor of the, of the project. <coughs> so with that, I will stop and answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Vincent. Are there any questions from the commissioners? Uh, Vice Mayor. Uh, I have no questions. One comment. It's an excellent addition to that. Thank you very much. I'd much appreciate sitting out the back than sitting next to Alter at 19. <laughs> okay. Commissioner Carr, any questions? Yeah, Renee, so this is just a covered patio we're approving, right? Yeah. Okay. Yes. All right. It just, it's a, it tipped a threshold of increasing in the, the footprint of the, you know, of so the kind of an abundance what? of caution and, a, you know, by me, but I'm like, let's go through the full process. Okay. I've got some comments I'd like to make, but uh, comments. that's my okay. only question I have right now. Questions? Commissioner Eisner. Thank you, Mayor. I have a question. Um, I didn't see any criteria. Is that a missing? Um, so, because of the the, it's not ex, it's not ex hitting a threshold uh, you know, greater than fifty percent of the existing structure. Mm -hmm. The site plan review criteria, the smart code criteria, really don't come into play. So, it's an adaptive reuse of the existing structure. Um, so, it can be, it can be, remain you know non-conforming for parking landscaping everything so it, it it hits a threat it doesn't hit that threshold so those criteria right. are not included so but in the uh, attorney's speech it speaks of um, you know that we do have this quasi judicial hearing and it has to follow criteria I was just a little lost because I keep looking around and I'm not finding a criteria that justifies to it so okay. I would, yeah. point taken Okay. Um, I'm, I'm going to have to ask you that, 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 you know, to follow me that it did not trip a threshold. It's in the staff reporting that it does not, does not meet the threshold of an expansion um, of that structure where those criteria would kick into play. So, Well, that's usually how I yeah, understand. make my decisions. Sure. And if I don't see it, understand. I don't know what I'm going up. Not that I'm against this at all. It's, it's a gimme. It's... You know, for me, but uh, that's actually useful information for me because you know, as we try to, you know, from the planning side, as we try to respond to what it is that you want in staff reports and what you need to make decisions, um, thank you for that feedback. We'll we'll do better. <laughs> no worries. Still love you. <laughs> thank you, so, uh, Commissioner Kriash. Uh, I have no questions for staff. Okay. Uh, to the applicants, if you could state your name and address, please. Bill Henson, 112 Carlisle Circle, Palm Harbor, Florida, 34683. Okay. And Aaron Henson. Uh, do you have any questions for Mrs. Vincent concerning what she presented? I do not. We okay. appreciate everything that you've 
Done that um, Ms. Vincent, uh, would you like your presentation entered into evidence? Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, if the applicants would like to make your presentation, if you have anything you'd like to offer in terms of your project? We, uh, other than this, I mean, we're just excited to be a part of the community and, and we'd really like to get this going and uh, I think it's gonna be great and uh, a good addition to Tarbon Springs. Okay, thank you. Let's go to qu commission comments. Uh, I'm sorry, questions, Vice Mayor Lunny, questions? None. Commissioner Carr. I just wanna welcome you. Thank you for um, joining us. I love the town. I hope you do as well and hope you prosper. Thank you thank so much. You. Uh, Commissioner Cuyas. <clears throat> will you be brewing IPAs? We will. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, just thank you for uh, what you've done and uh, your just investments to the community. You've renovated that building from what I remember it being a, a produce stand growing up and uh, hopefully it's a, another step towards uh, building up the entertainment in that area, which seems to, we've heard some rumors, rumors of uh, some future applications in the future. And uh, just thank you all. Thank you both. Thank you. Um, I like the name. <laughs> I was going to ask you, where did you come up with that? Uh, we actually, we, you know, going through this process, we were trying to find the, the right name. Um, we, we wanted to pay tribute to Tarpon Springs somehow, and we actually saw it in newspaper article, I think, uh, around the Honey Deer Storm when they did the news story. Um, somewhere in, in one of those articles, there was Spun City, and it kind of just clicked, and I was like, that's it. it. It has to be Spun City. Sponge Capital of the World, Spun City Brewing, it kind of I, I think uh, many of us are looking forward to looking, uh, seeing your label when it comes out. I'm sure it's going to be very uh, characteristic, of, um, <laughs> hopefully, of the town as well. So. Um, I don't have any further questions. Um, let's go to public comments. Are there any public comments here? Anybody here that would like to make a public comment? Mr. Delacus. I do swear and affirm that I will speak the truth, nothing but the truth, because I didn't swear in before. So if that's sufficient. Is that sufficient, Mr. Salzman? Beer Delacus, 514 Ashland Avenue. Um, I want to thank you. Uh, for your efforts because <laughs> ironically for months uh, we were across the street uh, with our yard sales and uh, we've watched the realtors come and go and then all of a sudden we saw painting and cleaning out and we were wondering what's what's going to go in there and finally I know so I think it's a good endeavor, but I want you to also look at what's happening in this area. We are starting to revitalize this southern corridor. So small businesses like this can be small anchors for some of the other potential vacant properties right across the street, that building, I'm not, well, I think I know who owns it, but it's been vacant for years. And then the place that was the car place turned over. So it's good that we're having some renovation in there. So I appreciate the fact that these people are willing to take their time, uh, their money, their efforts, their blood, sweat, and tears to invest in our city. But I also want you all to look at the overall picture. As Renee has said, this special area plan allows for to bring in more things that create vibrancy, self-sufficiency, and uh, I think this will be a good start, uh, but we also need to maybe look at other incentives possibly to bringing in some other factions. Now, I know they're renovating the Manatee Village, uh, and, and then that'll be a big boost. Hopefully, they bring in some good tenants that generate more information, you know, more excitement into that area. But, uh, but as far as this project, uh, I appreciate, I'm sure they do also the fact that uh, they will get the green light to move ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Delacus. Are there any other public comments? Uh, Mr. Jump, are there any remote access public comments? If anyone online would like to speak on this item, please raise your hand and you'll be allowed in to talk. And we do have a raised hand, so I'll allow the first person in. Okay.
Sharon Landrum, 45 West MLK Junior Drive, Tarpon Springs. Thank you, Mayor and Board of Commissioners for allowing me to speak. And I'd like to welcome this new business. I live in the area. I've watched the produce stand uh, deteriorate over the last few years and I'm very excited and we welcome you and we look forward to doing business with you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Landrum. Mr. Jump, is there anyone else? And we do not have any other raised hands at this time. Okay. Um, I, I need to ask whether you have any um, offer. Everything was positive, which is good. <laughs> and usually, if there was somebody that had any an issue, you would you would offer an, a reason as to or some additional information. So I'm asking whether you have any additional information you would like to offer uh, in response to what any anybody has said. So. You don't have to say anything. It, okay. That's okay too. So, okay. Um, closing summation, Ms. Vincent. I have nothing to add uh, other than I'll en enter my staff report and presentation into the record. Okay. Okay, I'm going to close the public hearing. You can sit down now. And um, I'm going to go to comments now. Uh, Vice Mayor Lunt, do you have any comments? Other no comments that haven't okay. made already. Commissioner Carr. Yeah, a couple comments on this. Uh, this is a great asset to our community, so thank you so much for your investment. Obviously, this has been a blighted piece of property for many, many years. Um, you've retrofitted basically this piece of property to make it a very unique building uh, with a very cool name and a cool concept as well, too. So i um, happy to support um, this extension of the patio, which we're approving tonight, um, but looking forward to you all opening and uh, being very successful in many, many years. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Ashton. I've said my piece. Thank you. Commissioner Kurias. Thank you both for the application. Um, I wish to welcome you to Tarpon Springs. I think it's going to be, I always love when we brand something with Tarpon Springs. It's got to do with the heritage or the history of Tarpon Springs that it helps um, continue keeping Tarpon Springs on the map and, and defining who we are. So I, I very much appreciate your investment uh, in that regard. If I can have a motion and a second, please. Motion to approve Sponge City Brewing number 22-128. Second. Okay. Any last comments? Did Roll call, Mayor. please. Mayor. Yes. Uh, is that with the conditions as recommended by staff? Yes. On the motion? Uh, yes. I, that would be the case. Ms. Vincent? Yes. Okay. Yes. Just want to make sure. Thank you. Thanks for pointing that out. No I'm sorry, um, let's, one person at a time. Ms. Vincent, that includes the conditions that you had put in there. There were no additional conditions added by the planning. Uh, that's zoning. what I, yes. okay. Um, so we have a motion and a second. Is that correct, Ms. Jacobs? That's correct. All right, we'll have roll call, please. Commissioner Kulias? Yes. Commissioner Eisner? Yes. Commissioner Carr? Yes. Vice Mayor Lunt? Yes. Mayor Vatikiotis? Yes. <coughs> okay. We're going to go to item 15, which is um, resolution 2023-4, and this is the Susanna 2 site plan. It's quasi-judicial. Uh, Mr. Salzman, if we could read the resolution by title and then go to the instructions for the quasi-judicial and swear anybody in that's here for that item. Resolution 2023-04, resolution of the Board of Commissioners of the City of Tarpon Springs, Florida, approving application number 22-91, requesting site plan approval to construct a seven unit multifamily development on 0 0.46 acres, more or less, located at the northwest corner of East Lime Street and South Gross Avenue in the RM Residential Multifamily Zoning District, providing for findings, providing for conditions, and providing for an effective date. Thank you. If we can have the um, instructions for the quasi-judicial and the swearing in. This is a quasi-judicial proceeding where the Board of Commissioners act in a quasi-judicial rather than a legislative capacity. At a quasi-judicial hearing, it is not the Board's function to make law but rather to apply law that has already been established. In a quasi-judicial hearing, 
The Board is required by law to make findings of fact based upon the evidence presented at the hearing and apply those findings of fact to previously established criteria contained in the Code of Ordinances in order to make a legal decision regarding the application before it. The Board may only consider evidence at this hearing that the law considers competent, substantial, and relevant to the issues. If the competent, substantial, and relevant evidence at the hearing demonstrates that the applicant has met the criteria established in the Code of Ordinance, then the Board is required by law to find in favor of the applicant. By the same token, if the competent, substantial, and relevant evidence at the hearing demonstrates that the applicant has failed to meet the criteria established in the Code of Ordinance, then the Board is required by law to find against the applicant. If anyone is going to speak, please come forward, raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony that you're about to give in this proceeding is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Um, I see that the applicant is here. Is there anyone here that uh, believes they're an affected party that would oppose the project as an example? Okay. I see none. Uh, has any commissioner had any ex parte communications none. with the applicant? Okay. All right. Same manager, of course. We're going to go to Ms. Yeah. Vincent. Yes, Ms. Vincent. Thank you. This is uh, application 22-91. This is site plan approval for the Susanna 2 project. Um, hopefully this looks familiar to you. Um, this, the board previously reviewed this as a conditional use uh, specific to an alternative dimensional plan um, several months ago. So now the, the project is back before you for the site plan approval portion. Um, this is a seven unit multifamily development. Um, the, the, inclusive of the conditions of approval that were required by the board for the conditional use and the land development code. Um, it does meet all the requirements of the land development code. This is located at the northwest corner of East Lime and South Gross Street. And you can see the project area here. And so this, the, this is the layout. Um, this is a seven unit, one story apartment building, <coughs> parking to the rear, accessed off of the 10 foot alley. Uh, the resolution of uh, the 22-09 uh, approved the conditional use with the alternative dimensional plan uh, with reduced front yard, front side, and rear yard requirements. Um, the actual site plan came back um, doing a little better than that, so they were to meet uh, the push the buildings you know a little farther away from the street. I know that was a discussion point. Um, the building elevations, these have changed. Uh, the roof line uh, previously was a pitch roof. Uh, they are opting to do just um, a flat roof uh, type of structure, but there is building undulation so that it's not you know, a monolithic type of, of, of appearance. Um, you do have porches fronting on to the, uh, the road frontages on all sides, so they're, you know, they're inter primary entrances off of the street. Um, the resolutions of uh, the conditions of approval on the resolution discussed um, requirement for buffering of the parking lot. There's a, this is a cottage court development uh, to the east, and so there are three units here that kind of back up to this property. Then um, they have uh, like these wooden rear decks on them. They're actually not conforming as to the way that they're located on the property. But uh, the applicant has proposed um, to put in. Um, a you know, screening hedge um, on the back side of the pond to provide some additional buffering along with uh, the, the tree plantings. Um, this would meet our required buffering requirement um, uh, uh, for parking lot screening in the land development code. Um, there also uh, was a condition of approval regarding working with waste management for um, a workable solution for the collection of solid waste, very similar to the project that you also reviewed recently by the same developer. Uh, the proposal is to have uh, toters stored along uh, the alley, and each unit will be responsible for bringing them out to the street on uh, the trash pickup day. Um, and then the 10-foot alley must be uh, maintained clear, so that is what has been achieved uh, through the site plan as well. Staff recommendation is to approve the site plan with uh, our four standard conditions, um, consistent with the uh, site construction plans, consistent with the site plan, details for site lighting uh, have to be uh, compliant with section 127, 
uh, requirements for the public art program if the aggregate job value exceeds one million and the site plan uh, would expire within one year unless we have an application for a building permit. Planning and Zoning Board did review this on uh, at their last meeting and recommended 7-0 uh, to approve and there were no members of the public that spoke on the item. With that, I'll stop and answer any questions that you might have and I would enter my staff report and presentation into the public record. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Vincent. Uh, any questions from the commission, uh, Vice Mayor Lund? Not at this time. Okay, Commissioner Carr. Renee, I know we had some discussions uh, with the last application when they came up before us like a month ago about the toters. Um, is there any requirement for um, any shielding required for the, where they're located since they're like right along the alleyway uh, in the code? Um, I would say specifically no. Um, I mean, they're going to have a, like a corral type of area. I'll let the applicant speak a little more to the details of what that is. Um, they won't just be like floating around. They'll have to be contained. But there's no there's no screening requirement for them like there would be for a dumpster. Okay. Yeah, I just see that there's a concrete pad there. Um, that, I mean, that would be a somewhat of a concern. Okay. It's, a, it's a narrow alley already uh, to pull in and out. But I would just hope that the the applicant would want to look at having some type of screen there to protect it from going on the alleyway. So, so thank did. you. Okay. Um, Commissioner Eisner. <coughs> thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Mayor. Would I be correct in saying there's no criteria on this one as well? <laughs> this one, you know, it, this, the, the conditional use was your, the, the, the more specific criteria. Um, again, we're trying to not present you with volumes of information, but this is with land development code criteria. Okay, just so you know, though, in the future, I would like to have that, whether there's five criteria, seven criteria, just so that I know what I'm going against. We'll talk. Okay. Uh, uh, yes, because I, I, I do want to give you what, what you're asking for. Um, the, the site plan criteria is it's parking, it's landscaping, it's, you know, stormwater. So, But just as I said before, the sure. in order for a um, ordinance or resolution to be passed and it's quasi-judicial, it has to balance um, against the criteria of whatever that is. So, um, I mean, I, I, like I said, this is not brain surgery for me. I can see what it is. I'm not in uh, dispute of it, but I would like to have that Understood. in the future. Yes, sir. That's all. Thank you. Okay. Um, Commissioner Kulias. I have no questions for staff at this time. Okay, I, I don't have any questions. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, Recording in progress. Okay, that's good. It certainly is. Good to start. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay. The applicant is here. If you can get up and uh, give us your name and address, please. <laughs> Samer Al Ghafari, 2166 West. Bush Boulevard, Tampa, Florida, 33612. Um, do, do you have any questions for Ms. Vincent in what her presentation was? Uh, absolutely not. We are in content with uh, her presentation, the content of the staff report, and, uh, and the conditions okay. that are listed in there. That, that's okay. Let's, um, um, you don't have anything. So, um, I have to follow a particular process here to make sure we've got it all. Um, Ms. Vincent, you want us to accept your presentation and evidence? Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay. Sir, you can, if you've got anything that you would like to offer uh, now as part of your presentation. Uh, I will address uh, that those totals will be placed on a concrete pad. They're not just uh, uh, anywhere. There's defined area. There will be, uh, uh, it's defined by the building uh, uh, wall on, on one side and uh, a uh, fence on the east and the west, but they will have the easy access to be pulled out from that location into the alley. And that's what we've discussed with the waste uh, management uh, staff at the city and uh, to be okay. in um, the code and, and right. requirement. Let me go to the rest of the commission as well. Are you, are you done? I'm okay. Done. Um, Vice Mayor Lund, do you have any questions? Um, I don't think so. I've seen this before, but could you confirm to me that there's, <clears throat> excuse me, actually a fence on the west side, on the opposite side of the pond? I know there's, 
I know this you've one, made allowances for screens, but there is no fence on this side because the code doesn't require a fence, and we have it's a compatible use for both ends, for both properties, multifamily uh, for our project, multifamily on the property on the west. But we are having hedge and screen from landscaping. Uh, uh -huh. On the other project, we had a perimeter around the pond that required a fence anyway, so we. And we didn't have a compatible use, so we built the screen. Oh, okay. Into yeah. The, my whole concern here it comes from there's houses next door. Houses mean there's children sometimes. Children get into ponds. I'm always nervous about that in Florida, but that's okay. If it, yeah, the, the code doesn't is, allow is only, it, it's another discussion. Yeah, the pond is only two feet deep and it's a four to one slope. Uh, it, it meets all standard. Uh, uh, safety side slope for ponds uh, through the water management district, county, cities, including here, uh, the, the city code. Okay, thank you. Uh, Commissioner, do you have anything else? Okay. Commissioner Carr, do you have any follow up? No, thank you. Commissioner Ashley. Commissioner <coughs> Kulias. No, I'll have comments for later. Okay, I have nothing. Um, Ms. Vincent. <clears throat> Anything? No, sir. Okay. All right. Um, let's go to public comments. Are there any public comments concerning this item? Public comments. Mr. Jump, are there any remote access comments? If anyone online would like to speak on this item, please raise your hand and you'll be allowed in to talk. And we do not have any raised hands at this time. Okay. Um, I, I'm going to ask the applicant if you don't, if you have any rebuttal. There's nothing that was said, so obviously there's nothing to rebut. Um, but we need to kind of close the loop on that. Um, Ms. Vincent, do you have a closing or summation that you would like to make? No, sir. Okay. We're going to close the public hearing now, and I'm going to go to um, um, comments from the commission. Vice Mayor Lunt, do you have any comments? Um, no. Um, as always, it's a, it's a welcome design, and we need this kind of housing in Tarpon, so thank you very much. Um, personally, I'd like to see a fence around the pond, but at least on the west side, but that's just me. But anyway, thank you. Okay. Um, Commissioner Eisner. <clears throat> thank you, Mayor. Um, I would also ask you if you could consider a fence. Um, I'm not fond of the uh, having even a one foot pond exposed to having youngsters. Um, if any of those plants have spaces between them, kids find it. So, um, but otherwise I welcome you. I, 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 this is exactly what our, um, all the residents wanted to have more buildings and more housing in and around this kind, not tall five, six story buildings. So I thank you for bringing it to Tarpon Springs and I, and uh, like I said, and I, do you, I had one one question, but I, I, you know, I can't ask the question now. But um, I just—it'll be a statement. I, I just hope that there will be somebody coordinating these totes uh, going back and forth, so that they're not just left around. And I—I I can't ask you that question. I just hope it's included, because that's always an issue. People leave it and uh, on their streets, so. This is a small 10-foot area, and I just hope it's taken care of. So that's all I want to say. Thank, thank you. you. Commissioner, um, Commissioner Kuyas. I just want to th uh, thank the applicant for uh, having a, a larger increase setback with the proposed. Uh, I appreciate that. Uh, the, the, you know, I'm very, uh, for other future projects, I, I'm, especially that area, I'm not too crazy about those setbacks, but I understand what you're trying to do, and I appreciate it. And Thank you for being receptive to considering uh, subsidized housing in the area, as I stated before. So, thank you. Okay, um, I'm gonna ask for a motion and a second, and then we're gonna wait for Commissioner Carr to return. Is there a motion and a second? Motion to approve Susanna 2, number 22-91. Is there a second? With staff condition. With staff conditions, always, yes. Second. Yeah, just for clarification, Mr. Mr. Salzman, that ought to be like an automatic. It should be, but on the quasi-judicial, 
that we should automatically put that in the motion. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, we have a motion and a second. Um, any last comments? Roll call, please. Commissioner Kuyas? Yes. Commissioner Eisner? Yes. Commissioner Carr? Yes. Vice Mayor Lunt? Yes. Mayor Vatikiotis? Yes. Okay, now we're gonna go to item 16. This is uh, quasi-judicial as well. It is the uh, North Lake Trail Platte approval. Mr. Salzman, if you could read the resolution by title, please. Resolution 2020-2023-06, a resolution of the Board of Commissioners of the City of Tarpon Springs, Florida, approving the final subdivision plat application number 22-97, North Lake Trail, accepting all offers of dedication as described in said plat, approving the appropriate city officials to certify approval thereon and providing for an effective date. Thank you. Uh, could you read the procedures for quasi-judicial and swear anybody in that's here for this project? Yes, ma'am. This is a quasi-judicial proceeding where the Board of Commissioners acts in a quasi-judicial rather than a legislative capacity. At a quasi-judicial hearing, it is not the board's function to make law, but rather to apply law that has already been established. In a quasi-judicial hearing, the board is required by law to make findings of fact based upon the evidence presented at the hearing and apply those findings of fact to previously established criteria contained in the code of ordinances in, the, in order to make a legal decision regarding the application before it. The board may only consider evidence at this hearing that the law considers competent, substantial, and relevant to the issues. If the competent, substantial, and relevant evidence at the hearing demonstrates that the applicant has met the criteria established in the code of ordinance, then the board is required by law to find in favor of the applicant. By the same token, if the competent, substantial, and relevant evidence at the hearing demonstrates that the applicant has failed to meet the criteria established in the code of ordinance, then the board is required by law to find against the applicant. Anyone that's going to testify, please raise your right hand. Okay. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony that you're about to give in this proceeding is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Okay. Is there anyone here that uh, claims to be an affected party on this item? Have there been any ex parte communications uh, with the applicant by any of the commissioners? Okay, I'm going to go ahead and open the uh, hearing. And um, city manager, of course, I'm going to go to Ms. Vincent. Yes. Okay. Thank you. This is application 22-97. This is the final plat for the North Lake Trails subdivision. Um, this is an 18 lot single family subdivision on, uh, at, located on Jasmine, at the intersection of Jasmine and Mellon Street. Um, a little, little bit of background on this. This was originally approved as a, a pre preliminary and final plan development um, in 2022, um, prior to several of the board members sitting here, so you may not be as familiar with this one. Um, so the, um, it, it's, a, it's a small lot, single family subdivision um, of 18 lots. Um, it, uh, as I said, it went through the plan development process. It has its own specific um, setbacks that are recognized um, as part of the plan development. Um, so when we review this, um, we're, again, we're looking at the, the site plan, the final plan development was the site plan. The site construction plans had to conform with that. The property has been under construction and is largely complete. Uh, the roads are in, most of the infrastructure is in. Um, at this point, the applicant does wants to go ahead and go forward with platting. Uh, we have an engineer's estimate of the outstanding improvements uh, that have been verified by our engineer of record, um, and we do have um, a standby irrevocable letter of credit in the amount to cover those improvements. You know, that's just an abundance of caution. If the developer would walk away from the project, the city could uh, call the letter of credit to finish those um, those remaining improvements that haven't been done, but this does allows the applicant to go ahead and plat and he can begin selling lots. And so until the app, until it's actually planted, he cannot do that. So um, the plat itself has been reviewed by our surveyor of record for compliance with uh, state statute. 
So we're at the point of where we are ready to approve resolution 23-06, which is the final plat for the project. Um, the conditions of approval on the final plan development, just to note those, um, they have met conditions one, three, and four. Um, number two will take place as each individual home comes through permitting. We will verify that uh, the setbacks that are in resolution 2021-26, which was the plan development, um, are adhered to as each one comes through. So all the stormwater issues were resolved prior to site construction permitting. We have the municipal easements uh, that were required prior to construction permitting. Um, if you, There was also a, um, just for a little background information, there was a, um, uh, there was a remaining 35 foot right of way here that was um, vacated. This was Cypress Street that was vacated prior as part of this project development. Um, so that and we had to re retain easements for city utilities in there. So that that's all been accomplished. So everything is um, is ready to go for platting with the excuse me with the um, few remaining improvements that have been secured by the letter of credit. So with that, I'll stop and answer any questions that you might have. Um, Vice Mayor Lunt, do you have any I questions? I have no questions. Commissioner Carr? No. Commissioner Eisner? Commissioner Cuyas? No questions. Okay. Mr. Stamus, you're going to be giving the presentation <coughs> this evening? <laughs> All right. Um, would you just step up and state your name and address for the record, please? And congratulations on your grandson, George, retrieving the cross on January 6th. Thank you. Real honor. Um, George Stamis, 46 West Lemon Street, Tarpon Springs, Florida, representing Pioneer Developers. Renee did a fine job explaining where we're at, and uh, this is just the final step of uh, completion for us to be able to start marketing and selling lots out there and we're, we're ready to go. Okay, hang on. Ms. Vincent, should we enter your presentation into evidence? <laughs> yes, thank you. Okay, and that was your presentation, Mr. Stamos? That, that's it. Okay, Ms. Vincent, do you have any questions for Mr. Stamos? I do not. Okay, let's go to public comments. Are there any public comments concerning this item? Mr. Jump, are there any remote access comments concerning this item? If anyone would like to speak on this item, please raise your hand and you'll be allowed in to talk. And we do not have any raised hands at this time. Okay, there is no rebuttal to anything. Um, Ms. Vincent, do you have a closing or a summation on this item? No, sir. Okay, we're gonna close the public hearing and um, I'm going to ask the um, commission, do you have any questions? Oh, I'm sorry, comments, comments, no comments? Okay. We have a motion and a second, please. Uh, include, motion approve. And include conditions. With conditions. Thank you. Second. second. Roll call, please. Commissioner Cuyas? Yes. Commissioner Eisner? Yes. Commissioner Carr? Yes. Vice Mayor Lunt? Yes. Mayor Vatikiotis? Yes. Thank you. Okay, before we get to this next one, I'm going to ask, does the commission wish to take a break? I know uh, one commissioner stepped out and there may be others. Would you like a break? Okay. No so breaks let, needed. Let, let's adjourn um, and reconvene at 8.45. No breaks in the day.
everybody. We reconvene at 847. Um, the next item is 17, uh, which is the um, conditional use for Oakwood Street. Uh, Mr. Salzman, if you could read the resolution by title. Resolution 202301, a resolution of the Board of Commissioners of the City of Tarpon Springs, Florida, approving application number 22-105, requesting conditional use approval to allow for a dog training and boarding facility at 136 East Oakwood Street, located at T4B Residential plus Industrial slash Office Transit of the Special Area Plan providing for findings, providing for conditions, and providing for an effective date. Thank you. Um, if we can have the uh, quasi-judicial process uh, reviewed. This is a quasi-judicial proceeding where the Board of Commissioners acts in a quasi-judicial rather than a legislative capacity. At a quasi-judicial hearing, it is not the Board's function to make law but rather to apply law that has already been established. In a quasi-judicial hearing, the board is required by law to make findings of fact based upon the evidence presented at the hearing and apply those findings of fact <coughs> to previously established criteria contained in the code of ordinances in order to make a legal decision regarding the application before it. The board may only consider evidence at this hearing that the law considers competent, substantial, and relevant to the issues. If the competent, substantial, and relevant evidence at the hearing demonstrates that the applicant has met the criteria established in the Code of Ordinances, then the Board is required by law to find in favor of the applicant. By the same token, if the competent, substantial, and relevant evidence at the hearing demonstrates that the applicant has failed to meet the criteria established in the Code of Ordinances, then the Board is required by law to find against the applicant. If anyone's going to testify, please stand and raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony that you're about to give in this proceeding is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, are there any affected parties here this evening on this item? Okay. Um, has any commissioner had any ex parte communications with the applicant? City Manager, of course. Ms. Vincent, you proceed. Thank you. This is application 22 105. Uh, this is a conditional use uh, application. I do want to state that um, and for this particular application, um, the, the planning department's not specifically making a recommendation. Um, so I'll explain a little bit of that as we go forward. Um, the, uh, the application, the location is for 136 East Oakwood Street. Um, this is an existing, um, originally was a single family house. Um, it has been used for, I believe, 14 plus years as actually a, um, a dog grooming establishment. The request that is before you this evening is um, being brought forward as a conditional use uh, for the purpose of a dog training facility with overnight boarding um, and the overnight boarding and sort of the applicant will do a much better job of explaining this than I will is part of the training process so it's not you can't call this person up and say I want to board my dog it has to be part of it as part of a training program so it's a little bit of a nuanced um, type of use um, this is located in the T4B residential um, and industrial uh, transect um, and just so in this district dog training with boarding is not is not listed as a permitted or a conditional use. What is listed is veteran op veterinary office with a kennel. So the the use of dog training itself, um, we would consider um, a personal service use, just like the dog grooming. Um, it's not listed really, any, it falls under the retail category of the district. The boarding is where we um, were struggling with, frankly, um, as to how to treat this. And so since <coughs> we, there is a use in the district of veterinary office with a kennel, um, which clearly indicates overnight boarding, we, um, we took the approach that it's a somewhat similar type of use. And so we elected to allow it to move forward as a conditional use and bring it to the board. Um, 
So I just kind of wanted to explain how we got here. We've done this in the past where something isn't cleanly laid out as permitted or conditional, but it has similar characteristics with another use, we would consider it under a similar path. So that's, that's how we've gotten to where we are at this point. So as I said, this is in the special area plan. Um, just a little location and context. This is Pinellas Avenue, MLK, the trail, uh, Santos Isles, and then the rest of this is commercial and industrial around the property. So a little closer look at the site. So this is the house here. Actually, as I said, it's been a dog grooming facility um, you know, without incident for about 14 years. Um, this is the Santos Isles apartment complex. And again, you have a mixed storage and industrial here and then you know commercial out on alternate 19. So the conditional use criteria, we have to review for conformance with the land development code. Um, this project is an adaptive reuse of an existing building uh, it, and it can meet the requirements of the building code. Um, the requirements of the land development code really are the conditional nature of the, uh, part of the conditional nature of this. Um, but for parking and site characteristics and stuff, it is, it, um, it is compliant. Uh, the big uh, question on this is the compatibility. Um, we, as I said, dog training we view as a personal service use that uh, would generally be compatible with the area. The boarding component may present impacts uh, to surrounding properties, especially in terms of noise, outdoor activity, or hours of operation. Um, uh, the subject, uh, the property, the use would be subject to compatibility requirements of the special area plan. Again, that, that compatibility aspect is really going to, you know, again, be uh, you know, issues of noise, uh, outdoor activity, and hours of operation. So that is a consideration for the board. Um, we don't think this will adversely affect in, in, or impact historical or environmental resources. Um, the dog, uh, the condition, the condition of, of you know effects on adjoining property values. Um, again, the dog training is, you know, is not substantially different than what was there before as the dog grooming facility. Uh, so we don't think that that's you know would be an adverse impact. It's again, it's, it's difficult to evaluate. Does the overnight boarding aspect of this come into play and affect adjoining property values? Um, we have new issues with the ability of the city to provide uh, services to the property, and this is an adaptive reuse and a mixed-use area, so um, it, it is a you know in a manner of you know, efficient orderly development. So we recommended the board consider this. Um, if you do recommend approval or want to, if you are, we do have some recommended conditions of approval. Um, overnight boarding of should be limited to a maximum of 10 dogs. Um, the boarding, overnight boarding must be supervised um, 24 hours a day by on-site personnel and a solid six foot fence shall be installed around the entire perimeter of the property um, behind the front yard setback. Um, it's mostly fenced at this point. Um, we've had no public uh, no public input on this at this point. Uh, we did do mailed notice um, to the surrounding property owners. I will note for the record that that mailed notice um, that we are required to do does go to the property owner, so that goes to the management company. Um, it's my understanding that the applicant has had discussions with the management uh, company itself. Um, we, uh, you know, Ms. McNeese also directly reached out to the, to the on-site manager for Santos Isles. Um, they, they're aware of the project. I'm not sure they were fully aware about the overnight boarding aspects. Um, initially, when, from the discussions between the applicant and the, and the owner, um, of, or the applicant and the manager of, the, of, the, of Santos Isles, um, and we are not, we have not been able to confirm that, that individual residents were notified by the management company. So I'll, I'll just, you know, I'll leave that at, as it is. I did want to get that into the record. At the planning and zoning board meeting, and I want to take a minute to, to talk about what happened there. There was, they had a full board. Ultimately it was recommended for approval um, and with, by a 4-3 vote. During the board discussions, um, our, our board attorney, Kardash, introduced a section of the land development code, section 72, overnight boarding of animals, um, as a 
applicable section of the code for review. And we initially did not, we did not include that in the review criteria because in the, land, in the SMART code, there is a specific list of the sections of the land development code that are applicable for review. And this, the overnight boarding of animals, section 72 was not included. Um, that was discussed um, with the, you know, at, at the meeting and the attorney um, still indicated that even though that that specific section was not in the list, that the preceding sentence in that section would allow for that consideration. So um, there wasn't a lot of discussion at the Planning and Zoning Board about that section 72. I have included the, it's an attachment to section um, for this board um, for reference and since then I have done some, some measuring and it's really distance separation requirements so I can answer questions about that if you want to introduce that and discuss that. So um, the Planning and Zoning Board did recommend, as I said, they recommended approval and with some additional conditions. Uh, the conditional use should be non-transferable. So it's for this particular operator only. It cannot transfer to another individual. Um, the applicant uh, completes an agreement with a veterinarian for 24 hour service and that the applicant is required to carry general liability insurance. So those were the additional conditions recommended by the board. I'm gonna stop there. Um, there's a lot of information in the backup um, and answer questions that you might have. And you know, I really think the applicant's gonna be the person that's really gonna have to explain the operations and how this is unique. So with that, I'll stop and uh, try to answer any questions you might have. Yeah, I'm gonna just jump ahead myself just for a second, just as a point of clarification. I, I don't know that you mentioned it. The training is by right and is considered a retail service. Is that right? Without we put the that boarding. under retail services so, just like we did the dog grooming facility, yes. Okay. All right. So let's go to questions. Um, Vice Mayor Lowe. Hi, Renee. <laughs> Hello. So I struggled looking at the backup material and, and looking at this whole situation with the fact that the transact code doesn't include this. Um, you know, it does do the veterinarian with overnight boarding. However, overnight boarding has a different connotation and a different uh, explanation as to what overnight boarding is that's pulled in from the land development code, which is section 72. Um, so because this is quasi-judicial and we have to follow the law, my sort of interpretation was that because the, la the transit code does not cover, the smart code does not cover this particular application, we should read and default to section 72. Um, the problem that I have with section 72 is that the application here doesn't meet a whole bunch of the regulations under what overnight boarding of animals is. Um, so you had mentioned that it kind of sort of met it, but I guess my big concern is when you talk about overnight boarding versus what is being offered here, we're talking about, you know, you said, I, I think we agreed on or somebody agreed on a minimum of, of 10 animals per night. A maximum. But, yeah, maximum. Yes. But, but these animals are going into crates. They're not going into kennels. That's a whole different environment. From the photos that I saw, I saw four crates and one had to be piled on another. I'm not quite sure if there's adequate space for 10, nor I'm not quite sure if I want to put animals in a space where, I mean, that's not my. So you're asking for clarification, yeah. is that correct? So, okay, so um, section 72 actually says it requires a minimum floor area per animal of 125 square feet. Would, would this meet that criteria? I had that specific calculation. I have not, have not, have not calculated. Um, what's the square? I, mean, I can I can run that particular one as we're sitting here. I can figure out the, the square um, the square footage. Renee, if you look at the building on the property appraiser, it's fourteen hundred ninety square feet. Got a calculator. <laughs> Ten times one hundred twenty-five is one thousand two hundred fifty square feet. So, it's meets the criteria. It meets the criteria. 
it, you can make that final judgment there. I think Ms. Vincent needs to make that finding as a it, it, as it doesn't part of say that it has to be dedicated for each individual dog so yes that math you know would, think, would be compliant right. um, I, and I do want I, and I get a lot of this is going to be on the applicant to really answer a lot of the questions about these operations this is not a boarding facility um, and that you know that's why we've gotten I did not feel like that that I had the ability to just tell this applicant I, you I can't understand. You know, exactly and it, I, you're right I it's disagree a, with you yes. as whether this qualifies as a boarding facility but I, I understand it's right on the edge and it all sounds good except that I'm looking at 10 dogs in a what looks to be a 16 by 20 room at max in, in crates and that looks to me to be more like a puppy mill type boarding facility. I, I will let the applicant speak to I'm that. I'm not happy with it, but anyway. So the other things, um, does it meet minimum setbacks? Um, so apparently- For section 72? For section 72, 100 feet. B yes, the, the building itself is not, uh, is greater than 100 feet from the, res from the residential building, like building to building, and the outdoor if you want to call that the exercise area is also compliant from of more than 100 feet from the the residential the buildings now if you're talking about rising to a property or, line it, of course it, not um this says property not buildings if you're measuring to a property line it would not be compliant okay so it's not compliant with that um it's not using outdoor runs as far as i know no um setback for any out there exercise area which is pretty much the rear of this property also is subject to 100 feet uh distancing um i'm not sure if the building you looked at the building specs does it have soundproofing that's done already? i believe the applicant actually did indicate they were installing app uh soundproofing um as part of their normal efforts i'll let the applicant speak to that uh-huh and do you know if the uh Air handling systems have been developed for proper overnight. It's, it's a standard air conditioning. It's a residential structure. And that's a no. Because there's air handling systems for kennels are entirely different than air handling systems for whatever. Okay, so, that's, and I will say, you know, the, the building, of, uh, excuse me, the fire marshal has to look at this from their, in, in, in his, looking <laughs> at the numbers that were being, he did not deem this a kennel. Uh, he um, he did not rec he didn't look at it from the building uh, from the fire code perspective because of the numbers, as even uh, you know, as a boarding facility. Well, I so from the fire marshal's consideration, may not have done that. But if I'm going to put ten dogs in crates that are stacked on top of people, it has to have proper ventilation, and proper ventilation is not standard AC. Um, anyway, sorry, that's can I can I push back one time on that? All right, never mind. Um, so it obviously doesn't have any outdoor runs, so it's, we're not really concerned about four foot berms. Um, I think that's all the questions I have of you. The rest are for the applicant. Thank you. It, it's, I, I'm struggling with this. Well, I want to say yes, but I'm seeing too many things that tell me that it doesn't follow the law. Thank you. Commissioner Clark. Thanks, Mayor. Um, Renee, one of the, the struggles I'm trying to understand is how do you define a training facility that offers overnight stays? Um, can you lump it into an overnight boarding animal facility? That's it, an element of the training, it sounds like. It's not open to the public. If I want my dog to go Correct. stay there and I'm, and I'm out of town and I want him to go stay there overnight, I just can't. My that's, understanding. That's how the applicant has described yeah. it, yes. Oh, that's my that's what my understanding yeah. is. Um, when I think of overnight boarding, and I don't have a great definition of what overnight boarding is and the code, but that's what my thought process is of overnight boarding. Um, the board has experienced similar, not this type of application, but like an overnight boarding application or a doggy daycare application on US 19 before in the past. I don't recall when this happened. Um, Section 72 was definitely in discussion about it, and it, it measured from the I believe the property line of the applicant to the building of um, the closest residential building. And that's, again, it seems like it's a, a kind of 
open for interpretation and the um, item 72B2. Uh, so that's, that's how it was utilized back then and when we looked at it. Um, the issue back then was that the residential building was within 100 feet and it was denied because of that very reason. Is, this, is there any residential buildings within 100 feet of this property that's being applied for here? So if you're going from the property line of the applicant, the... It is. So from the, from the property line, so the outdoor area where they may have dog training going on, so from that closest property line to the... Um, building. To the building to the residential portions of the building because that the closest point of the building is actually the clubhouse that wraps around the end of the building. So the close to the closest residential area is 160 feet to the closest point of the actual building itself would be, you know, probably about 125 okay. from the outdoor from the outdoor area, the edge of the outdoor area and the closest point. Okay. So from a setback standpoint in that area, I, I feel comfortable with that one. Um, the other elements, I think there's some more building elements that are in play there. That's not really for me to decide um, what's considered a adequate AC unit or filtration. Uh, the minimum floor area makes sense uh, with the requirement of 1,250 square feet if there's 10 dogs in there. Um, how dogs sleep or how dogs are, are kept or boarded, that's not, I've got no professional expertise on how that should be done. Um, crating versus kenneling. I, I don't know what that looks like from a training standpoint, so I would defer to the, the professionals in that one. Uh, I think the biggest, the biggest question that I had was the B, sorry, 72B2, and I think I felt comfortable with what, Renee, you're, you're explaining to me, am I understanding that correctly, that it's not within 100 feet of property building. It says the minimum setback from any residentially zoned or utilized property for buildings shall be 100 feet. Okay. Um, you know, so I, I think you have to look at these in the context. You know, I think you need to look at building to, to, to building. I mean, if you're looking, if you're measuring to edge, edge of property to edge of property, obviously, each other. yeah, you're, you're not compliant. Okay. Um, but if you're looking at the out, you know, if you're looking at the outdoor area, which is the property line in the rear yard, at its closest point. At one other. hundred feet. Okay. Just uh, one other additional clarifying question. The vice mayor brought up and was it pertaining to the 125 square feet per dog that just talks about or per animal that just that doesn't say that that's a required dedicated space for the animal it just talks about the building itself it says minimum floor area per animal shall be 125 square feet i, I that's okay <laughs> thanks mayor i've got no further questions okay commissioner <coughs> commissioner eisner thank you mayor um, Renee, I want to ask you a question. Why is it that when we have um, BOA meetings or planning and zoning, there are signs placed out, and on this particular property, there were no signs placed out to inform the residents of Santos Islands, Isles why this was here? When the mayor asked if there were any parties, if affected parties, how would they know if they don't get the notification? I understand we notified the managing agent. Why would the managing agent inform their tenants that they're about to have a headache? I mean, it just doesn't make sense. So my question to you is why don't we do that? The, I mean, the simple answer is for conditional uses, the required notice is to do mailed public notice within 500 feet. We do not post conditional uses. We do not put a physical sign on the property. It's not required in the code and we've never done it. So I'm not saying that the code shouldn't maybe that shouldn't be expanded, but we don't. So we try to treat everybody applicable under the code for public notice and not go off on tangents. So that's that's why we did. You know, we follow the code. Right, but we also didn't notify the tenants by mail as well. It it, it is we notify the property owners. We do not notify in the, you know, renters. It, it's not. It goes to the. We we don't have the address list for the inside of that. We we have a the address list comes from the property appraiser records. It goes to the to the owners. A again, I mean that's. 
Well, I'm saying, I know it doesn't satisfy. That's not the answer. That no, it's not doesn't satisfy, satisfy you, but right. that is the answer. So. so I'm not only saying it for this particular case, but I'm saying it for a possibility to change that section of the code because it's not fair to the people um, to not have an idea. They're not here sure. to represent. Um, so I think they should have a say in the matter one way or the other. Um, <laughs> so whether we have it in the code, we should have it in the code is my uh, statement, even though I know it'll be a question eventually. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, I just think it's fair to all concerned to have that uh, in there. So my question to you also on criteria number two. Um, you have here the proposed use is appropriate in the property in question compatible with the area. Um, it's you, the comment that's in here says the boarding component may present impacts to surrounding properties. I don't even know how you could say may, it definitely will. Um, and especially in terms of noise, outdoor activity, and hours of operation. Those are all gimmies. They, that's exactly what it's going to cause. Um, so I don't understand how these are, explain to me how you say that it may. I'm going to defer to the applicant because if you hear, once you hear how the operations of it, how it functions, it may or may not be, be a compatibility issue. I mean, that we're, we're simply saying it could, it could, oh, I'm presenting to you that it could. We're not saying it does, we're saying it could or does not, frankly. I mean, it, it's, I think that's an open, and it, that's an open question for, you know, it's to the question of compatibility. So let me ask you this, on uh, overnight boarding, kenneling, whatever terminology we want to use towards keeping dogs overnight, would you agree that there's a difference between boarding sick dogs that have been mostly, uh, for the most part, had surgeries or whatever, and they're being kept overnight, and they've had, um, they've been on meds, they're healing, they're on tranquilizers, different than a definition of kenneled um, dogs that are um, are stored for training. I, I I don't have an opinion on that. Okay, I do, but I mean, I I, I and that, this is why I was at, you know at the end of the day the applicant has a, hard, a a has a burden of proof here, and you know I'm. They're going to have to make their case. You know, we're not recommending approval. We're not recommending denial. We're trying to present what needs to be considered by the board in this instance. So another comment that was made, so I need to clarify this. There was a comparison that this will be used for something similar to a dog grooming uh, what it was used prior, correct? That's what the prior use was dog grooming. Right. I think the statement was dog training, but, you know, is a, I think that's a similar, you know, similar enough use as we would consider dog training to be. Well, there's a dog present, so it's similar. There's but, a dog present, but, there's a handler, there's people on site. It's not, you know, that, yes, we would consider dog training similar to a dog grooming establishment. Well, but a dog grooming is, you groom the dog, they may stay for an hour till the owner comes, picks it up, and away it goes. This is completely different. This has completely no relation to grooming. So that's why I did, I, my oh, question. Oh, again, I'm I gonna know. let you, defer, I'm gonna defer all of that to the applicant. Well, these were the applicant's words or staff's words? Based on how the applicant is presented, what they're doing, and the control that they have over these animals. They're training these animals. Dog groomers, have you been to a, I mean, they bark, they carry on, they howl. I mean, so they're, I mean, <laughs> yes, I can say that I think that these are probably equivalent, you know, but again, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna defer to the applicant to make their case here. Okay, I just wanted to clarify some of the things that have been said versus um, the true definition of these there, things, that's... And part of the problem is lack of definitions. You know, again, the reason we got it here is because there's enough similarity of other uses that are in the transect code that I felt like 
we had an obligation to at least bring it forward to be able to let the applicant make their case. That's so. Well, it's comparing a car wash to a car repair I, shop. I'll, it's still I'll, both being cars, but. I'll, I'll questions, defer to the questions. applicant. <laughs> questions, questions. I, I'm done with my questions. Right. Commissioner Kulias. Uh, all my questions are for the applicant. Thank you. Okay. Um, Ms. Vincent, I, I know this is a tough night, or at least this is a tough item for you. Um, I just have one question on, on this Section 72 of the Land Development Code. I, I understand how you're, you're mm. kind of weaving it together and everything. That's fine. But on the, um, the, on the conditional use now, on these, I don't know whether you would call them guidelines or requirements in this 72. Are they... Are they hard requirements or are they guidelines? I think they would be looked at as for guidance. Okay. Um, I, I, I wouldn't. I, I would not interpret them to be hard guidelines at this point. Okay. If they, if, if it were listed with the other list of code sections that are applicable, absolutely hard guidelines. But, These but, are not. But uh, what you're saying is it uh, because of the way. Um, uh, it was. It was again woven into this. Uh, application the 72 versus the transect the, or the smart code it's it's fair to consider those as part of yes. this review I, I think okay. it is for guidance yes absolutely okay all right um, that's all I have are there any other questions for Ms. Uh, Vincent this is the last chance you're going to get to ask her questions excuse okay. me can I yes. clarify then from what I just heard section 72 is for guidance Yes. So the the way that this you have it says where applicable refer to the standards and regulations as found in this in the land development code as referenced below and there's a whole list of code sections that are applicable for specifically applicable for review. Section 72 is not listed there. I understand that, but if what, it was listed there, would it be for guidance or the, would it be a, it, for legislation or ordinance or a, law a regular, or whatever? A hard requirement. A is requirement it a requirement or, or is it a, a wannabe? I, I'll, I'll stick by the fact, I, I believe you can refer to 72 for guidance if you want to apply it, you know, Chapter and verse, that's your choice. I don't think you have to. Okay, could we get a, a legal reading on this? Is be, because, I mean, obviously the, the lawyer that stood in for P&Z brought Section 72 up. She said they could, she ultimately said they could right. be considered. She did not but say they were. We're, uh, we're, we're going, going to have an opportunity. For, yes. Would you like to weigh in on this? Just that I would, I assume that what uh, Regina Kardash was saying is that there was nothing else in the code that was applicable other than when you look at this section, something similar to what the request was. So I think that's the guidelines that she was probably looking at to try to give some understanding as to what the codes require in these circumstances. There's obviously nothing exactly uh, under the code, so, so it's a bit of a, a guide. I would say it has to be guide guidelines because it's not exactly okay, well, what they're yeah, requesting. That's what I'm, I'm just trying to understand no, whether, right. if it's a guideline, that's one thing. If it's the no, law, no. then that's another thing. I, I, I don't think it can be looked at as a requirement because it doesn't, it's not really what they're asking for. You don't have anything in the codes that meets what they're asking for. So there is some, in, interpretation involved in this that, that the uh, applicant still has the burden to show you that it meets your requirements. Okay, could I ask another question then? Yes. If there's barking animals and people complain, code enforcement enforces the noise law against barking dogs under the Land Development Code? Under the transit code, what what applies here? Noise is noise. The, no, the you do not get a walk at any point in time from the noise ordinance. So and nuisance ordinance. So that can be enforced through code enforcement. Um, while I have the opportunity, you know, I would say that you may, if you 
if you get to the point of where you're trying to make a motion for approval, you may also want to consider a specific condition that said that specifically that says that, you know, if there are documented excessive noise, odor, or anything of that nature, that the board of commissioners, that, you know, documented that can be returned to the board of commissioners for for revocation. I mean, you have the ability, I think, to put a condition like that on here, to 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 capture that. I think you could do it without it, but I think a condition makes it very clear. All right, thank you. Um, did you have, you, I'm no, sorry, I'm Commissioner Cunio, for, oh, oh, for the others. Um, and then if that conditional use were to uh, be violated and the condition revoked, the training facility could continue as a training yes. facility, but without the overnight yes. boarding. Okay, by right, okay, thank you. Um, let's see, the applicant is here. If you'd like to come up forward and state your name and address, please. <clears throat> Andrea Bolander, 258 Banana Road, Palm Harbor, Florida. Okay, now the only thing, the only question I have is do you have any uh, questions concerning what Mrs. Vincent had said? Not your presentation, but uh, uh, any questions for uh, Ms. Vincent in terms of her testimony? Not at this time. Okay, Ms. Vincent, would you like to have your presentation entered into evidence. Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you. Please proceed with your presentation and then the commission will have an opportunity to ask you questions. I would just say that uh, as it was presented in uh, planning and zoning, that is um, that has gone well, no changes or additions or anything else has gone on. So what has been presented here is the same that we'd like to present. So nothing about it has changed okay. as far as the presentation. Uh, let me, um, if you don't mind, I'm gonna, you're done with everything that you've got to say at this point. I'm uh, that's that's fine. Yes. I'm gonna to go to the commission for questions. Sure. Vice Mayor Lund, do you have any questions for the applicant? I actually do. How do you feel about the possibility of 10 dogs being stored in crates within the space that's at dogging? I'm, <laughs> you know, I'm not gonna say, you're obviously probably not gonna put kennels in the washroom, you're not gonna put them in the, in the lobby, so we know they're going into that room there. So how do you feel about that? So that's a great question. I've been in this business for a long time, uh, mainly having a large number of dogs. So I've gone from uh, large numbers of dogs, 60, 70, 80 a day, to now a very um, intricate one-on-one -on -one training type of environment. So I feel really good uh, about it, actually. Um, there are uh, multiples of those areas. I, everybody who looks at that um, crate stacked on top of the other, um, apparently that's not a very good visual, which I didn't realize that that would be bothersome, but it was to just to be able to show that those um, particular type of crates, they're $1,500 a piece, they are very sturdy, um, they're very uh, roomy and dogs love them very much compared to the wire crates that you know is most common seen in most people's homes. So there are multiples of those rooms and in those rooms, um, there's two of them in particular uh, that are five crates in each of those rooms. And the groomer, um, they use what are called cage banks where there are lots of crates and they are stacked one on top of another all the way to the ceiling. So after, for example, a dog gets bathed or groomed, it goes into this holding area, and I wish it was for an hour. It's very common that it's all day long. So anyway, to answer the question, I feel really great, um, and uh, my experience is Okay, so that, are those that. crates liable to be stacked, or they're no, not no, going no, no, to be no. stacked? No, I think I was, my point in showing that was to show that they're very, very sturdy, and they're very, very safe. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry, I have a breeding background, so I, I, got I know about dogs, I know about crates, I know how they react, and, and, uh, and I'm just, my concern is for the dogs at this yeah. particular point. And it depends on what side of the fence you're on. If you're a no crate person, then, you know, that, that can look terrible, but if you're my background kind of person, you know, those look phenomenal. Um, so I've actually heard good things from your neighbors. I appreciate that. Um, 
about about positive things. So I'm, that, that wasn't a problem with me. The fact that your dogs are going to bark. They actually they are. don't. You put five dogs in a room. They they're going to bark. They actually don't. Um, I don't know how you're going to control that. I, I do it very, very well. Um, so I, I really... I don't want that headache either. You know, I don't want a headache. I don't want, to, I don't want anybody to be bothered. That's the least concern should be. There's... Okay, so I, when you train your dogs, um, there's a limited rear facility that I'm, I'm assuming you go through, through standard training methodology with. Do you do it singly or with other dogs or does it depend on what you're trying to accomplish? Yeah, so this business is huge. It's very, very uh, <clears throat> needed. There are a lot of people who have adopted a lot of dogs out of you know, the local humane societies and they get them home and the dog is tearing up the house, you know, making a mess on their floors, chewing the furniture, can't take it on leash. And the evolution of the pet dog has changed dramatically. Um, if somebody would have told me uh, 15, 20 years ago that somebody would have paid me to babysit their dog during the day for a doggy daycare, you know, I would have looked at you like you were crazy. <laughs> so, um, and I bought and really um, produced a very high quality, the only one in this area, uh, off of 19 and Curlew. It was known as Canine Adventures, and they were doing an average of seven dogs a day, and I sold it four years later doing 70 dogs a day. So, I know what I'm doing. Um, I know I don't want to do that, and I know what that looks like. It's, you know, it's busy and it's loud. But uh, my clients were saying to me, my dog is not only tired, but they're listening better. So I don't know what you're doing, but if you could keep doing it. So after I sold the business, I really wasn't sure that I wanted to be in the dog business anymore. I have a corporate background, so I have a business background. But uh, my family, I grew up, were horse trainers and dog trainers. So uh, my mother trained uh, dogs for the Georgia and Alabama's police departments, and she traveled and represented the USA uh, in the Olympic Schutzen trials. And so I've spent hours and hours and hours in that realm, which is the highest form of obedience that you're going to get. I am a pet dog trainer. I just want to help the everyday guy and gal who has a dog and wants to take it to the Sponge City Brewery and it not aggress another animal and know how to lie there and walk on leash and get in the car and go home. So I spend um, a lot of hours with these dogs and they do need to be crate trained for many reasons. An injury, um, you know, being overnight at somebody, a sitter's home, you know, all of these things. The dog has to learn how to be crated. It's not uncommon. And so to be able to go through that process and be on site 24 hours a day with that process, the dogs at the end of the day are so tired because they've been in training off and on all day long that they're like, if you people will just turn off the lights and let us go to sleep, we'd really appreciate it. So, and I'm there going, you know, are you making any noise? Are you okay? And they're like, they're zonked out on their sides, just passed out. So while I appreciate, you know, everybody's concerned about the noise. There's truly no noise. I mean, there just isn't. Do you have an overnight staffing plan? I do, yeah, we've been practicing. So um, that building was, needed some beautification. So we have, I put it back in like a house. Um, after I sold my business in 2019, I started training out of my home in Ozona. So I really enjoy that aspect and it really helped me form a niche in this business that I can help a dog um, get through the process of a doorbell ringing, you know, of your mother-in-law or your grandmother coming home and not jumping on, you know, and causing all of those headaches that people don't want. So um, I have staff and we've all intermittently <coughs> figured out even if the neighborhood is, you know, is good at 10 o'clock at night, at two o'clock in the morning, what goes on? You know, you don't know unless you're there. So, um, you know, I've got dogs of my own, and I know that I could have 10 dogs at my house right here across the street right now, 
there's no ordinance ordinance for anybody having any certain number of dogs. So I could personally buy a house and have ten dogs in the yard. Yeah, I understand. You can. Are um, so back to the yes. overnight monitoring. Are you going to monitor them, or act, somebody actually going to be there? No, we're physically there. It's one somebody's of the physically. Yeah, going to be my there. clients require that, which I think is great. I mean, I'm not paid a, a small pittance to do what I do. Yeah, I understand. I understand. Yeah. Is um. Are you okay with the veterinary on call requirement? To me, that seems odd when there's so many 24 hour, you know, veterinarians. If I called my vet who is open till 8 o'clock at PM, he'd say, you know, call Dr. So and so over here, animal emergency, and go there or go to Blue Pearl. Or is that a yes I know or every vet is, in the area. Is that a yes or a no? You're not okay with that requirement? I am okay. If it's, I mean, if it's mandatory, I'm going to do whatever needs to be done. That's the bottom line. I have no further questions. Commissioner Carr, questions? I've got no questions. Nothing? Okay. Commissioner Eisner. My only question I have for you, um, and I don't know how you're going to answer this. I, I, well, maybe I do know how you're going to answer it. I don't know how you're going to keep the dogs quiet. And we have a situation where we have people over um, at Santa's Isles who don't know this is even going on. So I don't know... Um, I'm not adverse to your training at all, and uh, I just don't know how to keep dogs quiet. Not just me personally. Um, I've had dogs all my life. I know all they need to do is the slightest sound, and they're barking. So I, I know you kind of guarantee it. Certainly do. Right, but there's no formula that you can give me that would guarantee that correct the moment you have a complaint about a barking you let me know I'll be glad to take care of it I guarantee you won't but you can't explain to me how that yeah I'm training this dog off and on all day long when the nighttime comes and it's and that's that's really the concern is the the overnight lodging because so we're there so dogs do not start in unison hey bud you want to bark and then all of a sudden they start doing that. These dogs literally have gone through the, a structured, which they've never been in before. So they're now in structure, they're on a schedule. They, I clock probably 10 to 12 miles around these streets a day with these dogs. Every day I beat it up and down the streets. So you, if you haven't seen me, you probably will because my staff and I are, we have multiple dogs and you know we're going up and down the streets doing it in a down, in a sit. Um, just visually participating. It's mental stimulation, so it's not like a dog in the back yard who doesn't have any interaction. It's truly a different type um, of mental stimulation as well as physical. So I, we just don't have it. I how long, we just don't. How long do you um, expect to keep dog A comes in? How long does that dog stay with you? That's a good question. So it depends. Uh, there's Three different, a puppy training is about 10 days. Um, a What is considered a board and train, basic obedience is about three weeks. And a behavior modification um, can last as long as six weeks. How long does it take from that dog A coming in mm -hmm. till it becomes obedient and doesn't bark from your training? Um, I'm just, I, I'm going to tell you I don't have any barking problems. It is one of the least problems. I, it gets under control right away because they're not around other dogs. There are other dogs that have been in that process and once that dog gets introduced to let's say a dog that's been in the program, um, dogs teach each other. And there, no one dog is left for any period of time alone so that the barking would uh, begin and then not be addressed. So there's no formula that you have and these dogs can be um, with you three weeks or more. When you say formula, yeah, the formula is we're up at, you know, early in the morning, the dog, you know, relieves himself while he's with the supervision. So there's no barking then, the dog comes back in, the dog gets fed, the dog then goes back out again with supervision, typically on leash, all of these dogs. I mean, it, it's, it's kind of like boot camp. Uh, it's not just run amok and go have a big time and, you know, no one knows what you're doing or how you're doing it. So it's kind of like classes being held. When the teacher says it's enough, it's enough. 
And, and if not, then we work the dog so that the dog can understand that, you know, we go from alert barking is one thing and nuisance barking is completely another. And so if a dog is barking, it gets addressed immediately. So I wanna know why the dog is barking. And so if the dog begins barking, then we address and, and we squash the, the problem of why it thinks it should be barking. Are you aware that the Santos Island is a senior facility? Yeah, I met a lot of them. They're super great. They think our dogs are like, your dogs always seem so smart. <laughs> so yes. And I've spoken with um, Hannah, who is the on-site manager there, and I was very clear about what we do. And I'm a, you know, we're always open uh, for any comments, concerns, addresses, we'll, we'll take care of it. I have no really questions. Okay. Commissioner Curias. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, Ma'am, you said there are multiple trainers at the facility? Yes. Including yourself? Correct. Uh, what credentials do you need to be a, a dog trainer? So that's a great question. So um, anybody, I guess, could go around calling themselves a dog trainer. Um, I uh, am affiliated and associated with the American Association of Canine Professionals. Um, typically, you spend um, hours and hours and hours and hours uh, with um, animals of some sort. I have a college-educated individual who's with me who did her internship at Lowry Park Zoo. That type of animal training is very different than it is the type of dog training that we do. And so there are um, many educational pieces and there are different sides of the fence on the type of training that gets done. Um, I come from a long background of um, canine police work, um, but I pet dog train. So there's no certifications, you know, so to speak, that one is required of. It's typically history and if somebody is willing to pay you the money because of the results that you get. Okay, and now, um I looked over the back up that the, the dogs will be housed inside. And so you can only, as a service that you're providing for dog training, you can really only have them at that facility a max of 10 dogs at any point in time, correct? Yes, and I do, I'm one of the few people who still go to people's homes and train. So I do in-home training too. So I go to people's homes and train dogs at their houses as well. Okay. and. Um, um, the noise seems to be an issue, yeah. you know, with, with the board and, you know, uh, um, dogs are like people. We can be stressed at times and, sure. you know, being changed in our environments. I, I, I like to think that. Is there a certain initial point when the dogs start training where they may be a little bit unsettled or stressed because of the sudden change in environment in boot camp that's being you know, presented to them initially? Yeah, that's a good question. So yes, and we kind of take advantage of that stress because the dog doesn't know what they don't know. Uh, oftentimes we'll do five weeks worth of training in a client's home to get the dog prepared to come uh, and stay with us. So we do once a week in their home for five weeks and then we take it to the next level of intensity um, for the type of training that the client wants. So typically a dog is dropped off at our facility um, we're at my home for the longest time, and then I get the dog underway in training. So I start leash handling skills right away. So the dog will come with some port of foundation. They can sit, they can down, they can do those things. And then I, I start working the dog. Okay, and uh, you briefly described different types of training. Can you just, any type of training you can think of that you will be doing with these dogs, can you tell us now? Be more specific so I can answer the question uh, more clearly. Obedience training. You stressed yes. obedience training. Yes. Um, are, are Riding you in the teach? car training. Leash skills. Being able to take it anywhere to do it. Being able to go to the groomer and not bite the groomer. Um, we go through those getting your toenails done, getting your teeth brushed. I mean, all the basic care and husbandry work as well as basic obedience. What about uh, protective training or attack training? No. None of that's done at the facility? No. Okay, and um, Commissioner Eiser brought up a couple questions regarding, you know, the length certain 
types of training can take and you were able to uh, elaborate on that. Um, the overnight supervision. So there, there's going to be an individual who's staying there, sleeping there every night. Is that a rotating issue? I don't think issue? my clients would have it any other way. A lot of clients, there's a, a particular gentleman here and his wife, he has two shepherds and they sent their dog off for training. And when he dropped off the dog, he's like, I had no idea nobody was going to be there at that facility. You know, he didn't know. And so um, I've been doing this long enough, uh, and I've cared for dogs, a large number of dogs, and they daycare environment, grooming, as well as lodging. And my other, we didn't have anybody overnighting there. And it's, you know, it, it works fine, but um, for this level of care uh, that this dog is receiving, that just, it can't be any other way. So someone is there, yes, and will be there. Okay. And um, my questions have been answered, Mayor. Thank you. Okay. Um, I was going to ask, uh, you, you, do you say you have a dog, Commissioner well, Bryce Miller? Right. I said I have experience. In, okay. In, in uh, I have the dog. Do you still have one? <laughs> dog. You still no, have I, one? I don't have <laughs> okay. my dogs um, anymore, unfortunately. Let me, do you have a question? Yes, I do. Nicely, go ahead. How, many, uh, how much staff do you have? Uh, so it's myself and three others. Are, now, I would presume, what is the qualifications of all of the four people? So um, my husband likes to say that um, I'm the inspiration. He's the perspiration. So he manages all the uh, needs of the facility. We have upgraded the fencing was uh, in pretty poor state. So uh, we did all of that. We've updated all of the backyard landscaping to be outdoor turf for the dogs um so he's kind of the maintenance guy uh, and before a dog goes home i hand the dog to him to say if you can walk it then it's ready to go home because he is not a dog trainer so if he comes and brings the dog back and he says no it's not ready yet then i know we have more work to do um, the other two uh, staff uh, kaylee uh, is and i have worked together since 2016 and then we hired an individual before I sold the company. Um, she too has been, I don't know, four years uh, donating all of her time to the local Humane Society and then began working with us and she's now with us full time and she will be our house manager who will be on site. Does she have any training, any titles other than? Uh, I, no, a lot of this stuff comes hands on, Right. you know, um, a lot of the um, high profile trainers I've trained with since the 80s. Um, and it's, it's really referral business. I don't advertise, I do nothing. Everything is word of mouth. If you Google me, you can find me. Um, I have all very good reviews, even in my previous business of doggy daycare, which I would never do again. Um, so this is really uh, that next level uh, of income earning, um, professional delivery of some pet care services where families really want to take the time with their pet to the next level. And if you treat a dog like a kid, you often don't get the results you're looking for, so you start looking for help. And there um, is all kinds of help out there. I usually am the person who I say, have you gone to this person, have you gone to that person yet? Uh, yeah, we've gone to the mall and, and they can't help us, but we understand you can. So I like to be the last person that gets called, not the first. So let me explain to you why I'm asking the question and I will also clarify another question with it. <clears throat> so your husband is a hands-on guy, but right. not a trainer. Right. The other two people that you have on your staff, in your words, they're not trainers either. They just have some experience. But in addition, you're also explaining to us that there is 24-hour hands-on service. You're also explaining to us that you do a lot of your training on site. What you make, the question that you're making me think through, and I want you to explain to me how to make me feel better about that, is you're not gonna be there all the time. I so feel like I am. I, I know you feel like that, but you just explained to me that you're not. So even though you 
I, I need you to try to, you know, convince me how your training mm -hmm. um, is going to keep dogs quiet 24-7, because you're not going to sleep there 24-7. You will have other people um, sleeping there, and if their training is not um, up to your standard, how do you present to this board that you're going to stop the barking or the noise or the, the many issues that could come up? So our training that we're doing now, we've been there since, since September doing training. So there are dogs there um, going through the process. The people see us out there with them. Um, I would say to you that the other two staff that I do have, they are, um, they are training. They have been, especially the, the younger um, of the two of us has, has been trained by the Humane Society and how to handle a dog, how to quiet a dog, how to um, apply first aid to a dog. Um, and then running my facility, they also went through training uh, in order to care for pets in that type of environment. So uh, if I, I don't want to mislead you to think these people don't have training, they do have training. No, I didn't say that. Okay. Uh, no. They do. And they're, um, we have SOPs, so we have standards in which every one of us operate in the same caliber. Um, so there's no deficiency in one person not being able to, to provide a deliverable based on our, what our standards are. So uh, I, yes, you're right, I'm not going to be there 24 hours a day, um, but I am there seven days a week and I am there all waking hours. And so their, my, my assessment of their ability to um, meet our standards has gone very, very well. And if whatever this imposition of um, I can't transfer it or somebody else can't buy the business or whatever, you know, my neck is the one who's on the line in making sure those things are done. How many dogs do you have there now? None overnight. We do during the day, so people will come and go depending upon who's calling and who's not. So, so far since you've owned this or? Yeah there's been no overnight dogs? No, and I'll have mine. I'll bring mine, they will bring theirs. I really wanted to get an idea about what it's like there overnight. You know, whether there's, I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's a mixed use area. So there are people up and down the streets at two o'clock in the morning. And you know, those were my concerns and safety and uh, those type of things. So, so far so good, it's been great. I mean, I, I think everybody here has been very welcoming to us. and. I've had no one complain as of yet. We had the local artist, Emily Taman, do a whole mural on the side of the building. I, I know who that is, yes. Yeah, she's done fabulous work. So, okay. you know, I, we really wanted to just be part of that. But uh, overall, so far, no complaints that I'm aware of. L let me just ask you this one last question. Sure. If you don't get the conditional approval yeah. for overnight, is it still a viable business? That's a great question. So I probably have a half a million dollars in this business, uh, in this building, and my option um, after a very long conversation, a meeting with zoning and planning prior, and getting here, you know, uh, I would prefer to be able to do the overnight because the the care that you can give, um, and I do field trips now. Let's take let's let's use that for an example, uh, not to change points. But yes, I can yes I can make a living, um, you know. But I, I own other property in the Gainesville area, so we set up a whole facility there where dogs do field trips. So I'll take, you know, seven, ten, fourteen dogs at a time on my motorhome, and we go up there and we'll stay up there long weekends so that we can develop uh, a more relationship spe uh, specific with those animals. Uh, so that they can come back and live in uh, an environment and they're much more in tune with what it's supposed to look like in somebody's home. So, you know, overnight care is very important. It just is. I have no further questions. Okay. I think you've been asked many, many, many questions. I'm not sure I can find anything to, <laughs> to do my duty. Um, I, we've, we've talked about the various types of, or you talked about the various types of training requiring um, 
overnight boarding and the amount of time, is there any type of day boarding that, I'm sorry, day training that occurs there that didn't, does not require any boarding at night? Yeah, so um, for clients who have already gone through training, the dog is smarter when they go home than before they got to me. The parent is usually lacking in skill on how to hold that dog accountable and how to what we call drive the dog to those obedient skills that they've learned because follow through is everything. Holding the dog accountable is everything. And so while that client is learning how to do that, then the dog will come for what we call a maintenance day. So they'll come and they'll spend the day. We keep the dog on track and drive the dog all day long, make sure the leash skills are going as they should, that they're in a formal heel, you know, and they're not doing all those other things that we've trained out of them while we're holding the, helping the parent. We go to the parent's house once a week. Mm -hmm. So it's a balance of going to the parent's home and having the dog at our facility to make sure the dog doesn't fall off. Um, you're, you're just training. You have uh, training by right at the location, notwithstanding the um, overnight yes. stay. Um, would you, could, could you kind of guess as far as the number of dogs that you may have there during the day? Not with, I know that we're talking about, um, it's about the same. limiting 10 at night. It's about uh, the same, give about or take the same. a couple. Okay. Yeah. So that's pretty much your capacity is about 10 dogs at a time. I just don't want it. I've okay. already, I've already, I've already gone down the 70 dog a day route. Um, or is, or I, I know that, um, you do, um, uh, I mean, I, I don't think that it's just people view you, whoever brings you your dog, their dog is gonna view you as a resource. And, and I would suspect um, you being a, a person that uh, loves dogs, um, do you have any uh, uh, associations with adoption services or anything? Um, I'm referred by quite a few of them. Okay. Especially dogs who, the, do, do you help people adopt dogs, I guess, is what I'm getting at? And yeah, I work with the German Shepherd um, Rescue. I work with Suncoast Animal League, who's close by. Um, and I'm known as one of the very few people who will handle a dog who may not be the nicest in the world. Okay. Yeah, that's good. That, that's, I was just wanting to try and get an understanding of how you would fit in with the community other than sure. just a, a business, which that is very important to me. Um, okay. That's all the, uh, the questions I have. I know everybody had a, a many other questions. Do any of the commissioners have any other questions for the applicant? Okay. Um, Ms. Vincent, do you have any questions for the applicant? No. Okay. okay so what we're gonna do now is go to public comments. Um, are there any public comments Please come forward. Aaron Henson, 112 Carlisle Circle, and 501 South Pinellas Sponge City Brewing. Andrea backs right up to where we are. We bought the property in October of 2021. She purchased the property in September of this past year. There was more noise when the dog groomer was there, when they would let the dogs in the backyard while they would dry off because they would, didn't like the crates or whatever for whatever reason. Um, we have had zero complaints with her dogs. And like she said, I don't know if you've all gone to First Friday and things. She is out walking the streets every single day. Um, no issues with any of the dogs. I, I don't understand. Um, I don't understand the issues. And my, my one concern is, Mr. Is it Eisner? I'm sorry, I can't. Commissioner Eisner, yes. Commissioner Eisner, um, when you said you store a dog, we don't store dogs. Dogs aren't stored. So I don't, that breaks my heart when you say that as a dog owner. My dog stays in a crate at night. It's for his safety too. He loves his bed. It's a place where they go. They're comfortable there. It's not a bad thing to be stored. It's, it's a good thing. It's their home. That's where they stay. So. I apologize for the word usage. I just was curious if she holds dogs overnight. That's all. I, I understand. Um, I understand. That's all. Thank you, guys. Thank you, ma'am. Are there any other public comments? Okay. 
Peter Lacks, 514 Ashland Avenue. All right, guys, I'm going to have to scold you. Unequal treatment. Unequal treatment. Earlier, you approved Sponge City Brewing right next door. Was there any questions to them of noise? No, not a word. Not one word. During the break, I walked outside to catch the lightning update. Three to one, Hedman, oh, hit, hit it off the crossbar. What do I hear? Sound probably from either Morgan Mays or the, the Jamaican place that used to be Ballyhoo's. You can hear that. Now, another thing, something that wasn't pointed out that I think might be Helpful, you're talking about the seniors next door at Santos. You ever drive by there sometimes during the afternoon, you see some old ladies or some people walking their dogs. Right next door, they got somewhere to help them train their animals. This is a needed service. And what the lady is explaining is a specialty service. It's all tied in together, it's not Hey, we're, gonna, we're going out of town for the weekend. Can we drop our dog off? No. Now, if you're that concerned about noise, we had an issue a while back. You can request for them to do soundproofing in the rooms. If there's two rooms, shouldn't be that much difficulty. But I don't think the noise is going to be the problem. And what about the other nuisances that are already in the area? Safford Avenue, sometimes that gets a little wild. I'm sure Officer Trill can give you some stories. Mark probably has a few too. So you can't put what goes on in the neighborhood just on their laps. So I would say the way conditional uses are work and Renee wisely brought it into the record the fact that conditional uses are revocable now I'm not putting it as a threat I just so the knowledge is out there and it appears to me from what I've heard that these people have the integrity and the reputation that they want to maintain for their services such that they will meet your standards and as I mentioned earlier this area is revitalizing. You already proved Sponge City. You proved this. Maybe this stuff is the catalyst that revitalizes some of this area. You have two different individuals, two different groups coming from out of town but nearby. And I have to say, Palm Harbor is not that far. So if there's an issue, I'm sure, is it Andrea? Andrea would have no problem responding. So I think some of your concerns really have been answered. And I would say, and I apologize earlier where I outspoke that on the conditions, the conditions that the Planning and Zoning Board are reasonable and can be added in. And if you want to add in, you know, soundproofing, the boarding rooms. But this is what conditional uses gives you the flexibility to allow for some of these things that we can't totally define. We're coming into a new world where there's a lot of new types of careers and enterprises coming that we don't have all the rules for. And you as judges have the ability to weigh all the various facts and make an equitable decision. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Delacus. Um, are there any other public comments? Uh, hi, I'm Kaylee, 224 Countryside Key Boulevard in Oldsmar. Um, I have worked with Andrea for a very long time. I've also known her for a very long time. I know her family very, very well. Very, very lovely and sweet people. I've also worked with animals for a very, very long time. And I know the difference between a kennel and what 
special place that she is trying to put together. Um, it's very structured. It's very calm, you know, a very limited amount of dogs. Um, and we work with them in and out of the day constantly. Um, so I think this is a really special place. I want to thank you for welcoming us to the city. Um, I know this has been a difficult case, but um, I just want to say thank you. And I think um, we'll do a great job and, and hold accountable. For sure. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other uh, public comments? Um, Mr. Jump, are there any remote access public comments? Would like to speak on this item. Please raise your hand and you'll be allowed in to talk. And we do have a raised hand at this time. I'll allow the first person in. Okay. Yes, greetings. Can I be heard? Yes. All right, thank you. It's Robert Rockline, 755 North Lake Boulevard. Sorry I had to leave the meeting earlier. Uh, there was a lot of interesting stuff. I was online the whole time. Uh, I just want to offer a little individual perspective here. Uh, as a, a dog owner for, uh, I hate to admit, uh, over 55 years, and also an employee as an adoption services manager at the largest no-kill shelter in the United States for over two years, uh, dogs will bark. And it's what the people do about it. it is, sometimes it's the people that need the training, not the dogs. Uh, so I live in a very tight community now, the tightest I've ever lived in my life, even growing up in, in Queens up in New York. We have about 15 feet between uh, dwellings here. Uh, and the majority of owners out of the 122 homes have dogs. And if they're outside, you'll hear them bark because it's a fairly quiet area. If the dogs are inside, and I have two dogs that love to bark, they love to eat, they love to walk, and they love to bark, they do not react to my adjacent neighbors, both of who have, have dogs and are 15 feet away at, at the most, wall to wall, uh, when my neighbor's dogs barked. So if the dogs are outside and my dogs are outside, they may respond, and I hear other people's dogs barking all the time, and they are usually quieted in a very brief period. Uh, that's what responsible people do. So the fact that you do have a noise code <coughs> ordinance and it holds up all properties and all uses, and it's a it's a tool, uh, should there be you know some negative impact, which I, I don't anticipate in this. I, I, I don't like to be predictive. I don't like to say a dog will bark until it does. Uh, and then, of course, you know, that's reasonable. Babies cry, dogs bark. Uh, I whine with my back and my knees sometimes, but it's controlled and it's reasonable. So uh, based on the fact that I am wall to wall with dogs in this community and yet suffer zero impact from that, and I may be somewhat partial because I've been a dog owner and I've, I've worked with dogs, I don't predict that this will be a, uh, you know, uh, an impact or a factor in, in this type of use. I have to agree with Mr. Velagas' statement just before, you know, you, you approve the use next door. Uh, the outside overhang is likely to be used uh, for, you know, a music player uh, on a rainy day. Normally they try to project back to the building, but you get some reflective, uh, you know, noise reverberating from that. It, it's the other building is so far away that uh, I really, and if it is if it is aged people, they may, they may be like myself, a little less uh, able to hear uh, the noises that they used to. I, I really don't think that there's gonna be impact here. And uh, I don't think there's gonna be impact from the brewery too, because I think they're gonna be responsive to the community and they want to participate, be involved and join us. Okay. They're not against us. So uh, with that, I'll close my comments and I, I leave it up to you to vote in accordance. Thank you, Mr. Rockland. Um, okay. Mr. Jump, any other comments? And we do not have any other raised hands at this time. Okay. Um, does the applicant, everything was positive and you have a chance to rebut anything that you disagree with what you heard. <laughs> I would assume you don't have any rebuttal. Um, Ms. Vincent, um, do you have any closing or summation that you would like to make? Uh, the only thing I would just note that the conditions that were recommended by the Planning and Zoning Board are not in the resolution right now. So if you want those included, then make the motion so to do so. Thank you. Okay. All right. So what we're going to do is close the public hearing. And um, 
the next is to go to commission uh, comments and, and give the commissioners an opportunity to, uh, to discuss this further before we make any kind of a motion. So, um, <clears throat> Vice Mayor Lunt, you started off with some pretty good questions. What, what are your thoughts? You know, I think from the onset I'm looking for an excuse to say yes, even though this doesn't fit into a category that I wish it fit into. In other words, we haven't categorized this yet. I'm a little nervous about whether it really follows 72 or whether it really follows the transact. Um, I've spoken to some of the neighbors personally. Um, I haven't found anybody saying this is a bad thing, even in the daytime. I'm kind of a trust and verify guy. I'd like to go along with the motion with the conditions placed upon it by the Planning and Zoning Board and with the additional uh, condition that it be revocable based on excess noise violations, except that I don't know how to classify excess noise violations. Maybe Major Trill could help us with that. How do you, hang might, on, hang on. Let, let the city I, I might want the city loose. attorney to. I'm sorry. I might want to do him instead of a person more to help you with where you want to get. Do you have any thoughts on that, Mr. Salzman? Well, I, I have a couple thoughts. Okay. One is that obviously it could be handled as a nuisance issue, which we would take through code enforcement. Um, we could put a provision, but it's hard to craft that particular language. Um, tonight because it would be I mean how many nuisances uh, when do we determine what is a, an adequate nuisance of finding a lot of times chief will tell you that they can go out and uh, uh, to a noise complaint and by the time they get there there is no noise um, so it's a little difficult to craft well, that that's what I, was I, I would rather that. it really be handled through code enforcement okay all right so barring that I'm I'm going to say I'm going to go along with this, uh, with the conditions placed on it by planning and zoning. Okay. Commissioner Carr. Yeah, um, thank you to the applicant for the detailed information. There's a significant amount of data that you provided, um, a significant amount of data, uh, and I think you proved that this isn't just a normal kennel and it's just not a normal training facility either. Uh, so I appreciate the, the diligence and the amount of effort that you put in behind this. I thought you answered the questions great. Um, from the board's perspective, I, I think you guys have had some really good questions overall and trying to figure this yeah. out. It, it, it's not a straightforward um, condition. Uh, so I understand the questions. I understand the, the going back and forth. And I, I think it's a good sign that you guys are putting into practice kind of some of the things that are, I guess, learning some of the different things that are happening on the board. And uh, I would commend you on that. Um, so with that, I, I think it's, I think they've met this. It's not a super clear, is there a training? Is there a overnight boarding with training um, stipulations in, the, in this? I think it's something that's important to um, understand is that it's a conditional use, and so conditional uses can be pulled back, uh, and that's something I think, I don't, maybe you mentioned it, Mayor, I can't remember who mentioned it, um, but that's an important facet to understand in a situation with this, with this piece of property. Um, if there's multiple complaints because of dog barkings or something along those lines, um, the city staff, would, or I'm sorry, code enforcement through the police department would probably notify the city manager and notify the planning department, and then there would be some type of process in place and at that point to figure it out. So um, with this, I'm happy to make a motion to move forward and approve this tonight. Okay. Commissioner Ashton. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor. Um, first thing I did want to do is I did want to make a clarification. There's a major difference between uh, approving a beer location where people are drinking till whatever time and they can be told to keep quiet. The dog is a little more difficult to keep quiet. But I have no issues with the training part of this whatsoever. I do have, um, I have trepidations about approving um, 10 dogs. Um, I know we keep speaking about approving it, the conditional approval and being able to pull it back. I come from the opposite and I would like to 
go to approve it with lesser amount of dogs and seeing that they could come back before us if there's no issues to add to that to make sure. I prefer to take the baby steps rather than take 10 dogs and put it in that situation. I wasn't fully comfortable with, uh, I'm fully comfortable with the training of Andrea. Um, I had no issues with that, but she's not gonna be there all the time. And I can almost guarantee we're gonna have issues with dogs barking. I've heard every kind of comment. I live on dog, I have my own dog. I have dogs next door to me. One starts, the others go. Um, I heard Mr. Rockland say that in his house, his dogs don't. Um, you know, there's no two dogs that are alike. So everybody can make their own comment about what their dog does. That doesn't mean anything about the dogs that come, and Andrew would have to agree. She doesn't know how these dogs are gonna react. So I would prefer, if we're gonna take a baby step, um, I would not agree to the 10. I would agree to whatever it would be, three or four at a time, and see how that transpires, and then move forward. Okay. Commissioner Kulias. Um, I've listened to everything. I've um, been able to make my decision just waiting and balance all the information that's been given in front of us, and uh, I'll be waiting to make my decision. Thank you. Okay. Um, you know, there's, there's a variety of ways of um, cutting the pie on this thing. You could, you could uh, I think as, uh, as Vincent gave us a couple of suggestions, the P&Z board has got some conditions, the staff gave some conditions. Um, I think, uh, Commissioner Eisner, your idea of uh, starting off with uh, slow steps, I, you know, we've got our code enforcement. Um, I, you know, I, for me, um, it, we also heard one, and I, I think Commissioner Carr recalls we had one that was going to go into uh, the old uh, Philip de Host down there, and in, in, uh, I think Commissioner Kulias, you were involved in that, uh, at, at least on that side. And we, we, I didn't really have an appreciation of, of really what that was going to be, unlike what we heard tonight. I'm, I'm very comfortable with what I heard tonight. Um, I'm also, um, you've invested a whole lot of money. It's not like you're renting that if things go bad, you can walk away. So you've invested a whole lot of money. That's a big factor to me. And then also the fact that it's not transferable. It's to this applicant that we have this evening. So I, I don't, ha and, and my suspicion is if code enforcement shows up at the front door of that business, I think, with the investment that you got and how it would affect the bottom line, I don't think you're gonna allow that to continue on with whatever the problem is. I mean, I just, I just have to have that faith in a business owner here in town. And I also like the fact that, um, um, that you're willing to help with adoption services and rescues. We have a rescue dog. It turns out to be a perfect dog. Doesn't need any training, never needed any training. So, um, of course, we waited 40 years to get the perfect dog. All the other dogs, I can say, haven't worked out that well, but this one is a keeper for sure. So, um, and she started out as crate train. It didn't live too long. My wife insisted she doesn't belong there, so she's got the run of the house. Anyway, um, getting back to the, the main point, I, I'm gonna support this, I, I just have, um, earlier, the city manager and I had conversations. Um, I wasn't sure how all this was going to play out. I, um, I would have felt better if somebody would have showed up from next door complaining that this wasn't going to work as we did with the, how, the residential. I know Mrs. Vincent was probably put between a rock and a hard place on this one given what she had to work with. And, you know, quite frankly, um, we can get scolded, but quite frankly, I really appreciated all the hard, hard uh, questions that this commission came up with because it kind of drew out how the applicant reacted. And the applicant did not tell us what we wanted to hear. She answered the questions. Many other applicants tell us what we want to hear and then we, we wind up walking away scratching our head as far as the way that's going to go. So. Um, 
I'm, I'm going to, you know, bet on you <laughs> this evening that it's going to work out. And um, I'm, I'm sure you're not going to disappoint us in the town. And, and um, so I, I um, would be ready to entertain, unless there's any other comments. Any other comments? Last call on comments. I'm going to entertain um, uh, a, a motion and a second. And we need to adopt both the staff recommendations and the PNZ board recommendations in that. And is there any other condition that a commissioner wishes to add? My only condition is I want to have less, but I don't see that being a uh, popular vote, I, but that's okay. You know, uh, yeah, no, you're right. I mean, I don't, that was, when we started out initially this evening, I was trying to figure out a way to kind of walk this way in. but. At this particular, if there was somebody uh, uh, that was showing up that was out there in, in the audience that uh, questioned what was going on here, I could see that. But everybody's been very positive, and it seems like there's a great deal of experience behind this business. It's not like it's a hobby that I want to make a, a, you know, turn it into a business. So there's quite a bit of an investment in that. So I have to, I have, me, myself, I have to weigh those factors into this decision. And I, I think saying that um, we're going to limit you to four dogs first and you have to come back, um, I, I'm not so sure that that's, uh, that's necessary at this point. I might be wrong, I mean, I, I, but I would, well, in the, my opinion, the chances of my being proven wrong from, based on what I heard tonight are, are very slim. And, and um, what, what I was going to say to you is uh, the people have not been notified. That's the issue that I have. I, the management were notified, but not the people, so. Well, I understand. We'll find out. And they'll let us know if they, if the, first of all, if, if the applicant um, isn't keeping the, uh, the, the dogs quiet, and then the uh, residents are upset, we'll start hearing that and we'll have to deal with that. I understand what you're saying. I'm just gonna have to have a little faith in, you know, the fact that this is a little bit, this is, uh, as far as I can see, a very above board applicant, and they were very direct in answering the questions, and, and I don't think she's telling us everybody is, um, um, you know, experienced, and uh, she's very honest in that, so. I, I don't know you, <laughs> I'm sorry, so whatever I sound like, I don't know you, so I'm not advertising for you, but that's just your, based on your presentation this evening, so. Thank you. I'm ready to entertain a uh, motion. And Mayor. Uh, Commissioner Eisner, if you want to add that on as a motion, you can. I don't know that you'd get a second, but it would be up to you to do that. I'll remain silent. Okay. Mayor, I make a motion uh, with staff to approve with staff recommendations with the conditions and then the additional three condition by, conditions by the Planning and Zoning Board. Okay. Is there a second? Second. All right. If there are any... Un if there are no other comments, and this is uh, Commissioner Carr, I didn't quite hear, that included the both PNZ and the staff comments. That's uh, correct. Conditions. That's correct. Okay. Roll call, please. Commissioner Kouyas? No. Commissioner Eisner? No. Commissioner Carr? Yes. Vice Mayor Lunt? Yes. Mayor Vatikiotis? Yes. Okay. Um, that ends the... Uh, we're done. Uh, that ends the uh, ordinances and resolutions. And um, yeah, we, have another we have the right of way vacation. We have another ordinance. Oh, the amending oh. the right of way. Yes. Okay. Um, okay. Thank you very much. Um, sure, item sure. 18, um, ordinance 2023, amending the right of way vacation. Um, Mr. Salzman, if you could read that by title. Ordinance 202302, an ordinance of the city of Tarpon Springs, Florida. Amending section 216.00 of Article 12 of Appendix A, the Comprehensive Zoning and Land Development Code to, re, uh, to reinstate the requirement for calculation of the application fee based on land valuation, providing for severability, providing for conflict, and providing for the effective date of this ordinance. That is Ordinance 2023.02. Uh, read by title only on first reading. Second reading will be January 24th, 2023. Okay. Um, this is not quasi-judicial um, city manager, of course. 
Ms. Vincent. Uh, yes, this is um, per the board's direction of, of last year. We finally have this back in front of you. Um, this ordinance reestablishes the fee for vacating right of way. Uh, this is essentially restoring what was in the code prior. Um, so if an applicant wishes to vacate right of way, they will have to pay um, uh, a fee of 50% of the appraised value of that right of way to be vacated. So I'll answer in the interest of time. I'll ask you know, if you have any questions, but essentially it restores the code to what it was before. Okay. Are there any uh, public comments concerning this item? Public comments? Yes. Well, we need to be scolded again. <laughs> this is one of my items. <sighs> Thank you for bringing this back. And uh, again, we have to remind the public who was responsible for this original ordinance change that cost the city money, Ed Armstrong. Now, I know we knew it was for the public process so you can probably put in some amendments for um, exempt organizations two things I want to point out based on the property that was vacated to the North Trails I think Renee said it was a 20-foot easement I remembered 15-foot of the vacation by 620 that gives you 8,750 square feet which is basically equal to 2.6 lots based on them <clears throat> having 3,500 square feet they bought the property for roughly 600,000 18 lots comes out to $33,333 a lot times 2.66 that's $88,666 divide that in half $44,333 that's how much the city got shorted on North Lake trails now I know this is for uh, what is it 216 am I correct the ordinance yes okay but if you look at the conditions above as to what are the guiding principles for allowing a vacation the last one is it doesn't provide access to water and that was because we wanted to make sure people could have access for boats walking and stuff like that you have the opportunity in changing this because it is an ordinance and it's the first reading to also look at that factor and maybe a new addition to that line not only access to water but how about access to open space this allows you to have another criteria that allows you to decide whether you vacate or not and the reason why I point this out is because the one that was off of Bayshore I forget the side road they wanted to vacate which kind of I know it was de denied but part of the reason there was vacant property that was open space that we were saying well could we use it for something else so not only should we change it to put the fee back in but maybe we should also expand our idea of what the public interest is beyond just access to the water is public interest access to open space is public interest access to maybe a let's say a retail area that people would have the ability to make passage to get to that more easily so there's there's a, a I think a broader view that can be taken as to what that vacation giveaway access is so I just wanted to throw that out uh, to see show you again how these outside attorneys have cost us money but also to look at how we can better utilize or have a little more criteria of what we're actually looking at in the interest before we vacate thank you 
Mr. Lelikas, I've got a question for you. We, I, I'm not sure I understood what you meant by access to open space. Um, when you were saying oh, access to open space, you're talking about using the unimproved right of way to access open space or that is well, open space? Let's say on the other side of this road there is wooded areas or there's an area that is already open space, but it's not access to water. So is that not as important to have your residents be able to access open space as much as it is to access the water? Because P sometimes public, these public they, open space. They again? Public open space. Publicly. Uh, that would be for you all to define. Okay. Public or just open space in general, depending okay. on the property boundaries that it would abut to. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Are there any other public comments? Mr. Jump, are there any public comments? And there are no raised hands at this time. Okay. Um, let's go to um, the commission, whether you have any questions for Mrs. Vincent. Vice Mayor Long. Um, I don't really know if it's a question or a statement. So can we, we can obviously change section F <coughs> to reflect that the valuation should be decided um, as the average of the surrounding property? Is that rather than leaving it up to the Pinellas County property appraiser who doesn't appraise city owned land? They appraise the city owned land. Well, they, they appraise the surrounding property owner. Yeah, but they don't Our appraise properties. streets. No, and I mean that, you know, well, typically what happens is when we get an application like this, when this was still in place, you know, we look at the adjoining property value and, and you can look at it as there's a, there's various appraisals. There's, there's a, um, you know, there's the tax appraised value. There's a, um, it's not fair market, but there's another, there's a sales, you know. Um, I know there's a fair yeah, market. So, I mean, I'm, I'm so that's what I think is where the gray area is. Um, you know, there, I think the reason that this was, has been done, you know, or the reason it was probably the way, usually these are small, small tracks. <clears throat> so to pay the price to get an appraisal, to find out what it really is, you know, it, it's a, it's kind of a balancing thing. You know, so, I, well, so could we put, the cost of paying for the appraisal deducted on from the proposed vacate, I guess, um, on the proposed property owner that's asking us to vacate. Certainly, it? I mean, I mean, if you were going to require an appraisal, then yes, that would be on the it would be on the property owner, the person seeking the vacation to to pay for that. If that's you know, if you want to change the methodology on this to not look at. This, you know, the surrounding property values and come up with a calculation, then yeah, certainly the problem, you can I, do that. I mean, I look at the property appraiser's site probably more often than you would know. Um, it's less than what it should be in some cases, more than what it should be in right. some cases. It's all over the board. I would much more trust a current evaluation rather than be subject to somebody. I mean, yeah, that, that's a decision of the board. If you right. want to, you know, if you want to have that be subject to, you know, an appraisal or rather than this methodology, then we'll have to rework this and, and bring it back at second reading, um, the methodology. Well, this is going to come back for a second it reading. It will, anyway, yes. Is it not? Yes, yes. it does. Um, so that's that's my only question. I just, I just like to verify who, who values this and the <coughs> fact that we get paid for it. Okay. Commissioner Carr. Thank you. Um, I'm just trying to recall, wasn't there some type of memo by the old city attorney stating that there's some conflict with receiving costs or dollars in the situation? Was that reviewed by anybody <laughs> or? Ba basically, um, he was, he, he didn't say it was um, illegal. He said it was unlawful. Um, in the sense that he felt that he could not uh, defend a case if it went to court as far as um, um, 
uh, if somebody challenged this, but then he also said he wasn't sure who would challenge it anyway. So um, the whole, I mean, if you look at the record. That's fair. Uh, that's fair. Okay. okay. Um, from this standpoint, I, I under, I, it makes sense that there's some type of compensation. It's almost like you're giving a piece of property to somebody, um, or you are technically, um, outside of the application fee. So I'm fine with seeing this uh, move forward. Uh, it's fair to ask a question about an appraisal cost. Um, I, I know in past uh, presentations, when you have like a funny piece of property that lays next to another piece of property or within another property, there's not much value to it unless you add it to a piece of property. So um, that can somewhat be sometimes a surprise um, at times. Uh, I was surprised a few times when I, when I found that out, when I've looked at a few of these that were presented before the board in the past, that there's really not a whole lot of value there unless it's connected to it or uh, the budding property. So uh, I've got no <laughs> issues with the appraisal side of things. Um, with the open land and the, and the public comment, I, I'm not there yet with that one. That's something we could look at further down the road, but I'm fine with supporting this tonight the way it stands. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'm sort of agreement in agreement with what Vice Mayor said, only um, what I think, let's see if you're okay with this, um, where we charge accordingly um, for the surrounding property that's adjoining it um, at 50%. So for argument's sake, if there's a thousand square feet that you have and you're <coughs> gonna be vacating another hundred, you're getting 10% 10, 10 and then you're just gonna pay 5%. So you don't even have to involve an appraiser. It's just gonna go at the going rate of what the other land is. If that's okay, that's, otherwise I have no real issues with this. Okay. Well, what if they haven't purchased it because, because the contract is dependent upon them vacating well, has, that particular property, then there's no real valuation there. But there has to be a value on the property that they're purchasing. This, um, okay, is there any other comments by now? No. Okay, Commissioner Kuyas. No, I'm happy as written and following up and changing a lot of things that were changed for certain reasons here in the future, so thank you. Yeah, I, um, th th just a couple of things, one, um, before this was changed, it was it was in place for, as you read it right now, for 25 to 30 years or something like that. So Correct. it's withstood the time, the test of time. Um, other municipalities, there's a memorandum I wrote that do things a variety of different ways. Right. Um, and and you, you know, you, maybe the city manager can resurrect that memorandum and, and give it to you uh, to take a look between the first reading and the second reading. Um, the other thing, Ms. Vincent, I, I, don't, um, I don't recall reading, I, I mean, obviously when you said it's gonna be put back the way it was, I read the addition that was in there to see that, but I didn't look over the rest of the ordinance. Uh, that's not changing. Is it in there that says what we use this money for? No. And that might be something that I would appreciate adding, and I don't know how the rest of the commission to add that to our land Preservation fund. Oh, I think. Is I that take what that back. Called? It says the proceeds of which shall be utilized solely for the purpose of acquisition of future rights of way by the city. So it is okay. specified. In, I'm yeah, sorry. that's that's the. As a matter of fact, that was the rationale that other cities gave: is that we're giving up right of way. Therefore, the money that we will use to get from that, we will purchase additional purchase right of way right. because it's not free. That was their rationale. So if that's in there, I'm fine with it. I just didn't want it to go somewhere and then. <laughs> you know, used for something else. So, um, go ahead. Could you? I mean, would you be interested in clarifying that? Because future uses of right of way then kind of goes to a. I don't know if there's an actual fund for future uses of right of way, but there's a land preservation fund. So it might be advantageous to our, add. Or we could add it at, for that our land preservation, whatever we would like. The one uh, right of way would be something, that, for example, like. Um, 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 uh, you know, we, we're, we're putting in a, a side, our trail, we're putting in a trail, we need to buy some additional right of way for a trail or something like that. I think that's what it would be used for, but 
I, I'm open for adding to that as far as the land preservation fund, which I think is established, right? It's established, and that would be the, if it's proper, that would be the easiest place to put it for multiple uses, again, of acquiring land. We don't, for we don't have it for uh, right of way. We don't no, have a right of way we, acquisition I mean, fund, right? Mr. Herring could set that up to do it that way, but it'd be starting at nothing. You'd probably have more use of it um, for future things so for maybe that's land what preservation. We, maybe that's what we should think about yeah. for me. So it would be, we would be uh, approving what you have tonight with a, um, a change to add, to change that, you know, you look at the wording, Ms. Vincent, and- So you want it to be for the purchase of future rights of way or for land preservation? Well, what I think the city manager is saying is we don't have a fund right. where right of way right. money for right of ways goes into that fund. It goes into something and mm -hmm. then we'd have to resurrect about how much money it's like mm -hmm. you know we don't do any be bean counting we just assume we're going to use that money for something but in right. the meantime it's used for something else and the land preservation fund that we established mm -hmm. um, that's actually an account and that's what the city manager is saying <coughs> so it it i think that's what you're saying i would just say that money, is there right? restriction on the land preservation see, i think there's a restriction yeah. on the land preservation fund and how it can be used i don't think you can take money out of the land preservation fund and buy future rights of way so that's, I think that's a discrepancy. I, I could be wrong, but I think there's a specific limit on what, you know, on no, how. No, 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 you're, yeah. you're, you're right about that. Yeah. Well, you're, if there's restrictions on what we can use for the land preservation fund that excludes buying further right of way. Yes. Or excludes buying further easements, then that's not good. No, that, that's, that's right. And so, um, I, just, we I think we'd have to set up a new fund. Why don't we just we'll work you on it between and now the city and manager reading. can <laughs> talk about that. And, and if we leave it that way and do a new fund, we can always address it later on if we do. The, the main fine. portion of this is getting this back to the way it was. Yeah. We, we can bring that up later. And, okay. and Ron will have a fund set up within 20 minutes to a place to put it, so that's not going to yeah. be an issue. Yeah. We haven't done that in the past is what I'm getting yeah. at. Yeah. We've, that's what it's for but we don't know how much money we've accumulated over the 25 years or whatever it is that this fund's been set up for that. Unless we go back each item of vacating and figuring out how much money that we've Oh, in the past, yeah, you're right. I, That's what I'm <laughs> getting at. Let's just leave it as it okay. is for right now, and if we need to all change right. it, then we'll change it later. Um, that's all the questions I have. Are there any other uh, last, okay, is there a motion in a second? Well, we did the, we did the Public records, is there a motion and a second? I'll make a motion to approve. Second. Second. <clears throat> All right, roll call, please. Commissioner Kulias? Yes. Commissioner Eisner? Yes. Commissioner Carr? Yes. Vice Mayor Lunt? Yes. Mayor Vatikiotis? Yes. Okay. Now, we'll go back to the um, special consent. As we call all the staff back into the audience, because a lot of these things are staff, and it's Billy's coming up for the next one. Right. I will tell you, Dan, since I'm probably not going to have time at the end of the meeting, as looking at the time, but the issue of the Santos Isles and notification of management company, I can assure you it's put down on the list of things to change. But in the meantime, before that change, we will make sure. We will make sure even before that's done that the policy and I'll work with Renee on how to do it. We will make sure however we have to do it, posting things, door hangers or whatever, that we are gonna make sure until that change comes or until this board goes different that it, not only the management company, because I don't trust most of the management company, no offense anyway, um, but ones I've dealt with. So, so well, however the way, and I know it could be if it's somewhere like Riverside Apartments, a, a, a Trojan tab, but whether it's posting stuff in there or some way, we'll find some other way even before we actually change um, the documents <laughs> or, the, or the way to do it, but we'll make sure that happens so the residents are notified I think in it's the future. Only fair. Yeah, yeah I, I do too. A absolutely, absolutely. And so. that's one of the reasons I walked. So around the now area. Billy's been waiting patiently. So <laughs> turn over to oh. Billy. Oh. Well, good evening, Mr. Mayor, Commissioners. Um, I won't take but a, but a couple minutes this evening. Uh, I've presented or I put on the agenda audit number 04 2023 of the police department, uh, specifically the property and evidence. Uh, unit within the police department 
Uh, there, were, there, were no, there were no findings in the audit. Uh, there were uh, seven observations, so I won't really go into too much detail. Uh, I, I, do, I, I do want the board to know, though, uh, while this audit of the, the police department, the, the police department along with about three or four other departments will be, I don't, want, I don't want you to think this is a one audit and then we're not gonna look at the police department again. It's the police department is one of those departments that has a lot of inherent risks. So it'll be they'll be audited more often than than some other departments and than say uh, library services. So the, the the only difference is the the audit objectives will be will be different. So this audit just focused on property and evidence, um, and the reason I chose property and evidence is because it's a it's a, it's a high risk area because you you know you don't want. Uh, a police officer, you know, stealing evidence. You don't want evidence being tampered with, or, or you know, someone being exonerated, wrongfully exonerated, or wrongfully convicted because evidence was spoiled or mishandled in any way. So it's it's a high risk area, but it's an area that that can be managed through through proper controls. So uh, what what I did was I basically just just broke down the the uh, the property and evidence. Uh, process into five phases uh, intake processing storage uh, checking in and out you know as needed uh, some sometimes you, know, you check out evidence to, to go to court and then ultimately the disposal of the evidence and then I, I did an audit test uh, for for each one of those phases and and uh, in, in, in all the tests I did I there there wasn't one exception at all so um, it was about as clean of an audit as, as, as you can get so um, without going into too much detail because of the late hour, I mean, I'd be happy to answer, <coughs> excuse me, any questions that you all may have. Thank you, Mr. Poulos, for it. your consideration <laughs> of the hour as well. Um, I've, I've read your audit uh, in detail, and it, it, it's, it's excellent, so thank you for oh, that. But let me get well, to the, some of the commissioners. Vice Mayor Lund. Um, <coughs> Okay, I'm interested, I guess, more in, and when you said, well, I'm going to audit the police department, you just pick property and evidence as the highest risk area, or, I mean, with the fire department, it was personnel and time. So how, how do you make this determination? That, 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 that's a good question, actually. It's, it's the, the hardest part of, uh, of, of the job, to be honest with you, and I'm grappling with the, with the same thing right now with uh, public work stormwater. It's... Uh, there's no such thing as a, as a you know, you've, I've heard people say, uh, oh, do an audit, do a top down, you know, top, you know, from top to bottom, look at everything, blah, blah, blah. There, there's no such thing. You have to, you have to uh, come up with audit objectives, and, and I use a risk-based approach. So um, it, with, with the police department, there's no, there's no, there's no lack of, of risks, um, whether it's, it's, it's personnel, whether it's uh, equipment and, and, and asset management. Uh, property and evidence that's that's a that's a major one because of, of of all the risks there with reputational risk and it's it's if you didn't have controls with property and evidence you don't want to be on the news because a rogue police officer did something wrong or like I said earlier someone uh, someone you know gets gets uh, exonerated that was guilty because the evidence got spoiled or or the reverse happening um, so I guess to answer your question is I do kind of like a mini risk assessment for every audit and I'll you know I'll pick three or four things and then uh, I, I go from there there's some some things like uh, I also have to take into account the resources it's just me so I can only look at so many things so I, I, I hope that answers your question it's 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 difficult to, to choose in this case I chose property and evidence and uh, if you were just to Google you know police audits or something you would find most auditors do you look at property and evidence when they when they audit a police is it, department is it likely that you're going to do another audit of the police department based on something else but p and e um for oh example, yeah yeah i would y yes firearm handling or or armaments or you know whatever else the police is Absolutely, and that, that's what I was getting at. The next audit wouldn't be about property and, and evidence. It would be about, you know, like I said, asset management or, or uh, how, they're, how they're booking their hours because the way, it's just like, just like the fire department, all uh, first responders, the way they, they, their hours are calculated a lot differently than this ours. This was just not the only audit you're going to do with the police department. It was one of several. Yes, correct, you're correct, yes. That's a better way of saying it, yes. Okay, I yes. understand. Sorry, no, I, I probably got a little wordy with it. <laughs> Thanks. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, uh, Commissioner Carr. Yeah, I thought the report was well, uh, well written, and it's good to see that the that things are doing, things are being done well at the police department. So great job, Major. Keep up the great work. Thanks. Okay. Oh, I have Commissioner a question. Do you want to make should I? Why don't you go ahead and we'll go get ahead, to Mike. Vice Mayor Lund after Commissioner Kulias. Okay. Um, I read it in detail, and I was impressed with our police department, as I've always been, and I thank you. It, it, I didn't have any issues with it. Um, it was exactly as I would hope and thought it would be. Thank you. Uh, Bishop Kuyas. Uh, Mr. Poulos, it was a great audit. Uh, I No doubt property and evidence would be in uh, tip-top order, especially with operations major <laughs> right next to us. and. Uh, We'll just look, look to see in the future and just, you know, our police department's accredited and you did a good job looking over, overseeing everything and we appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you. Mr. Poulos, I, I appreciate what you do and, and um, again, you keep, continue demonstrating why we needed to have our own internal auditor here <coughs> um, in person on staff and so I really thank you for that. Um, I wanted to also give, um, if you don't mind, give Major Trill an opportunity if he's got anything yes. to say. Major Trill, do you have any comments on this? Or? Yeah, I would agree. Um, with property evidence being important for the credibility and uh, accountability. Um, but it's, I, I can't take the accolades they can give me here because it, <laughs> it falls under, uh, Casey Johnson's done a phenomenal job. Uh, Sergeant Crawford oversees it, and then it falls under uh, Frank Ruggiero. And one of the main reasons, not just the personnel, but the accreditation, um, I knew, you guys said you knew, I knew it was going to be tip top shape because of accreditation, the CFA, and that is really thanks to um, retired Chief Cochin, uh, current Chief Young, and Frank Ruggiero, who was our accreditation manager, who really not just got us where we need to be and passed it off to Mathis to carry the torch, but he really set us up as um, like a template to look at on how to do things with accreditation. So mad props out to those gentlemen and uh, Casey Johnson as well. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I, uh, I, if I could just add, yeah, Casey, I worked uh, closely with Casey and you, usually with, with audits here, I, I have access to pretty much every, anything I, I need. With the police, it's a little different because they, their, the, their uh, records management system is, is uh, it's, I guess, I don't know what the word would be. I guess partly owned by Pinellas County, so I didn't have the access to the records, so uh, I had to work closely with her, and I, I really put her through the ringer, and she, 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 she worked hard to get me what I needed, so I'd, I'd like to, to give her a shout-out as well. She's Thank you, helpful. Mr. Poulos. I, I should have gone to public comments first. Uh, are there any public comments concerning this item? Mr. Jump, are there any public comments concerning the uh, fire department, I'm sorry, police department audit? And there is no one in the queue at this time. Okay, thank you. Are there any other comments on the commission? Good. We have a uh, roll, I'm sorry, motion and a second. Motion to approve Ooh. internal audit the police department. I'll Property second. And evidence. Okay, roll call please. Commissioner Kouyas? Yes. Commissioner Eisner? Yes. Commissioner Carr? Yes. Vice Mayor Lunt? Yes. Mayor Vatikiotis? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Poulos. Thank you, Commissioners. Have a good evening. Okay, item 10, award uh, file number 230082-C-JL, purchase of vehicles utilizing source well contracts. Um, 091521-NAF and 060920-NAF, vehicles, cars, vans, SUVs, and light trucks with related equipment, accessories, and services. City Manager LaCourse. Yes, I'll turn this over to Janina to just go over this, which is obviously brought, brought up by Price, and uh, I'll let her go forward with the subject. Good evening. Um, Janina Lewis, Procurement Services Director. Uh, I'll just be pretty brief. You have the package in front of you. Basically, what you're looking at is all of the vehicles except the one um, were approved in the line item budget workshop that we held for 2023 last year, and these are the replacement vehicles that Fleet has put in the package um, for this year's buy. Uh, we do have a couple others coming along, but they aren't put together yet. Um, what we did was we took all these vehicles, and since they're all coming from Allen J, that's why they're all on this particular 
memorandum. Um, the one vehicle that was not um, in the 2023 budget was the one that was totaled and uh, the police provided a separate memo and the insurance is pretty much gonna cover the cost of that vehicle. And I'll turn it back over for questions. Okay, thank you, Ms. Lewis. Um, public comments, are there any public comments concerning this item? Here to lack is 514 Ashland Avenue. Um, I kind of want to tie it to the discussion during the consent agenda about items three and four. Sorry, say it, say it again. Well, y'all earlier had items three and four with regards to a purchase of a Ford truck and replacement OEM parts. And the discussion was about the inventory of quote unquote unused vehicles or little used vehicles. I think it's really time to get a full inventory of all the vehicles the city has, including what's in the police department. Uh, as you notice here, it does say in here in the backup, the police department will be purchasing four new Ford Interceptors uh, for $314,000, but they're not replacing anything. We're adding vehicles, so let's just clarify that. And then the uh, 2023 Chevy Silverado, it's being replaced from a Dodge Charger. So we're going from a Charger, which, let's put it this way, a 2023 Chevy Silverado 2500 HD, probably a diesel, it's gonna burn more fuel than a Charger. So we're, we're getting heavier and bigger vehicles and from my understanding, in part of the uh, backup, it's for carrying stuff around for special events and such. Whereas in the lower part, the police department purchasing two Toyota Camrys that were replacing vehicles 6552 and 6405 Dodge Chargers. So we're replacing Dodge Chargers with Camrys, but in one section, we're replacing a Charger with a big old heavy Chevy Silverado. But I, I really want to go back to the point of looking at all of the assets, and I know uh, Mr. Poulos has left, but to me that would be uh, something to see if we really have a need for all of these vehicles, because if you look between the two sections of what the police want to purchase, you're close to half a million dollars. Half a million dollars, and I don't know about you, I drive to Publix, I go to the post office, I drive down Lime Street, and I've had this question in my mind even from before. I look to the left or to the right, depending on if I'm going east or west, and I see a lot of vehicles in that police parking lot. Also, uh, maybe it has to be tied to how we utilize those vehicles. Is it one officer per vehicle? Are we no longer doing tandems? Uh, and the other thing is sometimes when I see stops, there's five vehicles with five policemen. So if you need more policemen, maybe have a couple in each vehicle so you don't need as many vehicles. I'm not to uh, here criticizing the police department in any way or their need for vehicles. It, to me, it's more of a fiscal aspect, an efficiency aspect. If we're gonna be purchasing more vehicles, we need to be looking more at hybrids and more fuel efficient, but also the actual need and usage of these vehicles. So those are a couple of the thoughts that I had with regards to this. Uh, I know it says that some of this was already approved in the budget, and to me, uh, next time you have a budget, uh, you should, before that, have some kind of inventory of vehicles, uh, as it was mentioned, you know, the year, the mileage, the amount of daily or weekly or monthly usage, so you have a better idea of what to put in your capital expenditure budget. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mayor. Um, we're, can I can make a motion to extend the meeting? Can I make a motion to extend the meeting to 11.20? Yes, that's what we need to do. Okay, I make a motion to extend the meeting to 11.20. I'll second. 11.20? 
That's not going to get us anywhere. <laughs> Roll call. Commissioner Kuyas? Yes. Commissioner Eisner? Yes. Commissioner Carr? Yes. Vice Mayor Lunt? Yes. Mayor Vaticatus? <laughs> yes. It's an interesting 20 minutes, 1120. That's good. We'll do it again. <laughs> um, Okay, so uh, that was public comments from Mr. Delacus. Uh, are there any other public comments? Mr. Jump, are there any remote access public comments concerning this item? And there was no one in the queue at this time. Okay, thank you. Um, Commissioner, comments, um, Vice Mayor Lunt. Sure, um, comments or questions? Or? E either one. Um, I just have one sort of question it's not really about the vehicles and where the costs and where they come from etc um, since we already budgeted for them I do have a question though as to whether we shopped any other contracts outside of source well we do <clears throat> but typically we tend to get the best rate from the Allen J I mean we do doesn't mean did we do that in this case no They've gone. They've they've used them in the past, and that's the one we we use chose to use this time. We did not compare on that one. All right. Thank you. Um, the source well is the one that we approved uh, about a year ago or less than that. As far as the statewide con, is that the one that we're talking about? Source well is uh, a national contract, national co-op, and it's called. Um, uh, a fleet kind of like a fleet sales and uh, the Allen J is part of that fleet sales management it was uh, it was a year ago about a six years ago I mean six months ago we had some conversation I think they're all already competitively bid within yes that. they're competitively bid before <coughs> we even reach make the decision to go to that particular contract that was brought up by me by the way that conversation on source well six months ago was it six same. months ago yeah it's my stance is the same we need to shop these contracts. We need to take a look at more than just source well. What happens is these things are bid for multiple years. Because they're bid for multiple years and nobody knows what's going on with the, the okay. economy, out two or three years, <clears throat> they do lower discounts. You can take a look at other, other contracts, Houston, has a, a fleet vehicle contract. I don't re recollect all the details off me, but there's, there are other contracts there. I think we're doing the city a disservice if we don't at least make a, a, a cursory attempt to shop this kind of stuff. We're talking about half a million dollars here. If we shaved off another 10%, that's, that's $50,000. That's another vehicle. So. Certainly. Um, I'm sorry, I know I harp on this. No, is that it? Uh, Commissioner Carr. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I, I'm in support of evaluating additional contracts that are available to the city as well, too, um, when applicable. So I think this would be an area that would apply in that as well, too. Thank you. Commissioner Eisner. I'm in agreement as well. I'd like to get more, um, more bids in. But at the same time, uh, as was said earlier, I am hoping that within the next month or so, I can get a breakdown of what we have and what we need, what we don't need, because I'll just be honest, I, I get sick to my stomach when I see these numbers. Um, you know, when I'm looking at $79,000 for a vehicle, and I don't know how often it's being used, um, or that we may have another vehicle sitting there idly doing nothing that could compensate for this. So, I mean, I'm gonna go along with it because it's, it's here, um, but I really need to have my eyes open to what we have, and I know that's not always what you do. You oh. just go for, uh, you know, newer vehicles and you upgrade it, but I need to get a full-blown figure of what we have as a city so. let, me, let me get some clarification for you um, Ms. Lewis this is not there isn't a time limit on this source well contract right it's there correct no, we, it's, we can buy them anytime yes 
I would be reluctant if you're talking about not doing this right now. Yeah, the problem is putting things on back order because these vehicles <laughs> are not available. That's like why we needed that Chevy Silverado as a single source. That truck is built. So these have to go on order. And the longer we hesitate, the price may change as well. Um, that's the an issue we've been mostly. having. Places, departments are sitting a year, yes. waiting a year and a year and a half to get um, vehicles. Um, it's an important piece of information but again, there. On, on what my charges for vehicles that I've heard in this nine months and stuff, believe me, all that and send me more. We want to make you happy because I don't want to cringe every time a vehicle comes up. <laughs> uh, like, I, like I tell my department heads, and my, we're not doing another vehicle again. So I want to get all that, everything you want to know about vehicles and stuff, I, we're going to be working together get that all to you and stuff so 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 all your concerns as we hit this next budget cycle and go um, are addressed okay go ahead. I did want to clarify I was not I know how hard it is to get vehicles I shopped around recently <laughs> it, it's you don't pick your color you don't pick your style you pick what's available and you jump on it or you don't get it well aware of that not contesting with that um, but there are other areas. In, in this market, it's easier to go from, um, from distributor or dealership to dealership than it is to just take what's available. Some vehicles are, uh, are sold over asking and some vehicles are ser you're sold under asking. It just depends availability, chips. I mean, there's so many different variables today, so I understand all that. I'm talking about um, that I'm sick to my stomach about keep seeing the vehicles and then not only are we paying a half a million dollars, but I know you're going to come before us and say it needs this maintenance and this maintenance and we keep going up and up and up and it's just no end in sight. So what I want to do is make sure that we have some logistics on how we're going to go forward, period. That's it. Commissioner Kudiaus. Uh, Janine, I only have one question. These these are scheduled uh, uh, purchases that we do every year for vehicles and for our fleets, correct? Yes. Okay, uh, I'll, I'll just make some comments in the end that are just incentive based for the police department and just everything involved with it. Thank you. Okay. Um, are there any other questions? And we're going to go to a motion and a second, then we'll get to comments if there's any comments. Make a motion okay. first. Motion and a second. Okay, we've got a motion and a second. Um, are there any commission comments? Yeah, I, I just wanted to point out that uh, you know this type of rotation of purchasing vehicles, you know, with our police department, our fire department, and stuff. It, it's actually an incentive that actually helps bring in other police officers and, and or wanting to stay here. They like newer equipment. They you know they they like to be able to drive around in vehicles. And uh, when I I discussed with um, Major Trill the the expenses with the the Ford the Ford Hybrid. Uh, uh, a lot of those recommend, recommendations was was from the Sustainability Committee to try to do some conversion and purchasing some more hybrid vehicles. So uh, those hybrid vehicles do come at a cost, and, and you know they they are the latest. But uh, this is a, a scheduled purchase that we do every year you know, for a certain amount of vehicles. Now, I'm definitely open for reviewing other contracts to see prices and getting a, a list of all of our vehicles out there just so be more organized and, um, but happy to support it. Okay, are there any comments? Um, all, all I was gonna say is that honestly, vehicles are one of the more, I mean, that my experience, city manager, commissioner, <laughs> dealing with the residents and what their observations and what they see and stuff like is one of the most frustrating things that that there are I think when the city manager provides you even the thing the list of vehicles all the vehicles that were uh, that we have in inventory when he gives you that I think you're going to be your, your your eyes are going to open up and not quite understand but they are needed and we can go to the next level as far as their usage and um, and quite frankly the time to deal with this is not when something comes forward for us to purchase but it's at the time of budget and to understand it's the same thing that we pull everything in together so hopefully by the time we go to budget 
the city manager will have provided you enough information for you to have an understanding. All I know is that this business of buying seven police cars, and I, I mean, are they addition to the police cars They're or the replacements? Explain the rotation. No, we're, we're, we're looking to get rid of the older cars. Right. And we base that on age, the mileage, and how much we put into it. Like if it's a car that costs a lot of money, we want to get rid of it, if, if the maintenance. Um, we're trying to get rid of the chargers. Um, the Chevy Silverado is, is gonna, gonna be for detective division, but um, one of the reasons we needed that is because it's gonna go to the arson investigator who keeps carcinogens in it, and you don't put that in the back of a Camry and drive around with carcinogens in it. So we needed a pickup truck. The um, Sierra, the 1500 Sierra, uh, we weren't planning on doing that, but what we talked about availability. We can't get hybrids now, and we can't get Tahoes now. Uh, until the middle of 2023 anyways, and the ones that we already ordered are gonna be late in this year. Um, so what we did was we planned on buying a truck for the special events because he's towing barricades and all that kind of stuff around, and you can't do that in a smaller car as well. Uh, and we were gonna purchase that next year, but because we couldn't, we decided to purchase it this year with a totaled out Tahoe when they rear-ended it and totaled the Tahoe on 19. Now we have that money to purchase it, so we're, we're basically flip-flopping and we'll buy an SUV for patrol next year, and we just did that this year. But that's one of the reasons why you, we, we can't get a Prius and drive around the barricade thing to take out to all the events that we have in the city, and the special events coordinator is gonna be doing a lot of that hands-on. Um, the hybrids we need to do for testing because of sustainability ask. We've had, we got a couple before for administrative, but we wanna see the feasibility and how well it works long-term for patrol and if it's gonna work out. So we need to test and evaluate those, um, but they're gonna be replacing. So when, what we'll do is get rid of the ones that we don't want anymore. Now, uh, it was brought up that you drive by the police department, there's cars in the parking lot, there's people in the police department that work that drive cars. Uh, there's also, we have to have extra because when someone's Tahoe goes down, they can't just walk to a call. So they're gonna, we're gonna have to have a fleet of backup so when cars go to the shop to get worked on or sent up to, to Chevy that are up there for a week, they need a vehicle. So we need to keep ones that the best of our lot, we try to keep there to have that. Um, we have some other ones for administrative purposes and um, for sp special details as well. Yeah. No, I, 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 that's, I, I, I mean, for me personally, I know what you do. Um, I just want to make sure we, there was some comment about their additional vehicles. I would have been surprised if we weren't sticking to no, seven No, we're looking to get rid of seven. Now, if we right. have to keep an extra one, that, but, and, but and, we're and, looking to, to replace it. And basically, it. you've got your pool. You take the best one and get rid of the worst one right. in, in the pool. That's And, the and side note, the chief is driving an old, old car. He gets a new hybrid, just for yeah. the record. Okay. Ms. Lewis, thank you uh, for the information. Um, did we have a, a motion and a second on this one? Yeah, exactly. yeah it's been motion and a second. So, yes. We had a motion and a second. Call okay, me. and that was comments, so let's have roll call. Commissioner Kouyas? Yes. Commissioner Eisner? Yes. Commissioner Carr? Yes. Vice Mayor Lunt? Yes. Mayor Vatigueras? Yes. All right, it's 1109. Um, the next item is um, yes, Tom can come up and join Janina on this one. This is the we part. Care right? of the sweeper. Okay. Number 10, purchase of vehicles. We got that one. Number 11, this is a sweeper, right? Yes. Okay. So let's go to the purchase of the street sweeper through source well contract. <clears throat> Good evening, Tom Function, Public Works Director. <clears throat> You're looking for the approval of an Elgin street sweeper to maintain the city's current FDEP requirements for stormwater operation. Uh, this is a purchase through the environmental products of Florida utilizing a source well contract 093021 ELG in the amount of $346,898. Uh, our street sweeping program is critical to keep our roads and our waterways clear of debris and trash while meeting FDP requirements. There's also a lot of annual reporting that must be completed and provide the FDP in regards to this, this uh, program. There will be two street sweepers that were sent to auction, number 5998, which is a 2010 Johnson Alonza, Alonza uh, uh, 6408, a 2014 Johnson V2651. And both these sweeper, sweepers are often are un, unusable because of general deterioration of the age, parts issues, and both have been severely past their useful life. Uh, the newly purchased sweeper will be replaced, be replacing the two that will be going to auction. Uh, 
The uh, fund's uh, super purchase will be equally split across the following accounts at $115,632.66 between general fund, sanitation, and also the stormwater. Uh, we do have another sweeper we still have, we'll have two instead of having three, so we're actually eliminating one of the sweepers that we have. Thank you, Mr. Function. Uh, does Ms. Lewis have anything to say right now? I don't think that it should be ready for questions if it has to do with the okay. first yeah. portion of it. Let's go to public comment. Uh, any public comments concerning the purchase of the street sweeper? Mr. Jump, are there any remote access comments concerning the purchase of the street sweeper? And there's no one in the queue at this time. Okay, thank you. Commission comments, Vice Mayor Lunt. Uh, yeah, not, so I'm understanding you need to uh, keep the street sweeping program up to keep the permit from the state. <clears throat> I've gotten lines. I guess I have two questions maybe. Um, is there a specific reason that we need this specific model of Elgin street sweeper? Uh, we felt it was the best one for the, the use we have over here. Yes. Uh, okay, because the reason I ask is... Sure. I kind of Googled around, you know, how I'm like, and, sure. and mm -hmm. it seems the most popular model seems to be the the Region X1. Right. And the prices for the Region X1 seem to be significantly lower than uh, the, the model we specified, which was the bare whatever. The bare one. We, the bare one we feel, this, this model here we feel is better for some of the heavy materials like leaves, uh, sticks, things like that. Huh? Some of the other ones seem to be a little better on the, on the finer points. Uh, Oh, yeah, and, this just, is a mechanical and this is a mechanical sweeper too, not, not a uh, regenerator one, which the regenerator one with the air, this uh -huh. is mechanical, so we feel much, much is more Is there a efficient. delivery date on this one? Uh, 30 days, I believe. 30 days? This one's available, yes, sir. Oh, okay. That's which is odd in this market right now, so yeah. Well, we're jumping on it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and the only other comment I've gone is, is I think I know the answer. We use SourceWell for this contract. We didn't shop any other contracts at all out there. The Elgin was, a, the, well, we can talk to that, but the Elgin was the preferred uh, one we preferred. When we already have Elgin, my mechanics are all familiar with it. It made a ton of sense, actually, and this is the best one. Well, yeah, I understand there. the Elgin is the preferred, That's but there's other contracts that have awarded Elgin as well, I think. Elgin is the only one who is uh, with a co-op, like the SourceWell contract. I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Elgin is one of the only vendors. The Elgin contract is only on the source well. So if we want to buy this Elgin oh, I see. type okay, of sweeper, so that that's how it has to be done. Huh? Okay. Out of where? Commissioner Carr. Yeah, if you thought a Silverado was expensive, this really surpasses that for sure. <laughs> um, hey, what, what's the thought process of going from three to two sweepers, Tom? Uh, of course, we're going to start. Up, we're looking at programming that we talked about, uh, changing out vehicles over here to get this in a rotation. Uh, there's no use in having three sitting there. Uh, it's, it's, it's a waste of time and money. Okay, so it's just an asset that more sat in the parking lot than actually was being used. Yes, sir. Okay, all right. Thank you. Commissioner Ashton. Thank you, Mayor. I want to read something. Um, the sweeper runs 5 a.m. Monday to Friday on Safford, Tarpon, Tarpon, Safford, Tarpon, Safford, 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 Dodecanese, um, and I could just continue to go on. They all seem to run in the CRA program area. Why are we not paying for this through some funds of the CRA? This is for beautification. In, in the past, I can answer that one. <laughs> Because in the I'm past, listening. and with past commissions, they really did not like the use of CRA funds for that sort of thing. Um, they wouldn't, you know, they wanted that preserved for more specific things, and it, it wasn't the course of that commission to be able to come forward and try to use some money for equipment like that. Now, that can change. We've got a new commission, and that can change as we approach the next budget, but, but that, was a, that was not a preferred thing of, of, of past commissions to use that CRA money for that, and that's the major reason. I haven't seen the clock sweep up anything since it's been installed. <laughs> I haven't seen the brass statues sweep up anything since those were installed. This is something what I want to I go through with this. 
I think this is a great thing to have, mm -hmm. but I think it should be supported um, for what it's used for. And it's used, I mean, if somebody tells me where it, I mean, I know it goes through residential areas as well, but I want to spend some of the money to pay for this for where it's cleaning. Okay. We need to extend the time before we continue. Motion Is there to a motion extend motion and a second to extend the time. Motion to extend the meeting till midnight. Second. Roll call, please. Mr. Uh, Commissioner Eisner seconded. Is that correct? Who I'm seconded? happy to, yes, I'll do second. second. Okay. Roll call, please. Commissioner Kuyas? Yes. Commissioner Eisner? Yes. Commissioner Carr? No. Vice Mayor Lent? Yes. Mayor Vatikiotis? Yes. Okay. Um, Commissioner Eisner, Commissioner Kuyas? I'm happy to support it. I understand we're going a little bit pricier, but I, um, if we could, if I could ask Tom, and it doesn't need to be rushed right away, if somehow we could sh uh, just share a scheduled maintenance of some of the, you know, the roads in town with the, the street sweepers or a maintenance where you have a list of certain days that are covered, the roads? Yes. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah, we have a schedule. We also have uh, a GPS on our on sweepers. So we can go every day and track exactly where they went. If we could get the them. board that list of when they're in the different areas of town and where they're at. Yeah, we have that scheduled too, yes. Yeah, because I, I get frustrated when, you know, residents will come up to us and we don't see the street sweeper. Well, I haven't seen the street sweeper in front of my house since I was a kid. That's because I was always at home when I was a kid. So, you know, uh, we just want to be able to have a, a, a rebuttal to show, hey, here's the street sweeper. These are, you know, certain days it's coming by your neighborhood and, <clears throat> and getting the job done. So that's... The, so we can also follow up our mapping. It's right online. We can go in and say it was in front of your house, whatever day it may be, or exactly what time. So. Just get that sure. get that to the board. Sure. Get that to meet us under the board. Mm -hmm. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Sir. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, I don't have any questions. And so um, are there any comments? No comments. If I could get a uh, motion. Motion approved, Mayor. Second. 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 Okay. Roll call, please. Commissioner Kuyas? Yes. Commissioner Eisner? Yes. Commissioner Carr? Yes. Vice Mayor Lent? Yes. Mayor Vatikiotis? Yes. Okay. So let's go to the attorney services. Um, we've got three of them. Um, A is approved release of request for proposals for city attorney rebid um city manager of course yes I, uh, yes we were done out of uh janina um go over uh, the new bid we're ready to send out okay um so i took from the last rfp that we sent out and uh implemented some of the suggestions that came out of the board uh after the uh, process uh, and I just want to, I'll just highlight a few, and if there are any other recommendations that you don't see that I left off, please let me know. Um, the first uh, was kind of try to provide some kind of, um, we want to kind of see them in action, so we're asking for an internet link or some kind of website address to a minimum of three meetings that they've actually had to participate in, whether it's a quasi-judicial or um, a reading or an interpretation of rules, um, so we're asking for that. Um, we're also providing the actual schedule of all the board meetings and they will be required to fill in exactly who will attend each meeting at the times and the dates. Um, we're asking for a little bit more information on their experience of doing the contracts, um, what they've done in the past 12 months. Uh, we're asking, um, you know, like what's the average time to handle certain matters um, from start to finish. Um, and you know maybe they could give us a um an idea um we're also uh requesting that um well we're not requesting but we're highlighting again that if they cannot make the second and fourth tuesday of the month that they do have the option to change that or propose the first and third uh, we're also um i don't think i have it on here but um if if a firm chooses to do kind of a joint venture or subcontract for other attorneys, you know, we're, you know, they're more than welcome to propose that and provide the um, agreement they have with the other attorneys. And we're asking that during the interview part, anyone that uh, 
could possibly represent the city they bring to the interview. And one of the slight changes at the end was uh, once we get the proposals in um, that the board, any of the board members individually can contact the references or any of the firms to validate anything that they've provided us. Uh, and from there I'll turn it back over to the, the board and if you okay. have any other suggestions or recommendations that I missed, please let me know. Thank you. Um, let's go to public comments on this. Are there any public comments on this particular item? Okay, Mr. Jump, are there any public comments concerning the uh, RFP of City Attorney Services? And there's no one in the queue at this time. Okay. Uh, Vice Mayor Lunt, do you have any questions? I'm good with this, thanks. Okay. Um, Commissioner Carr. Yeah, thanks for the changes. Uh, I think they they make sense for what we're looking for as a board uh, based on the past discussions. Uh, one of the things that I did have a question about is, so if there's more than three applicants uh, for this, uh, the procurement team would shortlist them based on a set of criteria. Am I reading that correctly? Uh, I don't shortlist. The board will shortlist. So okay. if, say we get five, five submittals. I'll send them all out to you. You rank them. And then from your rankings, um, I'll determine which made the top three and give that back to you before I send it out and say, here's the top three out of all of your rankings. Here's who would make the short list. Okay. But so if we only get four, then there's no, it, it, there's really no point to short list. I mean, it, four to three is an acceptable short list. Okay. Yeah. I just want to make sure because number three talked about that. Um, oh, okay. I'll, I will. So the top three it. law firms will be required to, I just, if there's some flexibility there, I just want to make sure that it's understood. So, thanks for bringing us back and working on this. Okay. Um, Commissioner Ashton. No question. Commissioner Kulias. Uh, just uh, thank you for the changes. And, and if I could ask uh, Janina, our city manager, just uh, try to look at different avenues and, and posting this request, this RFP, and, and try to hit some of the biggest firms and, and municipal government there is. And that's. My only request. <coughs> Thank you. That is on my list. Yes. Uh, Lewis, I have a couple of questions on the um, on the uh, uh, RFP concerning the uh, provide an internet link website address to a minimum of three uh, current or past city publicly recorded meetings. Um, is that the attorney that would be sitting with us, I guess, for example, um, and the city attorney services would also be uh, not with just us, but with the various boards as well. And um, for me personally, I don't think I'd need to have three videos of the same attorney. I, I would rather have a video of each, a video of each of the attorneys that we would be that would be utilized in whatever capacity, whether it's sitting here at the DAOS or PNZ Board, Board of Adjustment or, or something. I mean, I'm, I'm a pretty quick study of seeing how that person operates over a, a two or three hour meeting that would satisfy me, but I also wanna make sure that um, whatever other attorney that they would be proposing for city attorney services, um, we have a look at as well from the PNZ perspective. Okay. So that, that's number one. And then the other thing too is, um, I was kind of curious, um, the average um, cycle time per matter, the time it takes to handle a legal matter from beginning to end, is that something that you got from somewhere that? It was, I was doing a little bit of research on uh, different things that uh, you may want to look at. We don't have to include no, no, it, no, but I, it might just, be something I mean, that I might just, interest you if it's a litigation matter or something that occurs, like maybe it's a an arbitration matter that we ask them to handle. Or just yeah, a, no, that's okay. I just wanted to make sure. Um, you know, I know it's a it's it's kind of an innocuous sort of thing, and sometimes things go well, sometimes they don't go well, and. Um, but it's okay to include that, I guess. Um, the one thing I, I don't want to wind up doing is, is making some of this stuff so challenging to answer that we discourage um, applicants as well. So I'm not, hmm. you know, for me, if this is something that you've seen in a number of um, RFPs, I, I think it's fair enough to leave it in there. If it's something that 
may sound like an, uh, you know, a good idea, may have picked it up in one, but several others that you've looked at don't include something like this. I'm not so sure that we would need that either. So um, that would be uh, my only observation here. So. That Mayor Fike, I've never seen that before. You've never seen it before? Uh, it, it, because that's exactly what you said, yeah. which is, I mean, I could, I could tell you a situation that, that was resolved real quickly, and then there's others. I mean, they all go it on. It goes own, on for right. a couple of years. I, right. I understand that. Um, and this position is it really for litigation? It's so. Would you be more handling? How long does it take somebody to draft a, a contract? You know, I'm. I mean, I think. Right. For this position, that's more in, important. Yeah. Uh, turning something around on a contract, turning around uh, an opinion letter, things like that. Right. If um, we've got consensus, the rest of the board on those two things you mentioned, we have consensus on that for her. To, to take that out. That one and the first, the first. To item make you the change on the first. Yeah. Thing. Yeah. Um, I mean, we can include that in the motion if you want. We to accept it with the okay. condition that we eliminate the one. Eliminate the one, and then only want one for the vi one video for one each. One for each of the attorneys. And make, to make that approval when you when you go to for the motion to put that in there to adjust. Okay. That's all I have um, as far as the observations. Uh, but thank you, Ms. Lewis. I know it's uh, <laughs> it's a it's a difficulty to try and get something like this out and published. Um, no, she's done a great she's done a great job watching her through all the process uh, from start to finish. She's yeah. done a great job. You know, she worked very hard. A great job and a lot of patience putting. Yes, yeah, a lot of patience. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. Um, may I have a motion and a second, please? Uh, motion to approve with uh, without or excluding the average cycle time per matter, the time it takes to handle a legal matter from beginning to end, and to only provide a minimum of one internet link and website address for, attorney. for each attorney that for each would, attorney. Uh, that would be utilized in city in the city boards and things. Second. Yes, that was a second, Commissioner Carr. All right, roll call, please. Commissioner Cuyas. Yes. Commissioner Eisner. Yes. Commissioner Carr. Yes. Vice Mayor Lunt. Yes. Mayor Vatikiotis. Yes. yes. Okay. Now, item B uh, is the um, trying to. Got all this stuff screwed up. Um, award RFP number 230040-P-JL Litigation Attorney Services Agreement. And that agreement would be with um, uh, Mr. Salzman sitting to my right. Um, Ms. Lewis. Uh, yeah, so for this particular award, uh, we went back to Eunice Salzman Jensen. Um, we basically already had their proposal in hand, uh, what they suggested and what the board came back with was that uh, they were willing to do the hourly rate. Um, the hourly rate proposed was 175, so that's what we agreed upon. Okay. Um, public comments, are there any public comments concerning the litigation attorney services? Mr. Jump, are there any remote access comments? And there is no one in the queue at this time. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Comments, Vice Mayor Lunt. Oh, um, hang on a second, just before we get into that. Um, Mr. Salzman, if I may ask you to give us a, um, on to Ms. Lewis's point, I remember in your RP it was like 6,000, a retainer of about 6,000 a month, is that correct? Right, we would, and well, then, and I think and, uh, when I talked to the board, and, and we just you, pulled a number out of, no, no, it, on, so that is not the number. It's just straight at a at $175. And, an and hour. that was also based. You were okay with that, based on the amount of uh, litigation that right. you saw right, right. now. Okay. And, and again, I don't see a lot. Of, there's not a lot of litigation going on. Uh, oh. uh, okay. Right. <laughs> now, um, the other thing too is, and is, is I want us to think about this. I went back and listened to the October 11th. Um, public meeting where we got this approved. Uh, Commissioner Carr, um, and there was a little bit going back between myself and Commissioner Carr as far as clarification, as far as the litigating, litigation attorney being independent of the special counsel, 
and that that litigation attorney was going to um, focus on Anclote Harbor. So um, we've got the city attorney services that are being rebid. The RFP that went out, and it may have not been written as specifically with Anclote Harbor, but I, I think as Mr. Salzman could tell you, there isn't a whole lot going on with, uh, at least as of right now, with Anclote Harbor. Right, that is correct. Right. So I, I think that the, when we do our motion, and I know you have been using Mr. S City Manager, of course, has been using Mr. Salzman on other litigation that we have, but that was under the interim contract, interim right? The contract for city attorney, yeah. So, and then Commissioner Carr brought up the fact that our charter says, you know, the, the city attorney is going to be doing everything. And then I also got an opinion from another attorney says that you could have an assistant city attorney um, for litigation. In other words, that would get us out of this sole thing. So my point is, when we're approving this agreement, we need to approve it for based on what the original motion was to go out. We need to approve it for a very specific purpose. To me, I don't, it, it's up to the commission with what they want to do. But if we approve the litigation attorney services agreement as it was, the motion was made, it would be for Anclote Harbor. There isn't a whole lot going on. I, I guess Mr. Salzman would be okay for that. But it doesn't solve Mr. Uh, City Manager LaCourse's uh, thing with some of the other lawsuits that we've got going on that are not part of the Florida League of Cities, right? It, it would under the temporary. It would you want to continue that? I can continue. Uh, I mean, my idea was to continue those yeah. services then under the temporary insurance. Then that solves it. Yes. Okay. May, Mayor, right. sorry, did the motion we made can address that one council? issue uh, that that was asked about city attorney being the one who has to defend everything right um, and the charter language while the charter language isn't that clear I want I want the Commission to understand that as a matter of fact you have if you followed the charter language the way it's read you couldn't even have your insurance company provide you right. uh, an attorney so that when we've looked at these, and I did some research on it, not a lot, but I did some research on it, and as you're well aware that a lot of times under the, under the city attorney, you get a law firm. Um, you can get a city attorney, you can have them um, contract with another group, and that falls under city attorney. There is nothing, in, and while your charter and your code basically are hand in hand in language, there's nothing that prevents you from having multiple uh, city attorneys, which is what you've For done different times, in yeah. the past. Yeah. Um, because otherwise, as I said, then the league couldn't provide you an, an attorney. Your city attorney would have to provide you all the uh, insurance defense or they'd have to oversee everything. And that's certainly not the past practice here. Okay. Um, so I, so I think you're okay with what you're doing. No, that's fine. I, but I just wanted to make sure that, um, you know, we understood what we were approving tonight is for a litigation attorney for the Anclote Harbor. Um, that wasn't my understanding. I, but that's what the motion was when. I, I believe the, uh, I may be confused, but the RFP was for litigation attorney. For any litigation that wasn't covered by insurance. That was my understanding. That was my understanding. And if that's the case, then that's the motion we make. But the, you go back to your motion for October 11th, it was very specific because I, I was a little confused because I, I wanted, we haven't had a separate a litigation the attorney. Motion. The only reason we've decided to have a litigation attorney was for the independence of the special counsel. And that initially we thought maybe the special counsel would litigate anything that may have come out of that investigation, if there's anything. I'm not so sure, we'll see what happens. But the city attorney that we has always litigated whatever issues there have been, whether it's whole house foreclosures and those that get challenged, and then we have the Florida League of Cities as our insurer. That's who is litigated for us. The independent litigation was the fact that um, we wanted to insulate the city attorney from Anclote Harbors because that seemed to be an issue because we were using the same law firm that was dealing up here for us, advising us on Anclote Harbor, they were 
litigating as well on Anclote Harbor, and then also the special counsel because they wouldn't be an independent. I'm just explaining it. The commission, as far as I'm concerned, I'm okay with it either way as long as we need to make sure that whatever we make a motion to tonight is very clear as far as how Mr. Salzman is going to be operating in the, you know, in the future, so that's all. The, the previous motion that was made and, and accepted, do we have a copy of that motion? No, because the minutes, the, because the minutes, the I'm minutes. I'm not sure whether it's specific to Anclote or not. It is. Um, I mean, it, I'd listen to it a couple of times, but we don't have the minutes um, published, and you won't have that as an official record until those. Is that? I mean, that's correct. Is that right, Ms. Jacobs? Yeah. So the only thing we have right now is the video. Well, to then go I to. suggest we table. And that's okay. I mean, my point is, I'm, I I just want to clarify this, that that was the intent of the litigation. A, a attorney was for the Anclote Harbor um, uh, concerned citizens and also the Colson case. And then Mr. LaCourse was using Mr. Salzman for other things that were coming up as well as the Anclote Harbor until we got a, a litigation attorney on board. If the commission wants to utilize a litigation attorney for all litigation, that's fine. But that needs to be clear. All I'm saying is that that's, we're departing from what the traditional city attorney has done in the past. That's all. I, can I, Mayor? Yeah. It, and I'd have to go back and watch the video too. Um, I, I thought we were focusing on hiring a litigation attorney for all litigation and then the special counsel would be separate for the investigation. So that was my understanding. That's what's mine. You, I, I think maybe Mr. Salzman can help in this regard. When you take, you take the, um, um, and, and, and I guess maybe there's some advantage to doing that, but traditionally the city attorney uh, has not necessarily litigated the case themselves. The city attorney has utilized the litigation. You know, they've they've gone and either subcontracted or something a litigation attorney because they specialize in in that uh, court. And then there's uh, uh, you know, and, and and that's just the way it's worked. And Trask Dagnall, they, Mr. Trask was our city attorney. Right. Mr. Dagnall was a litigator, I would suspect is his background, or, yes. and, and he litigated, and all that legal work was contained within Trask Dagnall. When we wound up getting into these emails and things like that, um, we recognized that that may not be too good to have a city attorney involved if this Anclote Harbor litigation was going to persist mm -hmm. because of the same reasons. In other words, the city attorney involved in the Anclote Harbor litigation for the same reasons why, you know, we, we had the issue with the Anclote Harbor being litigated by the, uh, by the city attorney. So we wanted to make that independent until the special counsel got completed. And then it was the same thing with the, um, um, with the um, uh, special counsel, uh, there was some discussion of using the special counsel. Not, I think that was uh, Commissioner Carr's original assumption if you look at the video. And I said, no, the, then the special counsel wouldn't be independent. That's why we needed a separate litigator. But I just wanted to point that out to the commission tonight. I'm, I'm, we're spending an awful lot of time on this, but I just want to make sure that you all understood that. When you go back to the, because I, I just want to make sure we don't have an issue with this later as far as how we hire, how we utilize our attorneys in the future. Um, and that whoever we hire as a city attorney, um, you know, I, I don't know their, what their sense is gonna be if they're not involved in or having any say on the litigation, I guess is what I'm getting at. It, it, yeah, Mayor, if I ahead. could respond, because having looked at everything that you all provided, when I applied, it was my understanding as, as was just mentioned that 
the RFP was for litigate that you were going to have a separate litigation attorney for to cover all litigation that wasn't covered by the league. Mm -hmm. That's how the RFP came out. You were going to have a city attorney uh, that was going to cover all the other things that a normal city attorney does. I mean, is it unique to this city? It could be, but you have a lot of meetings, for example. And one of the issues that came up when I applied for a city attorney is who's going to cover the meetings that I can't cover, right? And so my, the way it came across to me was that you needed to make sure that whoever you had as city attorney was either going to be a firm or an association of attorneys so that all meetings could be covered and could deal with the right. daily things because you have a lot of issues. Um, the litigation attorney, the way I understood it, was just separate for all litigation that would not be covered. And, uh, and, well, and the only thing that would, I would tell you is that yeah, I'm a little unique in that I'm a litigator who, who also serves as a city attorney. A lot of times you'll have somebody like Mr. Trask who only does city attorney and doesn't litigate and, and he'll tell you that he doesn't. So they happen to have that in his firm. You could do it by, I've seen it by association also. But, but clearly my understanding was that it was for litigation of any and, matter that wasn't covered. And, by and the that's league. okay. I just wanted to I just, make I just wanted that, that was just how I thought all the applicants saw it. And that's may have been the way we did the RP, and that's fine. And I just want to make sure that, that when we move forward, that's the understanding, and we make that part of the record that that's the understanding. Um, and that's all I wanted to say. My understanding <laughs> reflects Andrew's understanding of it. Yeah. I thought he was going to do all litigation, and the city attorneys were going to do board coverage and and uh, well when we ordinance when we, stuff when we did so the forth. selection if you go back and we did the and you we did the selection um, if you recall I wasn't convinced that given the amount of litigation that was ongoing and this was specific to Anclote Harbor that we needed a separate litigation attorney this was when we did our selection of litigation attorneys but I went ahead and went along with that just because this is what the commission wanted to do. And I think as Mr. Uh, Salzman also made the observation, there just wasn't a whole lot of litigation going on right now. And so, um, uh, you know, we had the Anclote Harbor, what's the three cases going on right now? Three other cases that are very minor. Yeah, I know um, what we're doing. So anyway, I just wanted to point that out to you all. And I think that was the basis of backing off that, uh, the, the, um, retainer approach and going right. straight it, to the it's just it, and i think i said it you it said makes that, no yeah. sense right. to pay uh, okay. a retainer okay. well, is the record showing that mr salzman is doing all of our litigation is that He's, my understanding I, currently i'm handling any litigation that's not handled by the league but i as i've updated the commission really i think there's okay our litigation yeah, that's not handled by the league of right. cities right. etc which is what i meant yeah, is there just correct? isn't a lot. Um, I think if you saw the last, uh, was it the email that you sent out that there was a whole lot going on with concerned citizens right now? Either. No, there's so, not. Okay, no. but that's all. That, that's, I just want to make sure that that was clear to everybody and when we make the motion, if we can include that in there, that that's what the intent is to utilize Mr. Salzman for all litigation, that's fine. Okay. So, I mean, I, I just want to point that out. Um, so that was, my comments, right? Help me out a little bit. So we did through the public, we did the public comments, commission comments, and now we need a motion no, and a we, second. I, Do you we have didn't comments? Get to, yeah, I think you got the vice mayor and I don't think it got past that. I didn't pass comments. you. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Um, so a couple of Oh, things. yes, you're right. You're right. I wanted to inject based on what you said. I'm, I apologize. Go ahead. Yes, okay. Uh, just there. a couple of things in the, in the agreement itself. Um, to note, there's this public meeting held on blank 2022. Uh, that date's going to need to be updated. And also, from a rate standpoint, um, there's 175.00. Uh, it also has a cross out through it, um, just from a formatting standpoint. So, if someone could actually write out $175 per hour, uh, that would also, I think, be best practices, um, just so there's no doubt if there was a copy of this or if it gets back from blue to to, to um uh, so the black that, that you understand oh, yeah, it's 175 yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. per hour he's, we'll clear he's, that mr saucer's we'll working for free <laughs> 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 uh, 
not tech, tech when we have the sign <laughs> yet, right? So, <laughs> yeah, and then we'll, the, the full we'll intent that. is that my understanding is, and it may have gotten convoluted in, in our last when we That's approved fine. it, but the, the intent was to hire him as a full litigation for all aspects. Okay. I'm sort of confused, but uh, that's okay. <laughs> um, so, would then the special counsel take the litigation on that? Yeah. Okay. So, you're handling that. I got gotcha. you. Okay. Mr. Salzman's handling yes. it. Yes. Yeah. Okay. That's what I was curious. So, I have no further questions on it. Okay. I'm okay now. Yeah, the whole idea was um, the special counsel is going to take eight months, and the whole idea was to uh, get the city attorney on board. That was my oh. premise, to get the city attorney on board. Then we would deal with the litigation attorney, but then we went ahead and uh, uh, you know, awarded the RP to Mr. Salzman. And we're here, and I, I just at my trying to cross T's and dot I's, I wanted to look at the record, uh, the video record, to see exactly what we had authorized the RP to be for, so, and share that with you. Well, it was just, it was giving me the idea that it was a t on a temporary basis, so I wanted to make sure that it's not on a temporary basis. It's that, not a temporary okay. basis. No, this is a, a permanent, uh, and, and, a, and it is um, a three year um, Three year contract. Two years with one renewal. But it could be terminated. What, Ms. Yeah. Lewis, we put that in there, didn't we? The terminated with what? Was it a 90 day notice or? Yes, okay. 60 to 90 days. Okay. Commissioner. Of, uh, you're right, Mayor. Two Commissioner Kulias. Uh, I'd just like our vote to be for all litigation services. Okay. Any other? Go ahead. Can, see two things. One, can we make sure we change the signature block because because this involved Angle Harbor too? We need to change it to the to the approval for the for the mayor to sign instead of city manager to sign. And I was looking for where is that term? I don't see the 90 days in here. I know this contract's got to be fixed up and formalized, and then before you sign. But help me, Janina, with the uh, it should the 90 days. I don't it's see not it on there. Be. We should add that. That should be in there. And then you have another issue where it's five and five. The term and termination is five, and insurance is number five as well too. So there's a typo. Oh, no, yeah. for a formatting issue there. No. I don't think anybody's found it. The yet. number five is a term and termination. That's where that would. That's where it should be. But it's not there. No, it, it just talks about this agreement is terminable at will by either party. No, we do not have it in the agreement, but it is in the RFP, which is attachment to the agreement, but I can put it in the final. I mean, the whole thing needs to be cleaned up, and, yes. and it, this is the form is used, but it's got to have all those fill-ins that everybody talked about, so I just yes, want to make sure Yes, we have to sure correct that, the dates. And, and he can make sure everything's in the thing approved. Well, as, as acting city attorney, I'll, I'll help that. Yes, <laughs> yes, in your capacity there, yes, thank you. And the 90 days was because we couldn't live with it. Was it the 30 days? days was the original? No, that's what we're saying. It's yeah. supposed to be in there. It was in the RFP. I, I mean, Mayor, I think 90 I days makes it. sense to have on, on there for a clear. Yeah, obviously, so, you so can see how a much of an issue it's been the for the termination notice. That 90 days, I think, <coughs> needs to right. be in there. Yeah, the 90 days, I, uh, Ms. Lewis said that that had to. I don't know whether you, she said it publicly, but she said it to me that the 30 days was what the original. Uh, wasn't it Trash Dagnall was 30 days, yes. right? right. That's and a, that that's caused the issue. That's not an that's time we were going to up it to 90 days. It was 30 days with an additional 30 days if everybody agreed, but there wasn't any agreement on that. So, okay. okay. Um, all, okay. all attorneys would be 90 days from here. Yes. It should forward. be 90 yes. Minimum. Yeah. Can I make a motion? Yeah, can I make a motion to approve this? Yes. Uh, with adding the termination language of a 90 day notice. Uh, by either party, um, and then the Salzman group will be handling all litigation services for the city of Tarpon Springs. Second. Second that. Okay. Roll call, please. Commissioner Cuyas? Yes. Commissioner Eisner? Yes. Commissioner Carr? Yes. Vice Mayor Lunt? Yes. Mayor Vatagiotis? Yes. Thank you. Although I think we should. All right, now the last one. Sorry, I forgot.
is the uh, special county, not special county, special <laughs> council <laughs> attorney services agreement, uh, item 12C. Um, Ms. Lewis. Yes, this is the uh, special council attorney. Uh, I spoke with Carlton Fields, Adam Schwartz, and he has put together um, an engagement letter. Uh, when I spoke to him, they also agreed to waive some of the, like, the travel costs. Um, the fees you do see in there are the fees for the attorneys. Um, they are also, in his engagement letter, he also needs to send me an updated engagement letter. Um, they agreed to remove the, um, they wanted a prepayment, um, and they've agreed to waive that for us. So there's no prepayment required, which would kind of be a retainer. They're not asking for that. Um, second is the payment terms under Section E in his, um, the engagement letter terms. They're going to remove the 15 days to resolve questions. They're going to change that to 30 days because I had to explain to them that, you know, if we get the bill at the end of the month, we don't have a board until the second Tuesday of the month. That gives me like 14 days to get something to you guys then to get it resolved. Um, so they're going to extend that to 30 days. Looks good. And then they did agree to the cap of 160, and that is all that I have on that particular contract. I mean, other than this one, the agreement will have to be updated as well with the signatures, the years, and all the terms, but yes. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Lewis. Are there any public comments? Mr. Delacus, you've been sitting there patient. Well, Peter Delacus, 514 Ashland Avenue, I wasn't going to comment on the other one because it seemed pretty uh, explanatory that it was for litigation services but uh, when I made my public comments you made a statement with regards to getting an update uh, all I heard from right. you asking Mr. Salzman there's not much going on well we know there's not much going on because the court denied your petition so I would have thought at this point in the meeting or somewhere along the line the board would either be directing Mr. Salzman to file an appeal or making a decision as to whether to file an appeal or to determine as to how to proceed to go forward uh, so we're in the kind of in the dark here as to what the city is planning to do next with regards to your request for a stay uh, pending the results of the investigation uh, where that stands. Mm -hmm. And I know it's tied to this with the Carlton Fields based on getting your report back from your investigation, but in the meantime, uh, as I mentioned, we are going to be filing an appeal uh, to the second district and it would be wise if you are going to continue uh, your previous uh, determination of filing a stay that at least you advise the second district court of what has occurred uh, with regards to special counsel and your investigation so it just sort of trying to get a little clarity as to where the city of Tarpon Springs will proceed with regards to their particular motion being denied. Thank you. you no, know, thanks for bringing that up. Uh, we'll try and pick that up at um, at the end of the meeting with comments, and uh, it shouldn't take too long from now. Um, any other public comments, uh, Mr. Jump? Are there any remote access comments? And there is no one in the queue at this time. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Vice Mayor Lund, do you have any questions? There's no 90-day term and termination in this contract either. It, do we need that, or it's at will right now? This so contract, okay, in all of the RFPs, they do get attached to the agreement, and they become part of the agreement with those terms in there. But this particular special counsel attorney is pretty much as long as we need it. But yeah, I understand, <coughs> but what if they decide they don't want to do this anymore, and they just leave and then we have to get another special counsel or yeah yes you would have to go back out and like repeat the entire process entire, <laughs> that are entirely at will walk out the door the, let me just um, it, the answer is yes and um, I'm not sure what the circumstances would be for that to happen but you never know but the answer would be right. yes. the problem I'm sorry the problem vice mayor would be if you kept them on for 90 days 
and they wanted to terminate anyway, no, they, would they wouldn't do anything. anything. And so, you know. Understood. <laughs> Makes sense. I have no other questions. That was Commissioner Carr. Thanks, Mayor. Uh, so from a term standpoint, it's a two-year contract with an um, additional one-year um, renewal option. Uh, that seems much longer than the anticipated, I forget how many months it was, but I think the goal was to have it wrapped up within eight months, eight months or so. Yeah, that's what their estimate was um, as well. So to have a term in there maybe of a year, uh, at most, but then the goal should be eight months to have it wrapped up. Really, should be a in the agreement itself. Um, and then there's there's terms that there's a lot of terms and conditions, standard terms and conditions that Carlton Fields has. I'm assuming they're wanting those added in the agreement as well too. Yes. Um, <coughs> hopefully, our city attorney has been able to review those. And then also the the items that you called out as well too. Hopefully, those are called out and in an exhibit somewhere. We're not going to be traveling for. Or not going to be charging for traveling, et cetera. Uh, so just a couple additional cleanup items, I think, uh, in this area uh, of this pending agreement. Should be spelled out in the new agreement that they're mm -hmm. right. Uh, I do want to say, though, on the, um, the length of the term, the reason we went for the two years was, it, and, and, you know, it's strictly the board's decision, but if something else occurs in the findings of this matter that then precludes to another situation that you may need them for a longer period of service, we wouldn't have to keep renewing their contract. So I'm just putting that back out there for you. Um, I just want to, it just seemed odd, that's all, based on that. Um, we can, we can. Yeah, I. Mayor, I'll, I'll make a motion to extend the meeting till 1210. Till when? 1210. 1210, that's good. Second? Is there a second? I'll second. Roll call, please. Commissioner Kulias? Yes. Commissioner Eisner? Yes. Commissioner Carr? Yes. Vice Mayor Lunt? Yes. Mayor Vatikiotis? Yes. Um, any other comments? Commissioner Eisner? Yes. Hi, Janina. I wanted to ask you, um, the way I understood it, um, 160000 was an estimate. It wasn't a lock-in. So are you saying now that they're locking into that being the max? It's a not to exceed. Yes, well, that's what that means, not to exceed. That is what Carlton Fields uh, is capping it at. They're okay. agreeing not to exceed $160,000. Okay, because I also thought that they, in the discussion when uh, Mr. Schwartz was up, he had said something about negotiating the um, his rate. That was not in the discussion, I presume. No, he kept the rates as is. And I believe that was part of the terms that he sent over. Do we need to move the time? It, 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 12.10. 12.10. We've gone to 12.10. We're all getting a little punchy. Was that brought up at all? Uh, yes, I, I tried. Uh, I discussed with him. I said, let's talk about rates. Uh, I was trying to get... Uh, the rates lowered and also trying to get, if he's gonna have two attorneys in the room at one time, one, one rate for one attorney, uh, but they did not waver on those. <laughs> but yet, when he was here, he did discuss that. What he said he would agree to eliminating was some of the travel fees and some of the incidental costs. Okay. I just, I heard something different, that's all. Okay, well, I, I, can, I can go back and look, and, and when I speak with them again and get the updates, we can try one more time. Um, but for now, this is what he gave me back. Well, I, I just remember his, uh, it was just a, a guesstimate, because it was my question. I asked how much he thinks this would, could come out to, and he said, yeah, I would say about 160000 and that uh, being a guesstimate turns into a hard figure. Um, that's that's just a cap. I mean, that doesn't mean they're gonna spend all that money. It'll depend on the time and effort and the hours spent for each individual piece that they're doing. 
Well, at $1,000 an hour or about, that 160 will come before you know it. That's all. I, I just thought there was going to be some room for that as well. But if you would like to relay that message I to will. me, I would be happy to. I will, I will get back with Adam. Yes. Okay. No, I, I was going to ask the question about the, the two attorneys working together, so we got that straightened out. Uh, uh, they've done some negotiating with Janina, and we know this is going to cost money, guys. We're, we're in deep at this point. Let's, you know, get this search Not going yet. and put it behind us so we can move forward with the city business. Thanks, guys. I, yeah, I, I mean, bottom line for me is that We've done an awful lot of talking about this. I think that there's a, you know, there's always a lot of questions that came out of the last two years. Uh, and the only way we're going to get answers to these questions is to get somebody like Car Carlton Fields to look into it. Um, if we would have gotten something with a lesser capability, I think that at the end of the day, at the end of the investigation, if we were to call it that, there still may be questions as far as whether everything was, was done. And I think that, um, I don't wanna say you get what you pay for, but it, it's, it's something that we need to do thoroughly and we need to do it once, put it, whatever happens, if something, more work comes out of it, okay. If no work comes out of it, we learn something out of it, we get policies in place and then just, I think the city is gonna be much, much, much better. Any way you look at it, the city is gonna be much better off. I agree. So, okay. Um, with, are there any other comments? There, yeah, go there's, ahead. There's no more going back and negotiating prices. We're agreeing to this and we're moving forward, right? Ms. Lewis can ask, um, <laughs> and I'm not sure what the answer would be other than, you know, it is what it is. So um, uh, what you're saying is if, if, we, if they don't, I mean, I, I'm, I don't want to, is there any more that you want to get to in that regard? I'm, I'm ready to be set on the price as, and just move forward. Okay. That's what you're saying. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I agree with that too. I, you can ask, but you know, the idea is to get on with what we need to do. We've got a special session workshop on uh, Next January week. 17th. Next Tuesday. Yeah. Yeah. So they, they need to be there. <laughs> yes, uh, they will be there and they will go into more in depth about this engagement letter and what's it's five attorneys and six okay all righty um <laughs> if there's no other comment um, we have a motion not yet right motion in a second please motion to approve as written second okay roll call mr Kuyas. yes mr eisner yes mr carr no vice mayor Lett? yes Everybody yes. All right. It's 12:04. Um, we're going to go to comments right now. Uh, Major Trill, anything? Uh, Tiffany went well. Thanks for everybody that came out and uh, helped out. MLK Day Parade is the 14th, uh, Saturday at 10 a uh, 11 a.m. Uh, although the day of observance on the 16th, our parade is on the 14th. Make sure you come out to that. And also during this time, we've had a lot of off-duty special events, all the stuff that goes on during the holidays. I want to give a shout out to uh, Sergeant Mathis, who did a great job with that epiphany, everything else, the Christmas parade and everything else that's going on. And also a shout out to all the officers that have worked these details and staffed these details to make sure it's safe, that are working extra when they're uh, during the holidays as well. So mad props to them as well. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Stausman, I'm going to ask if you can give us a summary on the litigation and what our options are as far as the um, uh, stay pending. Yeah. Yeah. Um, as, as the board knows, um, the stay was denied. At this point, until we have some um, actually concrete findings, I'm not recommending that we refile the stay. I, it's, we don't have grounds to appeal it right now. It, it would be nothing more than useless um, so I want to I'm hoping that we'll get some information from the special counsel as soon as we get that information then I can have grounds to file a stay because um, the way and when I did the research on it from a factual standpoint we notified the court of the investigation that was going on um, there's not law necessarily to support that until we find something to give them a reason why 
this will affect the litigation. It's speculative right now. Um, so would it be a refiling or would it be yeah, an we, appeal? We can file a, you can file a stay at any time. Okay, but yeah, not an appeal. A, it, would be new, it would be new grounds. New, okay, new yeah. grounds, okay. Um, and as far as the litigation with the concerned citizens, well, if they're appealing uh, that that you know that stay, then that will come forward, and that and that'll be continuing on the litigation. Other than that, there's not anything pending. Other than we know that um, right now the developer doesn't have all their permits in place, and right. so they but, can't move forward. But if they, but given that the, uh, I, I want to for the purpose of the commission, I don't want to run out of time, but. If concerned citizens did not do anything, then our stay pending the outcome of the litigation would be moot. Is that correct? It would be moot until we have another reason to file a stay. Which would be a st okay. Down the road, yes. Right. As soon as we get something from but if, they, but if, if concerned citizens files a, a, another action, then that stay pending the end of the legal proceedings with regard to the permits is still alive and that if Carl, if it, uh, if they can keep, right, if they file an appeal, they would be filing an appeal of the denial of the rehearing and the stay. Okay, and then if Morgan Group comes back and wants their permit, then we would have to reconvene. Right. And as we said, we would right. do. Right, and we would, honestly, at this point, from a, uh, a litigation standpoint, we just need to see how things play out and then bring it back before the board. This commission. This, this okay. board. All right, thank you. Um, City Manager McCorris. No, I'll bow to the time, so nothing. Do nothing. I have no um, comments. Okay. Vice Mayor Long, do you have call a comment? Call out of here. Commissioner Carr. Happy New Year. <laughs> no comments. Right. Happy New Year. The epiphany was uh, the end of the holiday season in Tarpon Springs, and time to roll up our sleeves and get back to work. <coughs> thank you, Mayor. Okay, I've got, um, I'm hoping I can get this done in two seconds. Um, we've got the special council workshop on January 17th. Um, and also, um, I've asked the city, actually, uh, Commissioner-elect Kulianis approached you for uh, being able to have a say during that meeting as well, right? Yes. And so I just wanted to, um, make that known to this commission that that would uh, occur that's in uh, allowable under our rules of procedure so that that's going to happen um the um Commissioner Lecturian, pardon me say during which meeting our workshop meeting the, the workshop <coughs> on the special council on the 17th next week on tuesday okay. he, he'll be a commissioner april in april there and will be uh on board for most of the special yeah that's true so okay. yeah um, if I can just extend it for five minutes, and let me finish up here. Can, Most can motion motion to extend it for five minutes. Second. That'd be to 12:14, certain. A second. Okay. Roll call, please. Commissioner Kulias. Yes. Commissioner Eisner. Yes. Commissioner Carr. No. Vice Mayor Lund. <laughs> yes. Mayor Vasquez. Yes. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk to the commission about was um, we um, a special session on projects. Um, if you go through the projects, say I had a conversation with the city manager. There's a number of projects that I'm beginning to get a little. I, I've got questions on. It's getting to the point where I've got a little. Um, I, I don't understand, and I think we have to have that conversation more of a prioritization. We didn't add anything on there to allow some of these things to get out of the way. Um, the one example I'm gonna give you, if you look at your project update, the um, uh, MLK Spring Boulevard intersection is 59% complete. Um, I think if you go back and listen to some of the meetings, um, we got the impression that we would either be, we would have bid documents about this time, <coughs> and, and not this time, but later in January and February. I don't see that happening with 59% design complete and and it's okay except for the fact that we need to have that intersection done when Before they start the putting barricades in to start working on the bridge city manager understands that there's another issue with gross avenue we really need to come to closure on that thing either 
you know, go out to bid again to finish the work and then sue the bond company, I have no idea. But we need to have a conversation on that rather than just kind of sitting that and, and keeping it band-aided at the expense of the, um, um, of the residents. So there's several of them like that, and I want to find out whether you have an interest of having a, um, and I think it would be a special session because I think we need to vote on a, on a priority um, unless you think a, a workshop would be it better. Can, it can be either, well, I was thinking workshop, but we can workshop do it. Workshop is way. fine then. Because workshop you'll give fine. direct, it's just giving direction on things you've already approved. Okay. So, so I can listen to your direction from the workshop. Uh -huh. and, and, and I've already prepared staff for coming tonight and all I need is your consensus. I'll start looking for the date um, to, to do that, to send and, out and some I'm, dates. And I want to find that out from the commission if that's what you're, if you have an interest in doing that. Okay, so uh, we'll do that. And then. Um, Not between next Tuesday and the other Tuesday. No. The other thing, um, I, I know that a couple of you, I, you, you hear talk, uh, you know, the, the um, um, and I, I mentioned this to the city manager today, the, the uh, search services uh, RP is going to close, I want to say January 15th, but it was right around that. So at some point later, we'll be looking at who the applicants were for that, those search services. So I want to let you know that um, that went out late November, maybe the first week in December, and um, for the and, city manager service, like for yeah, the city so, okay. uh, yeah, 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 and uh, so I just wanted to update you on that. Um, the um, there's still a couple of ordinances that we need to get to get to the schedule of fees for the consultants and things like that. Um, that I think we need to kind of get a, at least an idea of where we are on some of those. I know Renee's working, still working hard to get those things out. This is where we back bill or charge the applicants when we have to have consultants at the TRCs yeah. rather than we paying for them out of our pocket. So there's a couple of these, those types of ordinances out there that we need to still bring back. Okay. Um, other than that, um, on, at face value, Epiphany went great. It was wonderful. No, no uh, major uh, issues or accidents or, or anything like that. It went well. I, I think uh, Major Trill mentioned that there's a couple of things he's going to talk to some people about, and City Manager knows that. I, mm -hmm. I, you saw a letter from me, but other than that, all's well that ends well, um, and then we'll just move forward into the. Uh, um, into the new year. I wish to really thank the police department because of, of really helping out when it came up front and close down there at the top of the stairs. So um, I was really appreciative of that. And um, this is a new year. I'm hoping we're going to be getting some things done. We got to two million dollars for the Craig for the spring uh, um, Bayou uh, Seawall, and there's some timing issues, East Orange Street, but those are all going to be the topic of conversation at the workshop. How are we doing on dredging? Is it started Pardon? yet? The dredging, 1214. That, dredging. Yeah, it that's, started? they're they're laying the pipe for it right now across the road. The I thought the yeah. pipe was already laid. No, they still are. They, from the last update, we, we should have another one. Okay. Uh, in the next couple of days to send out oh, from okay. the last That's one we sent with the pipe. It's about time for the two week, two week update. So a little behind schedule. Too. Okay. A little, a little behind. But adjourn at twelve fourteen. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Yeah.